Introduction of Home Education Series, Volume 6. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Home Education Series, Volume 6, Towards a Philosophy of Education by Charlotte Mason. Forward, Preface, Synopsis, and Introduction. Forward. Our forefathers trusted of yore to the rod and to coercion for the evoking in children of a love of learning. For the last fifty years we have rested our hopes on the enthusiasm of the teachers, but that enthusiasm, when not fictitious, often acts prejudicially by diverting the child's love of knowledge and new ideas into admiration for his teacher, and when that fails, as it frequently does, nothing is left except extraneous and baneful appeals to self-interest. Miss Mason saw, and in this volume has explained, that the natural and only quite wholesome way of teaching is to let the child's desire for knowledge operate in the schoolboy and guide the teacher. This means that without foregoing discipline or cutting ourselves off from tradition, we must continue experiments already being started in our elementary schools. These are based on the chastening fact that children learn best before we adults begin to teach them at all, and hence that however uncongenial the task may be, we must conform our teaching methods to those of nature. The attempt has often been made before, but in this volume there is a rare combination of intuitive insight and practical sagacity. The author refused to believe that the collapse of the desire for knowledge between seven and seventeen years of age is inevitable. So must we. Edward Littleton, D.D. Preface it would seem a far cry from Undine to a liberal education, but there is a point of contact between the two. A soul awoke within a water sprite at the touch of love. So I have to tell of the awakening of a general soul at the touch of knowledge. Eight years ago the soul of a class of children in a mining village school awoke simultaneously at this magic touch and has remained awake. We know that religion can awaken souls, that love makes a new man, that the call of a vocation may do it, and in the age of the Renaissance, men's souls, the general soul, awoke to knowledge. But this appeal rarely reaches the modern soul, and notwithstanding the pleasantness attending lessons and marks in all our schools, I believe the ardour for knowledge in the children of this mining village is a phenomenon that indicates new possibilities. Already many thousands of the children of the empire had experienced this intellectual conversion, but they were the children of educated persons. To find that the children of a mining population were equally responsive seemed to open a new hope for the world. It may be that the souls of all children are waiting for the call of knowledge to awaken them to delightful living. This is how the late Mrs. Frances Steintheil, who was the happy instigator of the movement in council schools, wrote, Quote, think of the meaning of this in the lives of the children, disciplined lives and no lawless strikes, justice, an end to class warfare, developed intellects and no market for trashy and corrupt literature. We shall, or rather they will, live in a redeemed world, end quote. This was written in a moment of enthusiasm on hearing that a certain county council had accepted a scheme of work for this pioneer school. Enthusiasm sees in advance the fields white to the harvest, but indeed the event is likely to justify high expectations. Though less than nine years have passed since that pioneer school made the bold attempt, already many thousands of children working under numerous county councils are finding that, quote, studies serve for delight, end quote. No doubt children are well taught and happy in their lessons as things are, and this was specially true of the school in question, yet both teachers and children find an immeasurable difference between the casual interest roused by marks, pleasing oral lessons and other school devices, and the sort of steady avidity for knowledge that comes with the awakened soul. The children have converted the school inspectors, quote, and the English, end quote, said one of these in astonishment, as he listened to their long, graphic, dramatic narrations of what they had heard. During the last thirty years, we, including many fellow workers, have had thousands of children in our schoolrooms, home and other, working on the lines of Dean Collett's prayer for St. Paul's School, quote, pray for the children to prosper in good life and good literature, end quote. Probably all children so taught grow up with such principles and pursuits as make for happy and useful citizenship. I should like to add that we have no axe to grind, the public good is our aim, and the methods proposed are applicable in any school. 
My object in offering this volume to the public is to urge upon all who are concerned with education a few salient principles which are generally either unknown or disregarded, and a few methods which, like that bathing in Jordan, are simple to commend themselves to the general. Yet these principles and methods make education entirely effectual. I should like to add that no statement that I have advanced in the following volume rests upon opinion only. Every point has been proved in thousands of instances, and the method may be seen at work in many schools, large and small, elementary and secondary. I have to beg the patience of the reader who is asked to approach the one terminus by various avenues, and I cannot do so better than in the words of old Fuller, quote, Good reader, I suspect I may have written some things twice, if not in the same words yet in sense, which I desire you to pass by favourably, for as much as you may well think, it was difficult and a dull thing for me in so great a number of independent sentences to find out the repetitions. Besides the pains, such a search would cost me more time than I can afford, and my glass of life running now low, I must not suffer one sand to fall in waste, nor suffer one minute in picking of straws. But to conclude this, since in matters of advice, precept must be upon precept, line upon line, I apologize in the words of St. Paul, to write the same things to you, to me indeed is not grievous, but for you it is safe. End quote. I am unwilling to close what is probably the last preface I shall be called upon to write without a grateful recognition of the cooperation of those friends who are working with me in what seems to us a great cause. The Parents' National Education Union has fulfilled its mission, as declared in its first prospectus, nobly and generously. Quote, the union exists for the benefit of parents and teachers of all classes. End quote. And for the last eight years, it has undertaken the labour and expense of an energetic propaganda on behalf of elementary schools, of which about 150 are now working on the programmes of the Parents' Union School. During the last year, a pleasing and hopeful development has taken place under the auspices of the Honourable Mrs. Franklin. It was suggested to the head of a London County Council school to form an association of the parents of the children in that school, offering them certain advantages and requiring a small payment to cover expenses. At the first meeting, one of the fathers present got up and said that he was greatly disappointed. He had expected to see some 300 parents, and there were only about 60 present. The promoters of the meeting were, however, well pleased to see the 60, most of whom became members of the Parents' Association, and the work goes on with spirit. We are deeply indebted to many fellow workers, but not even that very courteous gentleman who once wrote a letter to the Romans could make suitable acknowledgment to all of those to whom we owe the success of a movement, the rationale of which I have attempted to make clear in the following pages. Charlotte M. Mason, House of Education, Ambleside, 1922. A short synopsis of the educational philosophy advanced in this volume. No sooner doth the truth come into the soul's sight, but the soul knows her to be her first and old acquaintance. The consequence of truth is great, therefore the judgment of it must not be negligent. Witchcut. 1. Children are born persons. 2. They are not born either good or bad, but with possibilities for good and for evil. 3. The principles of authority on the one hand, and of obedience on the other, are natural, necessary and fundamental. But, 4. These principles are limited by the respect due to the personality of children, which must not be encroached upon, whether by the direct use of fear or love, suggestion or influence, or by undue play upon any one natural desire. 5. Therefore we are limited to three educational instruments, the atmosphere of environment, the discipline of habit, and the presentation of living ideas. The PNEU motto is, quote, Education is an atmosphere, a discipline, and a life, end quote. 6. When we say that education is an atmosphere, we do not mean that a child should be isolated in what may be called a child environment, especially adapted and prepared, but that we should take into account the educational value of his natural home atmosphere, both as regards persons and things, and should let him live freely among his proper conditions. It stultifies a child to bring down his world to the child's level. 7. By education is a discipline, we mean the discipline of habits formed definitely and thoughtfully with the habits of mind or body. Physiologists tell us of the adaptation of brain structures to habitual lines of thought, i.e. to our habits. 8. 
in saying that education is a life, the need of intellectual and moral as well as of physical sustenance is implied. The mind feeds on ideas and therefore children should have a generous curriculum. 9. We hold that the child's mind is no mere sack to hold ideas, but is rather, if the figure may be allowed, a spiritual organism, with an appetite for all knowledge. This is its proper diet, with which it is prepared to deal, and which it can digest and assimilate as the body does foodstuffs. 10. Such a doctrine, as for example the Herbartian, that the mind is a receptacle, lays the stress of education, the preparation of knowledge in enticing morsels duly ordered, upon the teacher. Children taught on this principle are in danger of receiving much teaching with little knowledge, and the teacher's axiom is, quote, what a child learns matters less than how he learns it, end quote. 11. But we, believing that the normal child has powers of mind which fit him to deal with all knowledge proper to him, give him a full and generous curriculum, taking care only that all knowledge offered him is vital, that is, that facts are not presented without their informing ideas. Out of this conception comes our principle that, 12. Education is the science of relations. That is, that a child has natural relations with a vast number of things and thoughts, so we train him upon physical exercises, nature law, handicrafts, science and art, and upon many living books, for we know that our business is not to teach him all about anything, but to help him to make valid as many as may be of, quote, those first-born affinities that fit our new existence to existing things, end quote. 13. In devising a syllabus for a normal child, of whatever social class, three points must be considered. A. He requires much knowledge, for the mind needs sufficient food as much as does the body. B. The knowledge should be various, for sameness in mental diet does not create appetite, i.e. curiosity. C. Knowledge should be communicated in well-chosen language because his attention responds naturally to what is conveyed in literary form. 14. As knowledge is not assimilated until it is reproduced, children should tell back after a single reading or hearing, or should write on some part of what they have read. 15. A single reading is insisted on because children have naturally great power of attention, but this force is dissipated by the re-reading of passages, and also by questioning, summarizing, and the like. Acting upon these and some other points in the behavior of mind, we find that the educatability of children is enormously greater than has hitherto been supposed, and is but little dependent on such circumstances as heredity and environment. Nor is the accuracy of this statement limited to clever children or to the children of the educated classes. Thousands of children in elementary schools respond freely to this method, which is based on the behavior of mind. 16. There are two guides to the moral and intellectual self-management to offer to children, which we may call the way of the will and the way of the reason. 17. The way of the will. Children should be taught a. to distinguish between I want and I will, b. that the way to will effectively is to turn our thoughts from that which we desire but do not will, c. that the best way to turn our thoughts is to think of or do some quite different thing, entertaining or interesting. d. that after a little rest in this way, the will returns to its work with a new vigour. This adjunct of will is familiar to us as diversion, whose office it is to ease us for a time from will effort that we may will again with added power. The use of suggestion as an aid to the will is to be deprecated, as tending to stultify and stereotype character. It would seem that spontaneity is a condition of development, and that human nature needs the discipline of failure as well as of success. 18. The way of reason. We teach children, too, not to lean too confidently on their own understanding, because the function of reason is to give logical demonstration, a. of mathematical truth, b. of an initial idea accepted by the will. In the former case, reason is practically an infallible guide, but in the latter it is not always a safe one. For, whether that idea be right or wrong, reason will confirm it by irrefragable proofs. 19. Therefore children should be taught, as they become mature enough to understand such teaching, that the chief responsibility which rests on them as persons is the acceptance or rejection of ideas. To help them in this choice, we give them principles of conduct and a wide range of knowledge fitted to them. These principles should save children from some of the loose thinking and heedless actions which cause most of us to live at a lower level than we need. 
20. We allow no separation to grow up between the intellectual and spiritual life of children, but teach them that the divine spirit has constant access to their spirits and is their continual helper in all the interests, duties and joys of life. Introduction. These are anxious days for all who are engaged in education. We rejoiced in the fortitude, valour and devotion shown by our men in the war and recognise that these things are due to the schools as well as to the fact that England still breeds, quote, very valiant creatures, end quote. It is good to know that, quote, the whole army was illustrious, end quote. The heroism of our officers derives an added impulse from that tincture of letters that every public schoolboy gets, and those playing fields where boys acquire habits of obedience and command. But what about the abysmal ignorance shown in the wrong thinking of many of the men who stayed at home? Are we to blame? I suppose most of us feel that we are, for these men are educated as we choose to understand education, that is, they can read and write, think perversely and follow an argument, though they are unable to detect a fallacy. If we ask in perplexity why do so many men and women seem incapable of generous impulse, of reasoned patriotism, of seeing beyond the circle of their own interests, is not the answer that men are enabled for such things by education. These are the marks of educated persons, and when millions of men, who should be the backbone of the country, seem to be dead to public claims, we have to ask, why then are not these persons educated, and what have we given them in lieu of education? Our errors in education, so far as we have erred, turn upon the conception we form of mind, and the theory which has filtered through to most teachers implies the out-of-date notion of the development of faculties, a notion which itself rests on the axiom that thought is no more than a function of the brain. Here we find the sole justification of the scanty curricula provided in most of our schools for the tortuous processes of our teaching, for the mischievous assertion that, quote, it does not matter what a child learns, but only how he learns it, end quote. If we teach much and children learn little, we comfort ourselves with the idea that we are developing this or the other faculty. A great future lies before the nation which shall perceive that knowledge is the sole concern of education proper as distinguished from training, and that knowledge is the necessary daily food of the mind. Teachers are looking out for the support of a sound theory, and such a theory must recognize with conviction the part mind plays in education and the conditions under which this prime agent acts. We want a philosophy of education which, admitting that thought alone appeals to mind, that thought begets thought, shall relegate to their proper subsidiary places all those sensory and muscular activities which are supposed to afford intellectual as well as physical training. The latter is so important in and for itself that it needs not to be bolstered up by the notion that it includes the whole, or the practically important part, of education. The same remark holds good of vocational training. Our journalists ask with scorn, is there no education but what is got out of books at school? Is not the lad who works in the fields getting education? And the public lacks the courage to say definitely, no, he is not, because there is no clear notion current as to what education means and how it is to be distinguished from vocational training. But the people themselves begin to understand and to clamour for an education which shall qualify their children for life rather than for earning a living. As a matter of fact, it is the man who has read and thought on many subjects who is, with the necessary training, the most capable, whether in handling tools, drawing plans, or keeping books. The more of a person we succeed in making a child, the better will he both fulfil his own life and serve society. Much thoughtful care has been spent in ascertaining the causes of the German breakdown in character and conduct. The war scourge was symptomatic, and the symptoms have been duly traced to their cause, in the thoughts the people have been taught to think during three or four generations. We have heard much about Nietzsche, Treitschke, Bernhardi, and the rest, but Professor Muirhead did us good service in carrying the investigation further back. Darwin's theories of natural selection, the survival of the fittest, the struggle for existence, struck root in Germany in fitting soil, and the ideas of the superman, the superstate, the right of might, to repudiate treaties, to eliminate feebler powers, to recognize no law but expediency. All this appears to come as naturally out of Darwinism as a chick comes out of an egg. No doubt the same dicta have struck us in the commentaries of Frederick the Great. 
quote, they shall take who have the power, and they shall keep who can, end quote, is ages older than Darwin, but possibly this is what our English philosopher did for Germany. There is a tendency in human nature to elect the obligations of natural law in preference to those of spiritual law, to take its code of ethics from science, and following this tendency the Germans found in their reading of Darwin sanction for manifestations of brutality. Here are a few examples of how German philosophers amplify the Darwinian text. Quote, in matter dwell all natural and spiritual potencies. Matter is the foundation of all being. What we call spirit, thought, the faculty of knowledge, consists of natural, though peculiarly combined, forces. End quote. Darwin himself protests against the struggle for existence being the most potent agency where the higher part of man's nature is concerned, and he no more thought of giving a materialistic tendency to modern education than Locke thought of teaching principles which should bring about the French Revolution. But these men's thoughts are more potent than they know, and these two Englishmen may be credited with influencing powerfully two worldwide movements. In Germany, prepared by a quarter of a century of materialistic thought, the teaching of Darwin was accepted as offering emancipation from various moral restraints. Ernst Hecker, his distinguished follower, finds in the law of natural selection sanction for Germany's lawless action, and also that pregnant doctrine of the superman. Quote, this principle of selection is nothing less than democratic. On the contrary, it is aristocratic in the strictest sense of the word. End quote. We know how Büchner again simplified and popularized these new theories. Quote, All the faculties which we include under the name of psychical activities are only functions of the brain substance. Thought stands in the same relation to the brain as the gall to the liver. End quote. What use or misuse Germany has made of the teaching of Darwin would not, save for the war, be of immediate concern to us, were it not that she might have given us back our own, in the form of that, quote, mythology of faculty psychology, end quote, which is all we possess in the way of educational thought. English psychology proper has advanced, if not to firm ground, at any rate to the point of repudiating the faculty basis. Quote, However much assailed the concept of a mind is, we are told, to be found in all psychological writers, end quote. But there are but mind and matter, and when we are told again that psychology rests on feeling, where are we? Is there a middle region? 2. We fail to recognize that as the body requires wholesome food and cannot nourish itself upon any substance, so the mind too requires meat after its kind. If the war taught nothing else, it taught us that men are spirits, that the spirit, mind, of a man is more than his flesh, that his spirit is the man, that for the thoughts of his heart he gives the breath of his body. As a consequence of this recognition of our spiritual nature, the lesson for us, at the moment, is that the great thoughts, great events, great considerations, which form the background of our national thought, shall be the content of the education we pass on. The educational thought we hear most about is, as I have said, based on sundry Darwinian axioms, out of which we get the notion that nothing matters but physical fitness and vocational training. However important these are, they are not the chief thing. A century ago, when Prussia was shipwrecked in the Napoleonic Wars, it was discovered that not Napoleon but ignorance was the formidable national enemy. A few philosophers took the matter in hand, and history, poetry, philosophy proved the salvation of a ruined nation because such studies make for the development of personality, public spirit, initiative, the qualities of which the state was in need, and which most advance individual happiness and success. On the other hand, the period when Germany made her school curriculum utilitarian marks the beginning of her moral downfall. History repeats itself. There are interesting rumours afloat of how the students at Bonn, for example, went in solemn procession to make a bonfire of French novels, certain prints, articles of luxury and the like. Things like these had brought about the ruin of Germany, and it was the part of the youth to save her now as before. Are they to have another Tugendbund? We want an education which shall nourish the mind while not neglecting either physical or vocational training. In short, we want a working philosophy of education. I think that we of the PNEU have arrived at such a body of theory, tested and corrected by some thirty years of successful practice with thousands of children. This theory has already been set forth in volumes published at intervals during the last thirty-five years. 
so I shall indicate here only a few salient points which seem to me to differ from general theory and practice. A. The children, not the teachers, are the responsible persons. They do the work by self-effort. B. The teachers give sympathy and occasionally elucidate, sum up or enlarge, but the actual work is done by the scholars. C. These read in a term one or two or three thousand pages according to their age, school and form in a large number of set books. The quantity set for each lesson allows of only a single reading, but the reading is tested by narration or by writing on a test passage. When the terminal examination is at hand, so much ground has been covered that revision is out of the question. What the children have read they know, and write on any part of it with ease and fluency in vigorous English. They usually spell well. Much is said from time to time to show that mere book learning is rather contemptible, and that things are in the saddle and ride mankind. May I point out that whatever discredit is due to the use of books does not apply to this method, which, so far as I can discover, has not hitherto been employed. Has an attempt been made before on a wide scale to secure that scholars should know their books, many pages in many books, at a single reading, in such a way that months later they can write freely and accurately on any part of the term's reading? D. There is no selection of studies or of passages or of episodes on the ground of interest. The best available book is chosen and is read through perhaps in the course of two or three years. E. The children study many books on many subjects, but exhibit no confusion of thought, and howlers are almost unknown. F. They find that in Bacon's phrase, studies serve for delight, this delight being not in the lessons or the personality of the teacher, but purely in their lovely books, glorious books. G. The books used are, whenever possible, literary in style. H. Marx, prizes, places, rewards, punishments, praise, blame, or other inducements are not necessary to secure attention, which is voluntary, immediate, and surprisingly perfect. I. The success of the scholars in what may be called disciplinary subjects, such as mathematics and grammar, depends largely on the power of the teacher, though the pupil's habit of attention is of use in these too. J. No stray lessons are given on interesting subjects. The knowledge the children get is consecutive. The unusual interest children show in their work, their power of concentration, their wide and, as far as it goes, accurate knowledge of historical, literary and some scientific subjects, has challenged attention, and the general conclusion is that these are the children of educated and cultivated parents. It was vain to urge that the home schoolroom does not usually produce remarkable educational results, but the way is opening to prove that the power these children show is common to all children. At last there is hope that the offspring of working-class parents may be led into the wide pastures of a liberal education. Are we not justified in concluding that singular effects must have commensurate causes, and that we have chanced to light on unknown tracts in the region of educational thought? At any rate, that golden rule, of which Comenius was in search, has discovered itself. The rule, quote, whereby teachers shall teach less, and scholars shall learn more, end quote. Let me now outline a few of the educational principles which account for unusual results. 3. Principles hitherto unrecognized or disregarded. I have enumerated some of the points in which our work is exceptional in the hope of convincing the reader that unusual work carried on successfully in hundreds of schoolrooms, home or other, is based on principles hitherto unrecognized. The recognition of these principles should put our national education on an intelligent basis and should make for general stability, joy in living and personal initiative. May I add one or two more arguments in support of my plea? The appeal is not to the clever child only, but to the average and even to the backward child. This scheme is carried out in less time than ordinary schoolwork on the same subjects. There are no revisions, no evening lessons, no cramming or getting up of subjects. Therefore, there is much time, whether for vocational work or interests or hobbies. All intellectual work is done in the hours of morning school, and the afternoons are given to field nature studies, drawing, handicrafts, etc., Notwithstanding these limitations, the children produce a surprising amount of good intellectual work. No homework is required. It is not that we, of the PNEU, are persons of peculiar genius. It is that, like Paley's man who found the watch, we have chanced on a good thing. No gain that I experience must remain unshared. 
We feel that the country, and indeed the world, should have the benefit of educational discoveries which act powerfully as a moral lever, for we are experiencing anew the joy of the Renaissance, but without its pagan lawlessness. Let me trace, as far as I can recall them, the steps by which I arrived at some of the conclusions upon which we are acting. While still a young woman, I saw a great deal of a family of Anglo-Indian children, who had come home to their grandfather's house and were being brought up by an aunt who was my intimate friend. The children were astonishing to me. They were persons of generous impulses and sound judgment, of great intellectual aptitude, of imagination and moral insight. These last two points were, I recollect, illustrated one day by a little maiden of five who came home from her walk silent and sad, some letting alone and some wise openings brought out at last between sobs, quote, a poor man, no home, nothing to eat, no bed to lie upon, end quote, and then the child was relieved by tears. Such incidents are common enough in families, but they were new to me. I was reading a good deal of philosophy and education at the time, for I thought, with the enthusiasm of a young teacher, that education should regenerate the world. I had an elementary school and a pioneer church high school at this same time, so that I was enabled to study children in large groups, but at school children are not so self-revealing as at home. I began under the guidance of these Anglo-Indian children to take the measure of a person and soon to suspect that children are more than we, their elders, except that their ignorance is illimitable. One limitation I did discover in the minds of these little people. My friend insisted that they could not understand English grammar. I maintained that they could, and wrote a little grammar, still waiting to be prepared for publication, for the two of seven and eight. But she was right. I was allowed to give the lessons myself with what lucidity and freshness I could command. In vain, the nominative case baffled them. Their minds rejected the abstract conception, just as children reject the notion of writing an essay on happiness but I was beginning to make discoveries, the second being that the mind of a child takes or rejects according to its needs. From this point, it was not difficult to go on to the perception that, whether in taking or rejecting, the mind was functioning for its own nourishment, that the mind, in fact, requires sustenance, as does the body, in order that it increase and be strong, but because the mind is not to be measured or weighed, but is spiritual, so its sustenance must be spiritual too, must in fact be ideas, in the platonic sense of images. I soon perceived that children were well equipped to deal with ideas, and that explanations, questionings, amplifications are unnecessary and wearisome. Children have a natural appetite for knowledge which is informed with thought. They bring imagination, judgment, and the various so-called faculties to bear upon a new idea, pretty much as the gastric juices act upon a food ration. This was illuminating but rather startling. The whole intellectual apparatus of the teacher, his power of vivid presentation, apt illustration, able summing up, subtle questioning, all these were hindrances and intervened between children and the right nutriment duly served. This, on the other hand, they received with the sort of avidity and simplicity with which a healthy child eats his dinner. The Scottish school of philosophers came to my aid here with what may be called their doctrine of the desires, which I perceived stimulate the action of mind and so cater for spiritual, not necessarily religious, sustenance, as the appetites do, for that of the body, and for the continuance of the race. This was helpful. I inferred that one of these, the desire of knowledge, curiosity, was the chief instrument of education, that this desire might be paralysed or made powerless, like an unused limb, by encouraging other desires to intervene between a child and the knowledge proper for him, the desire for place, emulation, for prizes, avarice, for power, ambition, for praise, vanity, might each be a stumbling-block to him. It seemed to me that we teachers had unconsciously elaborated a system which should secure the discipline of the schools and the eagerness of the scholars, by means of marks, prizes, and the like, and yet eliminate that knowledge-hunger, itself the quite sufficient incentive to education. Then arose the question, cannot people get on with little knowledge? Is it really necessary after all? My child friends supply the answer. Their insatiable curiosity showed me that the wide world and its history was barely enough to satisfy a child who had not been made apathetic by spiritual malnutrition. What then is knowledge? was the next question that occurred, a question which the intellectual labour of ages has not settled, but perhaps this is enough to go on with. That only becomes knowledge to a person which he has assimilated, which his mind has acted upon. Children's aptitude for knowledge and their eagerness for it, 
made for the conclusion that the field of a child's knowledge may not be artificially restricted, that he has a right to and necessity for as much and as varied knowledge as he is able to receive, and that the limitations in his curriculum should depend only upon the age at which he must leave school. In a word, a common curriculum, up to the age of, say, fourteen or fifteen, appears to be due to all children. We have left behind the feudal notion that intellect is a class prerogative, that intelligence is a matter of inheritance and environment. Inheritance, no doubt, means much, but everyone has a very mixed inheritance. Environment makes for satisfaction or uneasiness, but education is of the spirit, and is not to be taken in by the eye or affected by the hand. Mind appeals to mind, and thought begets thought, and that is how we become educated. For this reason we owe it to every child to put him in communication with great minds, that he may get at great thoughts, with the minds, that is, of those who have left us great works. And the only vital method of education appears to be that children should read worthy books, many worthy books. It will be said on the one hand that many schools have their own libraries, or the scholars have the free use of a public library, and that children do read and, on the other, that the literary language of first-rate books offers an impassable barrier to working men's children. In the first place, we all know that desultory reading is delightful and incidentally profitable, but is not education, whose concern is knowledge. That is, the mind of the desultory reader only rarely makes the act of appropriation which is necessary before the matter we read becomes personal knowledge. We must read in order to know, or we do not know by reading. As for the question of literary form, many circumstances and considerations which it would take too long to describe brought me to perceive that delight in literary form is native to us all until we are educated out of it. It is difficult to explain how I came to a solution of a puzzling problem, how to secure attention. Much observation of children, various incidents from one's general reading, the recollection of my own childhood, and the consideration of my present habits of mind brought me to the recognition of certain laws of the mind, by working in accordance with which the steady attention of children of any age and any class in society is ensured, week in, week out. Attention not affected by distracting circumstances. It is not a matter of personal magnetism, for hundreds of teachers of very varying quality, working in home school rooms and in elementary and secondary schools on this method, secure it without effort. Neither does it rest upon the doctrine of interest. No doubt the scholars are interested, sometimes delighted, but they are interested in a great variety of matters, and their attention does not flag in the dull parts. It is not easy to sum up in a few short sentences those principles upon which the mind naturally acts, and which I have tried to bring to bear upon a school curriculum. The fundamental idea is that children are persons, and are therefore moved by the same springs of conduct as their elders. Among these is the desire of knowledge, knowledge hunger being natural to everyone. History, geography, the thoughts of other people, roughly the humanities, are proper for us all, and are the objects of the natural desire of knowledge. So too are science, for we all live in the world, and art, for we all require beauty, and are eager to know how to discriminate. Social science, Ethics, for we are aware of the need to learn about the conduct of life, and religion, for, like those men we heard of at the front, we all want God. In the nature of things, then, the unspoken demand of children is for a wide and very varied curriculum. It is necessary that they should have some knowledge of the wide range of interests proper to them as human beings, and, for no reasons of convenience or time limitations, may we curtail their proper curriculum. Perceiving the range of knowledge to which children as persons are entitled, the questions are, how shall they be induced to take that knowledge, and what can the children of the people learn in the short time they are at school? We have discovered a working answer to these two conundrums. I say discovered, and not invented, for there is only one way of learning, and the intelligent persons who can talk well on many subjects, and the expert in one, learn in the same way. That is, they read to know. What I have found out is that this method is available for every child, whether in the dilatory and desultory home schoolroom, or in the large classes of elementary schools. Children are no more come into the world without provision for dealing with knowledge than without provision for dealing with food. They bring with them not only that intellectual appetite, the desire of knowledge, but also an enormous and unlimited power of attention to which the power of retention, memory, seems to be attached as one digestive process succeeds another until the final assimilation. 
Yes, it will be said, they are capable of much curiosity and consequent attention, but they can only occasionally be beguiled into attending to their lessons. Is not that the fault of the lessons, and must not these be regulated, as carefully with regard to the behaviour of mind, as the children's meals are with regard to physical considerations? Let us consider this behaviour in a few aspects. The mind concerns itself only with thoughts, imaginations, reasoned arguments. It declines to assimilate the facts unless in combination with its proper pabulum. It, being active, is wearied in the passive attitude of a listener. It is as much bored in the case of a child by the discursive twaddle of the talking teacher as in that of a grown-up by conversational twaddle. It has a natural preference for literary form. Given a more or less literary presentation, the curiosity of the mind is enormous and embraces a vast variety of subjects. I predicate these things of the mind because they seem true of all persons' minds. Having observed these and some other points in the behaviour of mind, it remained to apply the conclusions to which I had come to a test curriculum for schools and families. Oral teaching was to a great extent ruled out. A large number of books on many subjects were set for reading in morning school hours. So much work was set that there was only time for a single reading. All reading was tested by a narration of the whole or a given passage, whether orally or in writing. Children working on these lines know months after that which they have read and are remarkable for their power of concentration, attention. They have little trouble with spelling or composition and become well-informed, intelligent persons. But, it will be said, reading or hearing various books read, chapter by chapter, and then narrating or writing what has been read, or some part of it, all this is mere memory work. The value of this criticism may be readily tested. Will the critic read, before turning off his light, a leading article from a newspaper, say, or a chapter from Boswell or Jane Austen, or one of Lamb's essays? Then will he put himself to sleep by narrating silently what he has read? He will not be satisfied with the result, but he will find that, in the act of narrating, every power of his mind comes into play, that points and bearings which he had not observed are brought out, that the whole is visualized and brought into relief in an extraordinary way. In fact, that scene or argument has become a part of his personal experience. He knows he has assimilated what he has read. This is not memory work. In order to memorize, we repeat over and over a passage or a series of points or names with the aid of such clues as we can invent. We do memorize a string of facts or words, and the new possession serves its purpose for a time, but it is not assimilated. Its purpose being served, we know it no more. This is memory work by means of which examinations are passed with credit. I will not try to explain or understand this power to memorize. It has its subsidiary use in education, no doubt, but it must not be put in the place of the prime agent, which is attention. Long ago I was in the habit of hearing this axiom quoted by a philosophical old friend, quote, The mind can know nothing save what it can produce in the form of an answer to a question put to the mind by itself, end quote. I have failed to trace the saying to its source, but a conviction of its importance has been growing upon me during the last forty years. It tacitly prohibits questioning from without. This does not, of course, affect the Socratic use of questioning for purposes of moral conviction. And it is necessary to intellectual certainty, to the act of knowing. For example, to secure a conversation or an incident, we go over it in our minds. That is, the mind puts itself through the process of self-questioning, which I have indicated. This is what happens in the narrating of a passage read. Each new consecutive incident or statement arrives because the mind asks itself, what next? For this reason, it is important that only one reading should be allowed. Efforts to memorize weaken the power of attention, the proper activity of the mind. If it is desirable to ask questions in order to emphasize certain points, these should be asked after and not before or during the act of narration. They too predicate instead of a congery of faculties, a single subjective activity, attention. And again, there is one common factor in all psychical activity, that is, attention. My personal addition is that attention is unfailing, prompt and steady when matter is presented suitable to a child's intellectual requirements, if the presentation be made with the conciseness, directness and simplicity proper to literature. Another point should be borne in mind. The intellect requires a moral impulse, and we all stir our minds into action the better if there is an implied must in the background. For children in class, the must acts through the certainty that they will be required to narrate or write from what they have read with no opportunity of looking up or other devices of the idle. 
Children find the act of narrating so pleasurable in itself that urgency on the part of the teacher is seldom necessary. Here is a complete chain of the educational philosophy I have endeavoured to work out, which has at least the merit that it is successful in practice. Some few hints I have, as I have said, adopted and applied, but I hope I have succeeded in methodising the whole and making education what it should be, a system of applied philosophy. I have, however, carefully abstained from the use of philosophical terms. This is briefly how it works. A child is a person with the spiritual requirements and capabilities of a person. Knowledge nourishes the mind as food nourishes the body. A child requires knowledge as much as he requires food. He is furnished with the desire for knowledge, i.e. curiosity, with the power to apprehend knowledge, that is, attention, with powers of mind to deal with knowledge without aid from without, such as imagination, reflection, judgment, with innate interest in all knowledge that he needs as a human being, with power to retain and communicate such knowledge and to assimilate all that is necessary to him. He requires that in most cases knowledge be communicated to him in literary form, and reproduces such knowledge touched by his own personality, thus his reproduction becomes original. The natural provision for the appropriation and assimilation of knowledge is adequate, and no stimulus is required, but some moral control is necessary to secure the act of attention. A child receives this in the certainty that he will be required to recount what he has read. Children have a right to the best we possess, therefore their lesson books should be, as far as possible, our best books. They weary of talk and questions bore them, so that they should be allowed to use their books for themselves. They will ask for such help as they wish for. They require a great variety of knowledge about religion, the humanities, science, art. Therefore, they should have a wide curriculum with a definite amount of reading set for each short period of study. The teacher affords direction, sympathy in studies, a vivifying word here and there, help in the making of experiments, etc., as well as the usual teaching in languages, experimental science and mathematics. Pursued under these conditions, studies serve for delight, and the consciousness of daily progress is exhilarating to both teacher and children. The reader will say with truth, I knew all this before and have always acted more or less on these principles and I can only point to the unusual results we obtain through adhering not more or less, but strictly to the principles and practices I have indicated. I suppose the difficulties are of the sort that Lister had to contend with. Every surgeon knew that his instruments and appurtenances should be kept clean, but the saving of millions of lives has resulted from the adoption of the great surgeon's antiseptic treatment, that is, the substitution of exact principles, scrupulously applied, for the rather casual, more or less methods of earlier days. Whether the way I have sketched out is the right, and the only way, remains to be tested still more widely than in the thousands of cases in which it has been successful, but assuredly education is slack and uncertain for the lack of sound principles exactly applied. The moment has come for a decision. We have placed our faith in civilization, have been proud of our progress and of the pangs that the war has brought us. Perhaps none is keener, than that caused by the utter breakdown of the civilization which we have held to be synonymous with education. We know better now and are thrown back on our healthy human instincts and the divine sanctions. The educable part of a person is his mind. The training of the senses and muscles is, strictly speaking, training and not education. The mind, like the body, requires quantity, variety and regularity in the sustenance offered to it. Like the body, the mind has its appetite, the desire for knowledge. Again, like the body, the mind is able to receive and assimilate by its powers of attention and reflection. Like the body again, the mind rejects insipid, dry, and unsavory food, that is to say, its pabulum should be presented in a literary form. The mind is restricted to pabulum of one kind. It is nourished upon ideas and absorbs facts only as these are connected with the living ideas upon which they hang. Children educated upon some such lines as these respond in a surprising way, developing capacity, character, countenance, initiative, and a sense of responsibility. They are, in fact, even as children, good and thoughtful citizens. I have in this volume attempted to show the principles and methods upon which education of this sort is being successfully carried out, and have added chapters which illustrate the history of a movement, the aim of which is, in the phrase of Comenius, all knowledge for all men. 
As well as these, I have been permitted to use the criticisms of various teachers and directors of education and others upon the practical working of the scheme. It is a matter of rejoicing that the way is open to give to all classes a basis of common thought and common knowledge, including a common store of literary and historic allusions, a possession which has a curious power of cementing bodies of men, and in the next place it is an enormous gain that we are within sight of giving to the working classes, notwithstanding their limited opportunities, that stability of mind and magnanimity of character which are the proper outcome and the unfailing test of a liberal education. I shall confine myself in this volume to the amplification and illustration of some of the points I have endeavoured to make in this introductory statement. End of Introduction Chapter 1 of Home Education Series, Volume 6 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Cooper Watmo. Home Education, Series, Volume 6, Towards a Philosophy of Education, by Charlotte Mason. Self-Education. The title of this chapter may awaken some undeserved sympathy. Gratifying visions of rhythmic movements, independent action, self-expression in various interesting ways occur to the mind, for surely these things constitute self-education. Most of these modern panacea are desirable and by no means to be neglected. Limbs trained to grace and agility, a hand to dexterity and precision, an eye made to see and an ear to hear, a voice taught to interpret. We know today that all these possibilities of joy in living should be open to every child, and we look forward even to, hopefully, to the manner of citizen who shall be the outcome of our educational zeal. Now, although we, of the Parents' Union, have initiated some of these educational outworks and have gladly and gratefully adopted others, yet is our point of view different. We are profoundly skeptical as to the effect of all or any of these activities upon character and conduct. A person is not built up from without, but from within. That is, he is living. And all external education appliances and activities which are intended should mold his character are decorative and not vital. This sounds like a stale truism, but let us consider a few corollaries of the notion that a child is a person, and that a person is, primarily, living. Now no external application is capable of nourishing life or promoting growth. Baths of wine, wrappings of velvet have no effect upon physical life except as they may hinder it. Life is sustained on that which is taken by the organism, not by that which is applied from without. Perhaps the only allowable analogy of the human mind is the animal body, especially the human body, for it is that which we know most about. The well-worn plant and garden analogy is misleading especially as regards the tiresome busybody, the gardener, who will direct the inclination of every twig, the position of every leaf. But, even then apart from the gardener, the child garden is an intolerable idea, is failing to recognize the essential property of a child, his personality, a property all but absent in a plant. Now, let us consider for a moment the parallel behavior of body and mind. The body lives by air, grows on food, demands rest, flourishes on a diet wisely various. So of the mind, by which I mean the entire spiritual nature, all that which is not body, it breathes in air, calls for both activity and rest, and flourishes on a wisely varied dietary. We go round the house and round the house, but rarely into the house of mind. We offer mental gymnastics, but these do not take the place of food, and of that we serve the most meager rations. No more than that bean a day, 
Diet for the body is abundantly considered, but no one pauses to say, I wonder, does the mind need food too, and regular meals, and what is its proper diet? I have asked myself this question, and have labored for fifty years to find the answer, and am anxious to impart what I think I know, but the answer cannot be given in the form of do this and that, but rather an invitation to consider this and that. Action follows when we have thought duly. The life of the mind is sustained upon ideas. There is no intellectual vitality in the mind to which ideas are not presented several times, say, every day. But surely, surely, as Mrs. Proudy would say, scientific experiments natural beauty, nature study, rhythmic movements, sensory exercises, are all fertile in ideas? Quite commonly, they are so, as regards ideas of invention and discovery, and even in ideas of art. But for the moment, it may be well to consider the ideas that influence life, that is, character and conduct. These, it would seem, pass directly from mind to mind, and are neither helpful nor hindered by educational outworks. Every child gets many of these ideas by word of mouth, by way of family traditions, proverbial philosophy, in fact, by what we might call a kind of oral literature. But when we compare the mind with the body, we perceive the three square meals a day are generally necessary to health, and that a casual diet of good ideas is poor and meager. Our schools turn out a good many clever young persons, wanting in nothing but initiative, the power of reflection, and the sort of moral imagination which enables you to put yourself in his place. These qualities flourish upon a proper diet, and this is not afforded by the ordinary school book or in sufficient quantity by the ordinary lesson. I would like to emphasize quantity, which is as important for the mind as for the body. Both require their square meals. It is no easy matter to give its proper sustenance to the mind. Hard things are said to children that they have no brains a low order of intellect, and so on. But many of us are able to vouch for the fine intelligence shown by children who are fed with the proper mind stuff. But teachers do not usually take the trouble to find out what this is. We come dangerously near to what Plato condemns as that lie of the soul, the corruption of the highest truth, of which Protagoras is guilty in the saying that knowledge is sensation. What else are we saying when we run after educational methods which are purely sensory? Knowledge is not sensation, nor is it to be derived through sensation. We feed upon the thoughts of other minds, and thought applied to thought generates thought, and we become more thoughtful. No one need invite us to reason, compare, imagine. The mind, like the body, digests its proper food, and must have the labor of digestion, or it ceases to function. But the children ask for bread, and we give them a stone. We give information about objects and events which mind does not attempt to digest, but cast out bodily, upon an examination paper. But let information hang upon a principle, be inspired by an idea, and it is taken with avidity and used in making whatsoever in the spiritual nature stands for tissue in the physical. Education, said Lord Haldane some time ago, is a matter of the spirit. No wiser word has been said on the subject, and yet we persist in applying education from without as bodily activity or emollient. We begin to see light. No one knoweth the things of a man, but the spirit of a man which is in him. Therefore, there is no education but self-education. And as soon as a young child begins his education, 
he does so as a student. Our business is to give him mind stuff, and both quality and quantity are essential. Naturally, each of us possess the mind stuff only in limited measure, but we know where to procure it, for the best thought the world possesses is stored in books. We must open books to children, the best books. Our own concern is abundant provision and orderly serving. I am jealous for the children. Every modern educational movement tends to belittle them intellectually, and none more so than a late ingenious attempt to feed normal children with the pat meat, which may be good for the mentally sick. But to all wildly popular things come suddenly and inexorably death, without hope of resurrection. If Mr. Bernard Shaw is right, I need not discuss certain popular form of new education. It has been ably said that education should profit by the divorce which is now in progress from psychology on the one hand and sociology on the other. But what if education should use her recovered liberty to make a monstrous alliance with pathology? Various considerations urge me upon a rather distasteful task. It is time I showed my hand and gave some account of work, the principles and practices of which should, I think, be of general use. Like those lepers who feasted at the gates of a famished city, I began to take shame to myself. A system of educational theory which seems to me able to meet any rational demand, even that severest criterion set up by Plato. It is able to run the gauntlet of objections and is ready to disprove them, not by appeals to opinion, but to absolute truth. Some of it is new, much of it is old. Like the quality of mercy, it is not strained. Certainly, it is twice blessed. It blesses him that gives and him that takes, and a sort of radiancy of look distinguishes both scholar and teacher engaged in this manner of education. But there are no startling results to challenge attention. Professor Bompus Smith remarked in an inaugural address at the University of Manchester that, if we can guide our practice by the light of a comprehensive theory, we shall widen our experience by attempting tasks which would not otherwise have occurred to us. It is possible to offer the light of such a comprehensive theory, and the result is precisely what the professor indicates. A large number of teachers attempt tasks which would not otherwise have occurred to them. One discovers a thing because it is there, and no sane person takes credit to himself for such discovery. On the contrary, he recognizes with King Arthur, These jewels, whereupon I chanced divinely, are for public use. For many years we have had access to a sort of Aladdin's cave, which I long to throw open for public use. Let me try to indicate some of the advantages of the theory I am urging. If it's all ages, even the seven ages of man, it satisfies brilliant children and discovers intelligence in the dull. It secures attention, interest, concentration, without effort on the part of the teacher or taught. Children, I think all children, so taught express themselves in a forcible and fluent English and use a copious vocabulary. An unusual degree of nervous stability is attained. Also, intellectual occupation seems to make for chastity and thought and life. Parents become interested in the schoolroom work and find their children delightful companions. Children shoo delight in books, other than storybooks, and manifest a genuine love of knowledge. Teachers are relieved for much of the labor of corrections. Children taught according to this method do exceptionally well at any school. It is unnecessary to stimulate these young scholars by marks, prizes, etc. After all, it is not a quack medicine I am writing about, though the reader might think so. And there is no is. I second a bottle in question. Over thirty years ago, I published a volume about the home education of children, and people wrote asking how those counsels of perfection could be carried out with the aid of the private governess 
as she then existed. It occurred to me that a series of curricula might be devised embodying sound principles and securing that children should be in a position of less dependence on their teacher than they then were. In other words, their education should be largely self-education. A sort of correspondence school was set up, the motto of which, I am, I can, I ought, I will, has had much effect in throwing children upon the possibilities, capabilities, duties, and determining power belonging to them as persons. Children are born persons is the first article of the educational credo in question. The response made by children, ranging in age from 6 to 18, astonished me. Though they only shewed the power of attention, the avidity for knowledge, the clearness of thought, the nice discrimination in books, and the ability to deal with many subjects, for which I had given them credit in advance. I need not repeat what I have urged elsewhere on the subject of knowledge, and will only add that anyone may apply a test. Let him read to a child of any age from six to ten an account of an incident graphically and tersely told, and the child will relate what he has heard point by point, though not word for word, and will add delightful original touches. What is more, he will relate the passage months later because he has visualized the scene and appropriated that bit of knowledge. A rhetorical passage written in journalese makes no impression on him if a passage be read more than once. He may become letter-perfect, but the spirit, the individuality, has gone out of the exercise. An older boy or girl will read one of Bacon's essays, say, or a passage from De Quincey, and will write or tell it forcibly and with some style, either at the moment or months later. We know how Fox recited a whole pamphlet of Burke's at a college supper, though he had probably read it no more than once. Here, on the very surface, is the key to that attention, interest, literary style, wide vocabulary, love of books, and readiness in speaking, which we all feel should belong to an education that has only begun at school and continued throughout life. These are the things that we all desire, and how to obtain them, some part of the open secret I am laboring to disclose for public use. I am anxious to bring a quite successful educational experiment before the public at a moment when we are told on authority that education must be an appeal to the spirit if it is to be made interesting. Here is education which is as interesting and fascinating as a fine art to parents, children, and teachers. During the last 30 years, thousands of children educated on these lines have grown up in love with knowledge and manifesting a right judgment in all things so far as a pretty wide curriculum gives them data. I would have children taught to read before they learn the mechanical arts of reading and writing, and they learn delightfully. They give perfect attention to paragraph or page read to them and are able to relate the matter point by point in their own words, but they demand classical English and cannot read in this sense upon anything else. They begin their schooling in letters at six and begin at the same time to learn mechanical reading and writing. A child does not lose by spending a couple of years in acquiring these because he is, meanwhile, reading the Bible, history, geography, tales, with close attention and a remarkable power of reproduction, or rather, of translation into his own language. He is acquiring a copious vocabulary and the habit of consecutive speech. In a word, he is an educated child from the first, and his power of dealing with books, with several books in the course of a morning's school, increases with his age. But children are not all alike. There is as much difference between them as between men or women. Two or three months ago, a small boy, not quite six, came to school by post. And his record was that he could read anything in five languages, 
and was now teaching himself the Greek characters, could find his way about the continental Bradshaw, and was a chubby, vigorous little person. All this the boy brings with him when he comes to school. He is exceptional, of course, just as a man with such accomplishments is exceptional. But I believe that all children bring with them much capacity which is not recognized by their teachers, chiefly intellectual capacity, always in advance of motor power, which we are apt to drown in deluges of explanation or dissipate in futile labors in which there is no advance. People are naturally divided into those who read and think and those who do not read or think. And the business of schools is to see that all their scholars shall belong to the former class. It is worth while to remember that thinking is inseparable from reading, which is concerned with the content of a passage and not merely with the printed matter. The children I'm speaking of are much occupied with things as well as with books, because education is the science of relations, is the principle which regulates their curriculum. That is, a child goes to school with many aptitudes which he should put into effect. So he learns a good deal of science because children have no difficulty in understanding principles, though technical details baffle them. He practices various handicrafts that he may know the feel of wood, clay, leather, and the joy of handling tools, that is, that he may establish a due relation with materials. But, always, it is the book, the knowledge, the clay, the bird or blossom he thinks of, not his own place or his own progress. I am afraid that some knowledge of the theory we advance is necessary to the open-minded teacher who would give our practices a trial, because every detail of schoolroom work is the outcome of certain principles. For instance, it would be quite easy without much thought to experiment with our use of books, but in education, as in religion, it is the motive that counts, and the boy who reads his lesson for a good mark becomes word perfect, but does not know. But these principles are obvious and simple enough, and, when we consider that at present education is chaotic for want of a unifying theory, and that there happens to be no other comprehensive theory in the field which is in line with modern thought, and it fits on every occasion, might it not be well to try one which is immediately practicable and always pleasant, and has proved itself by producing many capable, serviceable, dutiful men and women of sound judgment and willing mind. In urging a method of self-education for children in lieu of the vicarious education which prevails, I would like to dwell on the enormous relief to teachers, a self-sacrificing and greatly overburdened class. The difference is just that between driving a horse that is light and a horse that is heavy in hand. The former covers the ground of its own gay will, and the driver goes merrily. The teacher who allows his scholars the freedom of the city of books is at liberty to be their guide, philosopher, and friend, and is no longer the mere instrument of a forcible intellectual feeding. End of chapter 1, read by Cooper Watmo on July fifteenth, two 2022. Section 2 of Home Education Series, Volume 6. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Devora Allen. Home Education Series, Volume 6. Towards a Philosophy of Education, by Charlotte Mason. Children are Born Persons. Part 1. The Mind of a Child. No sooner doth the truth come into the soul's sight, but the soul knows her to be her first and old acquaintance. The consequence of truth is great, therefore the judgment of it must not be negligent. It should not surprise the reader that a chapter designed to set forth a startling truth should open with the weighty words of an old divine, 
which coat? But truths get flat and wonders stale upon us. We do not care much about the starry firmament, the budding trees, the cunning architecture of the birds. And to all except young parents and young brothers and sisters, a baby is no longer a marvel. The completeness of the new baby brother is what children admire most, his toes and his fingers, his ears and all the small perfections of him. His guardians have some understanding of the baby. They know that his chief business is to grow, and they feed him with food convenient for him. If they are wise, they give free play to all the wrigglings and stretchings which give power to his feeble muscles. His parents know what he will come to, and feel that here is a new chance for the world. In the meantime, he needs food, sleep, and shelter, and a great deal of love. So much we all know. But is the baby more than a huge oyster? That is the problem before us, and hitherto educators have been inclined to answer it in the negative. Their notion is that by means of a pull here, a push there, a compression elsewhere, a person is at last turned out according to the pattern the educator has in his mind. The other view is that the beautiful infant frame is but the setting of a jewel of such astonishing worth that put the whole world in one scale and this jewel in the other, and the scale which holds the world flies up outbalanced. A poet looks back on the glimmering haze of his own infancy, and this is the sort of thing he sees. I was entertained like an angel with the works of God in their splendor and glory. Is it not strange that an infant should be heir of the whole world, and see those mysteries which the books of the learned never unfold? The corn was orient and immortal wheat, which never should be reaped, nor was ever sown. I thought it had stood from everlasting to everlasting. The dust and stones of the street were as precious gold. The green trees transported and ravished me. Their sweetness and unusual beauty made my heart to leap. Boys and girls tumbling in the streets were moving jewels. I knew not that they were born or should die. The streets were mine, the people were mine, their clothes in gold and silver were mine as much as their sparkling eyes, fair skins and ruddy faces. The skies were mine, and so were the sun and moon and stars, and all the world was mine, and I the only spectator and enjoyer of it. It takes a poet like Traherne to retain and produce such vivid memories, though perhaps we can all recall the sense that we were spectators at the show of life, and we can recollect a sunny time before we were able to speak or tell what we knew. Punch amused us at one time with a baby's views of his nurse and his surroundings and especially of the unwarranted pulls and pushes to which he was subject. But probably an infant is no critic. His business is to perceive and receive, and these he does day in and day out. We have an idea that poets say more than they know, express more than they see, and that their version of life must be taken cum grano. But perhaps the fact is that no labor of the mind enables them to catch and put into words the full realities of which they are cognizant. And therefore we may take Wordsworth, Coleridge, Vaughan, and the rest as witnesses who only hint at the glory which might be revealed. We are not poets, and are disposed to discount the sayings of the poets. But the most prosaic of us comes across evidence of mind in children, and of mind astonishingly alert. Let us consider, in the first two years of life they manage to get through more intellectual effort than any following two years can show. Supposing that much-discussed Martian were at last able to make his way to our planet, think of how much he must learn before he could accommodate himself to our conditions. Our notions of hard and soft, wet and dry, hot and cold, stable and unstable, far and near— would be as foreign to him as they are to an infant who holds out his pinafore for the moon. We do not know what the Martian means of locomotion are, but we can realize that to run and jump and climb stairs, even to sit and stand at will, must require fully as much reasoned endeavor as it takes in after years to accomplish skating, dancing, skiing, fencing, whatever athletic exercises people spend years in perfecting and all these the infant accomplishes in his first two years. 
He learns the properties of matter, knows colors, and has first notions of size, solid, liquid, has learned in his third year to articulate with surprising clearness. What is more, he has learned a language, two languages if he has had the opportunity, and the writer has known of three languages being mastered by a child of three, and one of them was Arabic. Mastered, that is, so far that a child can say all that he needs to say in any one of the three. The sort of mastery most of us wish for when we are traveling in foreign countries. Lady Mary Wardley Montague tells us that in her time, the little children of Constantinople prattled in five tongues with a good knowledge of each. If we have not proved that a child is born a person with a mind as complete and as beautiful as his beautiful little body, we can at least show that he always has all the mind he requires for his occasions. That is, that his mind is the instrument of his education, and that his education does not produce his mind. Who shall measure the range of a child's thoughts? His continual questions about God, his speculations about Jesus, are they no more than idle curiosity? Or are they symptoms of a God-hunger with which we are all born? And is a child able to comprehend as much of the infinite and the unseen as are his self-complacent elders? Is he cabined, cribbed, confined in our ways, and does the fairy tale afford a joyful escape to regions where all things are possible? We are told that children have no imagination, that they must needs see and touch, taste and handle in order to know. While a child's age is still counted by months, he devotes himself to learning the properties of things by touching, pulling, tearing, throwing, tasting. But as months pass into years, a coup d'oeil suffices for all but new things of complicated structure. Life is a continual progress to a child. He does not go over old things in old ways. His joy is to go on. The immensity of his powers brings its own terrors. Let me again quote Traherne. Another time, in a lowering and sad evening, being alone in the field when all things were dead and quiet, a certain wanton horror fell upon me beyond imagination. The unprofitableness and silence of the place dissatisfied me. Its wildness terrified me. From the utmost ends of the earth, fear surrounded me. I was a weak and little child, and had forgotten there was a man alive on the earth. Yet also something of hope and expectation comforted me from every border. Traherne never loses the lessons that come to him, and he goes on, This taught me that I was concerned in all the world, that the beauties of the earth were made to entertain me, that the presence of cities, temples, and kingdoms ought to sustain me and that to be alone in the world was to be desolate and miserable. Reason is present in the infant as truly as imagination. As soon as he can speak, he lets us know that he has pondered the cause-why of things and perplexes us with a thousand questions. His why is ceaseless, nor are his reasonings always disinterested. How soon the little urchin learns to manage his nurse or mother— to calculate her moods and play upon her feelings. It is in him to be a little tyrant. He has a will of his own, says his nurse, but she is mistaken in supposing that his stormy manifestations of greed, willfulness, temper, are signs of will. It is when the little boy is able to stop all these and restrain himself with quivering lip that his will comes into play. For he has a conscience, too. Before he begins to toddle, he knows the difference between right and wrong. Even a baby in arms will blush at the naughty baby of his nurse. And that strong will of his acts in proportion as he learns the difficult art of obedience. For no one can make a child obey unless he wills to do so. And we all know how small a rebel may make confusion in house or schoolroom. Part 2 the mind of a school child. But we must leave the quite young child, fascinating as he is, and take him up again when he is ready for lessons. I have made some attempt elsewhere to show what his parents and teachers owe to him in those years in which he is engaged in self-education, taking his lessons from everything he sees and hears, 
and strengthening his powers by everything he does. Here, in a volume which is chiefly concerned with education in the sense of schooling, I am anxious to bring before teachers the fact that a child comes into their hands with a mind of amazing potentialities. He has a brain, too, no doubt, the organ and instrument of that same mind, as a piano is not music, but the instrument of music. Probably we need not concern ourselves about the brain, which is subject to the same conditions as the rest of the material body, is fed with the body's food, rests as the body rests, requires fresh air and wholesome exercise to keep it in health, but depends upon the mind for its proper activities. The world has concerned itself of late so much with psychology, whose province is what has been called the unconscious mind, a region under the sway of nerves and blood, which it is best, perhaps, to let alone, that in our educational efforts we tend to ignore the mind and address ourselves to this region of symptoms. Now, mind, being spiritual, knows no fatigue. Brain, too, duly nourished with the food proper for the body, allowed due conditions of fresh air and rest, should not know fatigue. Given these two conditions, we have a glorious field of educational possibilities. But it rests with us to evolve a theory and practice which afford due recognition to mind. An authoritative saying which we are apt to associate with the religious life only is equally applicable to education. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, we are told. But we have forgotten this great principle in our efforts at schooling children. We give them a play way, and play is altogether necessary and desirable, but is not the avenue which leads to mind. We give them a fitting environment, which is again altogether desirable, and again is not the way to mind. We teach them beautiful motion, and we do well, for the body too must have its education. But we are not safe if we take these by-paths as approaches to mind. It is still true that that which is born of the spirit is spirit. The way to mind is a quite direct way. Mind must come into contact with mind through the medium of ideas. What is mind? says the old conundrum, and the answer still is, no matter. It is necessary for us who teach to realize that things material have little effect upon mind, because there are still among us schools in which the work is altogether material and technical. Whether the teaching is given by means of bars of wood or more scientific apparatus, the mistress of an elementary school writes, The father of one of my girls said to me yesterday, you have given me some work to do. E has let me have no rest until I promise to set up my microscope and get pond water, to look for monads and other wonders. Here we have the right order. That which was born of the spirit, the idea, came first, and demanded to confirm and illustrate. How can these things be, we ask? And the answer is not evident. Education, like faith, is the evidence of things not seen. We must begin with the notion that the business of the body is to grow, and it grows upon food, which food is composed of living cells, each a perfect life in itself. In like manner, though all analogies are misleading and inadequate, the only fit sustenance for the mind is ideas. And an idea, too, like the single cell of cellular tissue, appears to go through the stages and functions of a life. We receive it with appetite and some stir of interest. It appears to feed in a curious way. We hear of a new patent cure for the mind or the body, of the new thought of some poet, the new notion of a school of painters. We take in, accept the idea, and for days after every book we read, every person we talk with, brings food to the newly entertained notion. Not proven will be the verdict of the casual reader, but if he watch the behavior of his own mind towards any of the ideas in the air, he will find that some such process as I have described takes place. And this process must be considered carefully in the education of children. We may not take things casually as we have done. Our business is to give children the great ideas of life, of religion, history, science— but it is the ideas we must give, 
clothed upon with facts as they occur, and must leave the child to deal with these as he chooses. This is how he deals with geography, for example. When I heard of any new kingdom beyond the seas, the light and glory of it entered into me. It rose up within me, and I was enlarged by the whole. I entered into it. I saw its commodities, springs, meadows, inhabitants, and became possessor of that new room, as if it had been prepared for me, so much was I magnified and delighted in it. When the Bible was read, my spirit was present in other ages. I saw the light and splendor of them, the land of Canaan, the Israelites entering into it, the ancient glory of the Amorites, their peace and riches, their cities, houses, vines, and fig trees. I saw and felt all in such a lively manner as if there had been no other way to those places but in spirit only. Without changing place in myself, I could behold and enjoy all those. Anything when it was proposed, though it was a thousand years ago, being always present before me. I venture again to quote Traherne, because I know of no writer who retains so clear a memory of his infancy. But Goethe gives as full and convincing an account of his experience of the Bible. I say experience advisedly, for the word denotes the process by which children get to know. They experience all the things they hear and read of. These enter into them, and are their life and thus it is that ideas feed the mind in the most literal sense of the word feed. Do our geography lessons take the children there? Do they experience, live in, our story of the call of Abraham? Or of the healing of the blind man on the way to Jericho? If they do not, it is not for lack of earnestness and intention on the part of the teacher. His error is rather want of confidence in children. He has not formed a just measure of a child's mind, and bores his scholar with much talk about matters which they are able to understand for themselves much better than he does. How many teachers know that children require no pictures, excepting the pictures of great artists, which have quite another function than that of illustration? They see for themselves in their own minds a far more glorious, and indeed more accurate, presentation than we can afford in our miserable daubs. They read between the lines, and put in all the author has left out. A child of nine, who had been reading Lang's Tales of Troy and Greece, drew Ulysses on the Isle of Calypso, cutting down trees to make a raft. A child of ten, reveling in a midsummer night's dream, drew that Indian princess bringing her lovely boy to Titania. We others are content to know that Ulysses built a raft, that the boy was the child of an Indian princess. This is how any child's mind works, and our concern is not to starve these fertile intelligences. They must have food, in great abundance and variety. They know what to do with it well enough, and we need not disturb ourselves to provide for the separate exercise of each so-called faculty. For the mind is one, and works all together. Reason, imagination, reflection, judgment, what you please— are like all hands summoned by the heave-ho of the boatswain. All swarm on deck for the lading of cargo, that rich and odorous cargo of ideas, which the fair vessel of a child's mind is waiting to receive. Do we wish every child in a class to say, or, if he does not say, to feel, I was enlarged wonderfully by a geography lesson? Let him see the place with the eyes of those who have seen or conceived it. Your barographs, thermographs, contour lines, relief models, sections, profiles, and the like, will not do it. A map of the world must be a panorama to a child, of pictures so entrancing that he would rather ponder them than go out to play. And nothing is more easy than to give him this joie de vivre. Let him see the world as we ourselves choose to see it when we travel, its cities and peoples, its mountains and rivers, and he will go away from his lesson with the piece of the world he has read about, be it county or country, sea or shore, as that of a new room prepared for him, so much will he be magnified and delighted in it. All the world is in truth the child's possession, prepared for him, and if we keep him out of his rights by our technical, commercial, even historical geography, 
any sort of geography, in fact, made to illustrate our theories, we are guilty of fraudulent practices. What he wants is the world, and every bit, piece by piece, each bit a key to the rest. He reads of the boar of the Severn, and is on speaking terms with a boar wherever it occurs. He need not see a mountain to know a mountain. He sees all that is described to him with a vividness of which we know nothing, just as if there had been no other way to those places but in spirit only. Who can take the measure of a child? The genie of the Arabian tale is nothing to him. He too may be let out of his bottle and fill the world. But woe to us if we keep him corked up. Enough that the children have minds, and every man's mind is his means of living. But it is a great deal more. Working men will have leisure in the future, and how this leisure is to be employed is a question much discussed. Now no one can employ leisure fitly whose mind is not brought into active play every day. The small affairs of a man's own life supply no intellectual food, and but small and monotonous intellectual exercise. Science, history, philosophy, literature, must no longer be the luxuries of the educated classes. All classes must be educated and sit down to these things of the mind as they do to their daily bread. History must afford its pageants, science its wonders, literature its intimacies, philosophy its speculations, religion its assurances to every man, and his education must have prepared him for wanderings in these realms of gold. How do we prepare a child again to use the aesthetic sense with which he appears to come provided? His education should furnish him with whole galleries of mental pictures, pictures by great artists old and new. Israel's Pancake Woman, his Children by the Sea, Millet's Feeding the Birds, First Steps, Angelus, Rembrandt's Night Watch, The Supper at Emmaus, Velasquez's Surrender of Breda, in fact, every child should leave school with at least a couple of hundred pictures by great masters hanging permanently in the halls of his imagination, to say nothing of great buildings, sculpture, beauty of form and color in things he sees. Perhaps we might secure at least a hundred lovely landscapes, too. Sunsets, cloudscapes, starlight nights. At any rate, he should go forth well furnished, because imagination has the property of magical expansion. The more it holds, the more it will hold. It is not only a child's intellect, but his heart that comes to us thoroughly furnished. Can any of us love like a little child? Father and mother, sisters and brothers, neighbors and friends, our cat and our dog, the wretchedest old stump of a broken toy, all come in for his lavish tenderness. How generous and grateful he is! How kind and simple! How pitiful and how full of benevolence in the strict sense of good will! How loyal and humble! How fair and just! His conscience is on the alert. Is a tale true? Is a person good? These are the important questions. His conscience chides him when he is naughty, and by degrees as he is trained, his will comes to his aid, and he learns to order his life. He is taught to say his prayers, and we elders hardly realize how real his prayers are to a child. Part 3. Motives for Learning Now place a teacher before a class of persons the beauty and immensity of each one of whom I have tried to indicate, and he will say, What have I to offer them? His dull routine lessons crumble into the dust they are when he faces children as they are. He cannot go on offering them his stale commonplaces. He feels that he may not bore them, that he may not prick the minds he has dulled by unworthy motives of greed or emulation. He would not invite a parcel of children to a time and feast of smoke and lukewarm water. He knows that children's minds hunger at regular intervals, as do their bodies, that they hunger for knowledge, not for information and that his own poor stock of knowledge is not enough, his own desultory talk has not substance enough, that his irrelevant remarks interrupt a child's train of thought, that, in a word, he is not sufficient for these things. On the other hand, 
The children, the children of the slums especially, have no vocabulary to speak of, no background of thought derived from a cultured environment. They are like goodly pictures, capable of holding much, but with necks so narrow that only the thinnest stream can trickle in. So we have thought hitherto, and our teaching has been diluted to dishwater, and the pictures have gone empty away. But we have changed all that, just as in the war the magnanimous, patriotic citizen was manifested in every man, so in our schools every child has been discovered to be a person of infinite possibilities. I say every child, for so-called backward children are no exception. I shall venture to bring before the reader some experiences of the parents' union school as being ground with which I am familiar. Examination papers representing tens of thousands of children working in elementary schools, secondary schools, and home school rooms have just passed under my eye. How the children have reveled in knowledge, and how good and interesting all their answers are. How well they spell on the whole, and how well they write. We do not need the testimony of their teachers that the work of the term has been joyous. The verve with which the children tell what they know proves the fact. Every one of these children knows that there are hundreds of pleasant places for the mind to roam in. They are good and happy because some little care has been taken to know what they are and what they require, a care very amply rewarded by results which alter the whole outlook on education. In our training college, the students are not taught how to stimulate attention, how to keep order, how to give marks, how to punish or even how to reward, how to manage a large class or a small school with children in different classes. All these come by nature in a school where the teachers know something of the capacities and requirements of children. To hear children of the slums telling King Lear or Woodstock, by the hour if you will let them, or describing with minutest details Van Eyck's Adoration of the Lamb or Botticelli's Spring, is a surprise, a revelation. We take off our shoes from our feet, we did not know it was in them, whether we be their parents, their teachers, or mere lookers-on. And with some feeling of awe upon us, we shall be the better prepared to consider how and upon what children should be educated. I will only add that I make no claims for them which cannot be justified by hundreds, thousands of instances within our experience. End of section 2 Section 3 of Home Education Series, Volume 6. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Home Education Series, Volume 6. Towards the Philosophy of Education, by Charlotte Mason. The Good and Evil Nature of a Child. Children are not born bad, but with possibilities for good and for evil. 1. Well-being of body. A well-known educationalist has brought heavy charges against us all on the score that we bring up children as children of wrath. He probably exaggerates the effect of any such teaching, and the little angel theory is fully as mischievous. The fact seems to be that children are like ourselves, not because they have become so, but because they are born so. That is, with tendencies, dispositions towards good and towards evil, and also with a curious intuitive knowledge as to which is good and which is evil. Here we have the work of education indicated. There are good and evil tendencies in body and mind, heart and soul, and the hope set before us is that we can foster the good so as to attenuate the evil. That is, on occasion that we put education in her true place as the handmaid of religion. The community, the nation, the race are now taking their due place in our religious thought. We are no longer solely occupied in what an Irish woman called saving your dirty soul. Our religion is becoming more magnanimous and more responsible, and it is time that a light change should take place in our educational thought. We find ourselves in open places breathing fresher air when we consider 
not the education of an individual child or of a social class or even of a given country, but of the race, of the human nature common to every class at every country, every individual child. The prospect is exhilarating and the recognition of the potentialities in any child should bring about such an educational renaissance as may send our weary old world rejoicing on its way. Physicians and physiologists tell us that newborn children start fair. A child is not born with tuberculosis, for example, if with the tendency which it is our business to counteract. In the same way, all possibilities for good are contained in his moral and intellectual outfit, hindered it may be by corresponding tendency to evil for every such potentiality. We begin to see our way. It is our business to know of what parts and passions a child is made up, to discern the dangers that present themselves, and still more the possibilities of free going into lifeful paths. However disappointing, even forbidding, the failings of a child, we may be quite sure that in every case the opposite tendency is there and we must bring the wit to give it play. Parents have this sort of mother wit more commonly than we outsiders, teachers and the like. Of course, we know of the mothers and fathers who can't do anything with Tom and hope the schoolmaster will lick him into shape. But how often, on the other hand, are we surprised to see how much more of persons Bob and Polly are in their own homes than at school? Perhaps this is because parents know their children better than do others, and for that reason believe in them more. For our faith in the divine and the human keeps pace with our knowledge. For this reason it behoves us teachers to get a bird's eye view of the human nature which is present in every child. Everybody knows that hunger, thirst, rest, chastity are those natural endowments of the body by means of which it grows and functions. But in every child there are tendencies to greediness, restlessness, sloth, impurity, any one of which, by allowance, may ruin the child and the man that he will be. Again, our old friends, the five senses, require direction and practice. Smell, especially, might be made a source of delicate pleasure by the habit of discriminating the good smells of field and garden, flower and fruit, for their own sakes, not as ministering to taste, which, unduly pampered, becomes a man's master. But there is little that is new to be learned about the body, in those various body servants with which it is equipped. Education already does her part in training the muscles, cultivating the senses, ordering the nerves of all children, rich and poor. For in these days we perceive that the development which is due to one child is due to all. If we make a mistake in regard to physical education, it is perhaps in the matter of ordering the nerves of a child. We do not consider enough that the nourishment, rest, fresh air, and natural exercise, proper for the body as a whole, meet the requirements of the nervous system, and that the undue nervous tension which a small child suffers in carrying a cup of tea, an older boy or girl in cramming for an examination, may be the cause later of a distressing nervous breakdown. We are becoming a nervous, overstrained nation, and though golf and cricket may do something for us, a watchful education, alert to arrest every symptom of nervous overpressure, would do much to secure for every child a fine physique and a high degree of staying power. A snare which attends the really brilliant teacher is the exhausting effect upon children of an overpowering personality. They are such ardent and responsive little souls that the teacher who gives them nods and becks and wreathed its smiles may play the Pied Piper with them. But he or she should beware. The undue play of the personality of the teacher is likely to suppress and subdue that of his scholars. And not only so, children are so eager to live up to the demands made upon them that they may be brought to a state of continual nervous overpressure under the influence of a charming personality. 
This sort of subjection, the far mercy of the Germans, was powerfully set forth in a recent novel in which an unprincipled and fascinating mistress ran her personality with disastrous results. But the danger does not lie in extreme cases. The girl who kisses the chamber door of her class mistress will forget this lady by and by. But the parasitic habit has been formed, and she must always have some person or some cause on which to hang her body and soul. I speak of she and her, perhaps unfairly, because ever since the Greek youth hung about their teachers in the walks of the academy, there have been teachers who have undermined the stability of the boys to whom they devoted themselves. Were his countrymen entirely wrong about Socrates? A tendency to this manner of betrayal is the infirmity of noble minds, of those who have the most to give. And for this reason, again, it is important that we should have before us a bird's eye view, let us call it, of human nature. Two, well-being of mind. There is a common notion that it is our inalienable right not only to say what we please, but to think as we please. That is, we believe that while body is subject to physical laws, while the affections, love, and justice are subject to moral laws, the mind is a chartered libertine. Probably this notion has much to do with our neglect of intellect. We do not perceive that the mind, too, has its tendencies, both good and evil, and that every inclination towards good is hindered and may be thwarted by a corresponding inclination towards evil. I am not speaking of moral evil, but of those intellectual evils which are slow to define and are careless in dealing with. Does the teacher of a large class always perceive that intellect is enthroned before him in every child? However dull and inattentive may be his outer show, every child in such a class is open to the wonders that science reveals, is interested in the wheeling words of the winter firmament. Child after child, said a schoolmistress, writes to say how much they have enjoyed reading about the stars. As we are walking sometimes and the stars are shining, says a girl of 11 in an elementary school. I tell mother about the stars and planets and comets. She said she should think astronomy very interesting. But we teach astronomy. No, we teach light and heat by means of desiccated textbooks, diagrams and experiments, which last are no more to children than the tricks of white magic. The infinitely little is as attractive to them as the infinitely great, and the behavior of an atom, an ion, is a fairy tale they delight in. That is, if no semblance to a fairy tale be suggested, the pageant of history with its interplay of characters is as delightful as any tale, because every child uses his own film to show the scenes and exhibit the persons. We fuss a good deal about the dress, implements, and other small details of each historic period, but we forget that. Give the child a few fit and exact words on the subject, and he has the picture in his mind's eye, nay, a series miles long of really glorious films. For a child's amazing, vivifying imagination is part and parcel of his intellect. The way children make their own, the examples offered to them is amazing. No child would forget the characterization of Charles the Ninth as feeble and violent, nor fail to take to himself a lesson in self-control. We may not point the moral that is, the work proper for children themselves, and they do it without fail. The comparative difficulty of the subject does not affect them. A teacher writes of children of 11, they cannot have enough a publicola, and there are always groans when the lesson comes to an end. I have said much of history and science, but mathematics, a mountainous land which pays the climber, makes its appeal to mind, and good teachers know that they may not drown their teaching in verbiage. As for literature, to introduce children to literature is to install them in a very rich and glorious kingdom. 
to bring a continual holiday to their doors, to lay before them a feast exquisitely served. But they must learn to know literature by being familiar with it from the very first. A child's intercourse must always be with good books, the best that we can find. Of course, we have always known that this is the right thing for children in cultivated homes. But what about those in whose dwellings books are little known? One of the wise teachers in Gloucestershire's notes that a recognition of two things is necessary in dealing with this problem. First, that to explain the meaning of words destroys interest in the story and annoys the child. Second, that in many instances it is unnecessary. Although a child's dictionary knowledge of words is lacking, it does not follow that the meaning of a sentence or paragraph is unknown to him. Neither is the correct employment of the words beyond him in writing or narrating. Two examples of this power to sense the meaning were observed last term. There is a particular boy in Form 2B who has not hitherto been looked upon as possessing high intelligence. Classified by age, he ought to be two forms higher. Last term, in taking the story of Romulus and Remus, I found that in power of narrating a degree of understanding that is of sensing a paragraph and either translating it into his vocabulary or in using the words read to him, he stood above the others and also above the majority in the next higher form. What has surprised us most, said the headmaster of A, is the ready way in which boys absorb information and become interested in literature. Literature which we have hitherto considered outside the scope of primary school teaching. A year ago, I could not have believed that boys would have read Lytton's Herald, Kingsley's Harewood, and Scott's Talisman with real pleasure and zest, and would study with understanding and delight Shakespeare's Macbeth, King John, and Richard II. But experience has shown us we have underrated the abilities and tastes of the lads we should have known better. That is the capital charge against most schools. The teachers underrate the tastes and abilities of their pupils. In things intellectual, children, even backward children, have extraordinary possibilities for good. Possibilities so great that if we had the wit to give them their head, they would carry us along like a stream in spate. But what about intellectual tendencies or possibilities for evil? One such tendency dominates many schools, notwithstanding prodigious efforts on the part of the teachers to rouse slumbering minds. Indeed, the more the teacher works, the greater the incuria of the children. So the class is prodded with marks. The boys take places. The boogie of an oncoming examination is held before them. Some spasmodic effort is the result, but no vital response. And though boys and girls love school, like their teachers and even their lessons, they care not at all for knowledge for which the school should create enthusiasm. I can touch here on no more than two potent means of creating incuria in a class. One is the talky-talky of the teacher. We all know how we are bored by the person in private life, who explains and expounds. What reason have we to suppose that children are not equally bored? They try to tell us that they are, by wandering eyes, inanimate features, fidgeting hands and feet, by every means at their disposal. And the kindly souls among us think that they want to play or be out of doors. But they have no use for play except at proper intervals. What they want is knowledge, conveyed in literary form in the talk of the facile teacher, leaves them cold. Another soothing potion is little suspected of producing mental lethargy. We pride ourselves upon going over and over the same ground until the children know it. The monotony is deadly. A child writes, Before we had these books, we had to read the same old lot again and again. Is it not true? In the home school room, books used by the grandmother are fit for the grandchildren. Books used in boys' schools may be picked up at second-hand stalls, 
with the obliterated names of a half a dozen successive owners. And what of the compilations, neither books nor textbooks, which do duty in elementary schools? No wonder Mr. Fisher said, in opening a public library, that he had been surprised and pained when visiting elementary schools to find that there was nothing in them which recalled a book, nothing that would charm and enlighten and expand the imagination. And yet, as he went on to say, the country is full of artistic and literary ability and always has been so. If this ability is to be brought into play, we must recognize that children are not ruminants intellectually any more than physically. They cannot go over the same ground repeatedly without deadening, even paralyzing results. For progress, continual progress, is the law of intellectual life. In matters of the mind, again, habit is a good servant but a bad master. Specialization, the fetish at the end of the last century, is to be deprecated because it is at our peril that we remain too long in any one field of thought. We may not, for example, allow the affairs and interests of daily life to deprive the mind of its proper range of interests and occupations. It is even possible for a person to go into any one of the great fields of thought and to work therein with delight until he become incapable of finding his way into any other such field. We know how Darwin lost himself in science until he could not read poetry, find pleasure in pictures, think about things divine. He was unable to turn his mind out of the course in which it had run for most of his life. In the great and ungoverned age of the Renaissance, the time when great things were done, great pictures painted, great buildings raised, great discoveries made, the same man was a painter, an architect, a goldsmith, and a master of much knowledge besides. And all that he did, he did well. All that he knew was part of his daily thought and enjoyment. Let us hear Vasari on Leonardo. Possessed of a divine and marvelous intellect, and being an excellent geometrician, he not only worked at sculpture, but also repaired many architectural plans and buildings. He made designs for mills and other engines to go by water, and as painting was to be his profession, he studied drawing from life. Leonardo knew nothing about art for art's sake, that shibboleth of yesterday, nor did our own Christopher Wren, also a great mathematician and master of much and various knowledge, to whom architecture was rather a by-the-way interest, and yet he built St. Paul's. What an irreparable loss we had when that plan of his for a beautiful and spacious London was flung aside because it would cost too much to carry it out. Just so, of our parsimony, do we fling aside the minds of the children of our country, also capable of being brought into pleasances of delight, structures of utility and beauty, at a pitifully trifling cost. It is well we should recognize that the business of education is with us all our lives, that we must always go on increasing our knowledge. Of the means we employ to hinder the growth of mind, perhaps none is more subtle than the questionnaire. It is as though one required a child to produce for inspection at its various stages of assimilation the food he consumed for his dinner. We see at once how the digestive processes would be hindered, how, in a word, the child would cease to be fed. But the mind also requires its food and leave to carry on those quiet processes of digestion and assimilation, which it must accomplish for itself. The child with capacity, which implies depth, is stupefied by a long rigmarole on the lines of, if John's father is Tom's son, what relation is Tom to John? The shallow child guesses the riddle and scores, and it is by the use of tests of this kind that we turn out young people sharp as needles, but with no power of reflection, no intelligent interest, nothing but the aptness of the city gammon. Imagination may become like that cave, as Achille tells of, wherein were all manner of unseemly and evil things. 
It may be a temple wherein self is glorified. It may be a chamber of horrors and dangers, but it may also be a house beautiful. It is enough for us to remember that imagination is stored with those images supplied day by day, whether by the cinema, the penny dreadful, by Homer or Shakespeare, by the great picture of the flaming shocker. We have heard of the imaginative man who conceived a passion for the Sphinx. In these days when reason is deified by the unlearned and plays the part of the Lord of Misrule, it is necessary that every child should be trained to recognize fallacious reasoning, and above all to know that a man's reason is his servant and not his master, that there is no notion a man chooses to receive which his reason will not justify, whether it be mistrust of his neighbor, jealousy of his wife, doubts about his religion, or contempt for his country. Realizing this, we see reason in the fact that thousands of men go on strike because two of their body have been denied permission to attend a certain meeting. We see reason in this, but the men themselves confound reason with right and consider that such a strike is righteous protest. The only safeguard against fallacies which undermine the strength of the nation, morally and economically, is a liberal education which affords a wide field for reflection and comparison, and abundant data upon which to found sound judgments. As for the aesthetic appetency, to use Coleridge's word, upon which so many of the gentle pleasures of life depend, it is open to many disasters. It dies of inanition, and beauty is not duly presented to it. Beauty in words, in pictures and music, in tree and flower and sky. The function of the sense of beauty is to open a paradise of pleasure for us. But what if we grow up admiring the wrong things, or, what is morally worse, arrogant in the belief that it is only we and our kind who are able to appreciate and distinguish beauty? It is no small part of education to have seen much beauty, to recognize it when we see it, and to keep ourselves humble in its presence. 3. Intellectual Appetite As the body is provided with its appetites by undue indulgence of any one of which a man may make shipwreck, but which duly ordered should result in a robust and vigorous frame, so too, the spiritual part of us is provided with certain caterers whose business it is to secure that kind of nourishment which promotes spiritual or intellectual growth in one or another direction. Perhaps in no part of our educational service do we make more serious blunders than in our use of those desires which act as to the appetites for the body's service. Every child wants to be approved, even baby in his new red shoes, to be first in what is going on, to get what is going, to be admired, to lead and manage the rest, to have the companionship of children and grown people. And last but not least, every child wants to know. There they are, those desires, ready to act on occasion, are our business is to make due use of this natural provision for the work of education. We do make use of the desires, not wisely, but too well. We run our schools upon emulation, the desire of every child to be first, and not the ablest, but the most pushing, comes to the front. We quicken emulation by the common desire to get and to have, that is, by the impulse of avarice. So we offer prizes, exhibitions, scholarships, every incentive that can be proposed. We cause him to work for our approbation. We play upon his vanity, and the boy does more than he can. What is the harm, we say, when all those springs of action are in the child already? The athlete is beginning to discover that he suffers elsewhere from the undue development of any set of muscles, and the boy whose ambition or emulation has been unduly stimulated, becomes a flaccid person. But there is a worse evil. We all want knowledge just as much as we want bread. 
We know it is possible to cure the latter appetite by giving more stimulating food. And the worst of using other spurs to learning is that a natural love of knowledge which should carry us through eager school days and give a spice of adventure to the duller days of mature life is effectually choked. And boys and girls cram to pass but not to know. They do pass, but they don't know. The divine curiosity, which should have been an equipment for life, hardly survives early school days. Now it has been demonstrated very fully indeed that the delightfulness of knowledge is sufficient to carry a pupil joyfully and eagerly through his school life and that prizes and places, praise, blame, and punishment are unnecessary insofar as they are used to secure ardent interest and eager work. The love of knowledge is sufficient. Each of those other stimuli should no doubt have its natural action, but one or two springs of action seem to be played upon excessively in our schools. Conduct gives opportunity for virtue emulously rapid in the race, and especially that part of conduct known as play in which most of the natural desires come into action. But even in play, we must beware of the excess of zeal, which risks the elimination of the primary feelings of love and justice. In the schoolroom, without doubt, the titillation of knowledge itself affords sufficient stimulus to close attention and steady labor, and the desire of acquisition has to play in a boy who is constantly increasing his acquirements. Four, misdirected affections. We are aware of more than mind and body in our dealings with children. We appeal to their feelings, whether mind or feelings be more than names. We choose to give to manifestations of that spiritual entity, which is each one of us. Probably we have not even taken the trouble to analyze and name the feelings, and to discover that all fall under the names of love and justice, that it is the glory of the human being to be endowed with such a wealth of these two as is sufficient for every occasion of life. More, the occasions come and he is ready to meet them with the ease and triumph of the solvent debtor. But this rich endowment of the moral nature is also a matter with which the educator should concern himself. Alas, he does so. He points the moral with a thousand tedious platitudes, directs, instructs, illustrates, and bores exceedingly the nimble and subtle minds of his scholars. This of the feelings and their manifestations is certainly the field for the spare and guarded praise and blame of parent and teacher. But this praise or blame is apt to be either scrapped by children or taken as the sole motive for conduct. They go forth unused to do a thing, for it is right, but only because somebody's approbation is to be won. This education of the feelings, moral education, is too delicate and personal a matter for a teacher to undertake, trusting to his own resources. Children are not to be fed morally like young pigeons with predigested food. They must pick and eat for themselves, and they do so from the conduct of others which they hear of or perceive. But they want a great quantity of the sort of food whose issue is conduct, and that is why poetry, history, romance, geography, travel, biography, science, and sums must all be pressed into service. No one can tell what particular morsel a child will select for his sustenance. One small boy of eight may come down late because I was meditating upon Plato and couldn't fasten my buttons, and another may find his meat in Peter Pan. But all children must read widely and know what they have read for the nourishment of their complex nature. As for moral lessons, they are worse than useless. Children want a great deal of fine and various moral feeding from which they draw the lessons they require. It is a wonderful thing that every child, even the brutest, is endowed with love and is able for all its manifestations, kindness, benevolence, generosity, gratitude, pity, 
sympathy, loyalty, humility, gladness. We older persons are amazed at the lavish display of any one of these to which the most ignorant child may treat us. But these aptitudes are so much coin of the realm with which a child is provided that he may be able to pay his way through life. And alas, we are aware of certain vulgar commonplace tendencies in ourselves, which make us walk delicately and trust, not to our own teaching, but to the best that we have in art and literature, and above all, to that storehouse of example and precept, the Bible, to enable us to touch these delicate spirits to find issues. St. Francis, Collingwood, Father Damien, one of VCs among us, will do more for children than years of talk. Then there is that other wonderful provision for right living without which no neglected or savage man's soul exists. Everyone has justice in his heart. A cry for fair play reaches the most lawless mob. And we all know how children torment us with their, it's not fair. It is much to know that as regard justice, as well as love, there exists in everyone an adequate provision for the conduct of life. General unrest, which has its rise in wrong thinking and wrong judging, far more than in faulty conditions, is the misguided outcome of that sense of justice with which, thank God, we are all endued. Here on the face of it, we get one office of education. This of justice is another spiritual provision which we fail to employ duly in our schools. And so wonderful is this principle that we cannot kill, paralyze, or even benumb it, but choked in its natural course, it spreads havoc and devastation where it should have made the soil fertile for the fruits of good living. Few of the offices of education are more important than that of preparing men to distinguish between their rights and their duties. We each have our rights, and other persons have their duties towards us, as we towards them. But it is not easy to learn that we have precisely the same rights as other people, and no more that other people owe to us just such duties as we owe to them. This fine art of self-adjustment is possible to everyone because of the ineradicable principle which abides in us. But our eyes must be taught to see, and hence the need for all the processes of education, futile in proportion as they do not serve this end. To think fairly requires, we know, knowledge as well as consideration. Young people should leave school knowing that their thoughts are not their own, that what we think of other people is a matter of justice or injustice, that a certain manner of words is due from them to all manner of persons with whom they have to deal, and that not to speak those words is to be unjust to their neighbors. They should know that truth, that is, justice in word, is their due and that of all other persons. There are few better equipments for a citizen than a mind capable of discerning the truth, and this just mind can be preserved only by those who take heed what they think. Yet truth, says Bacon, which only doth judge itself, teacheth that the enquiry of truth, which is the love-making or wooing of it, the knowledge of truth, which is the presence of it, and the belief of truth, which is the enjoying of it, is the sovereign good of human nature. If justice in word is to be duly learned by all scholars, still more is integrity, justice in action, integrity in work, which disallows cacani methods, whether those of the artisan who does as little as he can in the time, or of the schoolboy who receives payment in kind, in his support, the cost of his education and the trust imposed in him by parents and teachers. Therefore, he may not scamp, dawdle over, postpone, crib, or otherwise shirk his work. He learns that my duty towards my neighbor is to keep my hands from picking and stealing. And whether a man be a workman, a servant, or a prosperous citizen, 
he must know that justice requires from him the integrity in material which we call honesty. Not the common honesty, which hates to be found out, but that we find in delicate sense of values which George Eliot exhibits for us in Caleb Garth. There is another form in which the magnanimous citizen of the future must be taught the senses of justice. Our opinions show our integrity of thought. Every person has many opinions, whether his own honestly thought out, or notions picked up from his pet newspaper or his companions. The person who thinks out his opinions modestly and carefully is doing his duty as truly as if he saved a life, because there is no more or less about duty. If a schoolboy is to be guided into the justice of thought, from which sound opinions emanate, how much more does he need guidance in arriving at that justice, in motive, which we call sound principles? For what, after all, are principles, but those motives of first importance which govern us, move us in thought and action? We appear to pick up these in a casual way and are seldom able to render an account of them, and yet our lives are ordered by our principles, good or bad. Here again, we have a reason for wide and wisely ordered reading, for there are always catchwords floating in the air, as, what's the good? It's all brought, and the like, which the vacant mind catches up for use as the basis of thought, and conduct as, in fact, paltry principles for the guidance of a life. Here we have one more reason why there is nothing in all those spiritual stores in the world's treasury too good for the education of all children. Every lovely tale, illuminating poem, instructive history, every unfolding of travel and revelation of science exists for children. La terre apparitiant à la font. Toujours à la font. Was well said by Maxim Gorky, and we should do well to remember the fact. The service that some of us of the PNEU believe we have done in the cause of education is to discover that all children, even backward children, are aware of their needs and pathetically eager for the food they require, that no preparation whatever is necessary for this sort of diet, that a limited vocabulary, sordid surroundings, the absence of a literary background to thought are not hindrances. Indeed, they may turn out to be incentives to learning, just as the more hungry the child, the ruddier he is for his dinner. This statement is no more pious opinion. It has been amply proved in thousands of instances. Children of a poor school in the slums are eager to tell the whole story of Waverley, falling continually into the beautiful language and style of the author. They talk about the Rosetta Stone and about treasures in their local museum. They discuss Coriolanus and conclude that his mother must have spoiled him. They know by heart every detail of a picture by Le Coach, Rembrandt, Botticelli, and not only is no evolution of history or drama, no subtle sweetness, no inspiration of a poet beyond them, but they decline to know that which does not reach them in literary form. What they receive under this condition they absorb immediately, and show that they know by that test of knowledge, which applies to us all, that is, they can tell it with power, clearness, vivacity, and charm. These are the children to whom we have been doling out the three R's for generations. Small wonder that juvenile crime increases. The intellectually starved boy must needs find food for his imagination, scope for his intellectual power and crime like the cinema, offers it must be admitted brave adventures. Five, the well-being of the soul. If we leave the outer courts of mind and body, the holy places of the affections and the will, we shall consider this last later, and enter that holy of holies where man performs his priestly functions. We may well ask with diffidence and humility, what may education do for the soul of a child? What is there that outwits the understanding of a man 
or that is out of range of his thoughts, the reach of his aspirations. He is, it is true, baffled on all hands by his ignorance, the illimitable ignorance of even the wisest. But ignorance is not incapacity, and the wings of a man's soul beat with impatience against the bars of his ignorance. He would out, out into the universe of infinite thought and infinite possibilities. How is the soul of a man to be satisfied? Crowned kings have thrown up dominions because they want that which is greater than kingdom. Profound scholars fret under limitations which keep them playing upon the margin of the unsounded ocean of knowledge. No great love can satisfy itself with loving. There is no satisfaction save one for the soul of a man, because the things about him are finite, measurable, incomplete, and his reach is beyond his grasp. He has an urgent, incessant, irreplaceable need of the infinite. I want, am made for, and must have a God, not a mere serviceable religion, because we have in us an infinite capacity for love, loyalty and service which we cannot expend upon any other. But what sort of approaches do we prepare for children towards the God whom they need, the Savior in whom is all help, the King who affords all delight, commands all adoration and loyalty? Any words or thoughts of ours are poor and insufficient, but we have a treasury of divine words which they read and know with satisfying pleasure and tell with singular beauty and fitness. The Bible is the most interesting book I know, said a young person of ten, who had read a good many books and knew her Bible. By degrees, children get that knowledge of God, which is the object of the final daily prayer in our beautiful liturgy, the prayer of St. Chrysostom. Grant us in this world knowledge of thy truth, and all other knowledge which they obtain gathers round and illuminates this. Here is an example of how such knowledge grows. I heard a class of girls aged about 13 read an essay on George Herbert. Three or four of his poems were included, and none of the girls had read either essay or poems before. They narrated what they had read, and in the course of their narration, gave a full paraphrase of the elixir, the pulley, and one or two other poems. No point made by the poet was omitted, and his exact words were used pretty freely. The teacher made comments upon one or two unusual words, and that was all. To explain or enforce otherwise than by a reverently sympathetic manner, the glance and words that showed that she too cared would have been impertinent. It is an interesting thing that hundreds of children of this age in secondary and elementary schools and in families scattered over the world read and narrated the same essay and no doubt paraphrase the verses with equal ease. I felt humbled before the children, knowing myself incapable of such immediate and rapid apprehension of several pages of new matter including poems whose intention is by no means obvious. In such ways, the great thoughts of great thinkers illuminate children, and they grow in knowledge, chiefly the knowledge of God. And yet this, the chief part of education, is drowned in torrents of talk, in tedious repetition, in objuration and recrimination, in every sort of way in which the mind may be bored and the affections deadened. I have endeavored to sketch some of the possibilities for good and the corresponding possibilities for evil present in all children. They are waiting for direction and control, certainly, but still more for the formative influence of knowledge. I have avoided philosophical terms, using only names in common use. Body and soul, body and mind, body, soul, and spirit because these represent ideas that we cannot elude and that convey certain definite notions. And these ideas must needs form the basis of our educational thought. We must know something about the material we are to work upon if the education we offer is not to be scrappy and superficial. We have some measure of a child's requirements, 
not based upon his uses to society, nor upon the standard of the world he lives in, but upon his own capacity and needs. We would not willingly educate him towards what is called self-expression. He has little to express except what he has received as knowledge, whether by way of record or impression. What he can do is to assimilate and give forth in a form which is original because it is modified, recreated by the action of his own mind. And this originality is produced by the common bread and milk, which is food for everyone, acting upon the mind which is peculiar to each individual child. Education implies a continuous going forth of the mind, but whatever induces introspection of any kind of self-consciousness holds up, as it were, the intellectual powers and brings progress to a standstill. The reader may have noticed with some disappointment that I have not invited him to the study of psychology, as it is understood today. No doubt there exists a certain dim region described as the unconscious mind, a sort of halfway house between mind and matter, a place where the intellect is subdued to the action of nerves and blood. Mind is of its nature infinitely and always conscious, and to speak of the unconscious mind is a contradiction in terms. But what is meant is that the mind thinks in ways of which we are unconscious, and that our business is to make ourselves aware by much introspection, much self-occupation, of the nature and tendencies of this unconscious region. The results of this study, so far as they have been arrived at, are not encouraging. The best that is in us would appear to find its origin in complexes, sensual, erotic, greedy, granting that such possibilities are in us safety lies in so nourishing the mind that seed of baseness may bear fruit of beauty. Researchers in this region are deeply interested, no doubt, to the psychologist and may eventually bear fruit if only as contributing a quota to the classification of knowledge. But no authority on the subject is willing to offer at present his researches as a contribution to educational lore. It may be that the mind as well as the body, as its regions when no lead me to Gary, is a council of expedience, and by the time we have dealt with those functions of the mind which we know, we may find ourselves in a position to formulate that which we certainly do not possess. A science, should it not be a philosophy of education? End of section three. Section 4 of Home Education Series, Volume 6. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Julie Hedrick. Home Education Series, Volume 6, Towards a Philosophy of Education by Charlotte Mason. Section 4. Chapter 4. Authority and Docility. The principles of authority on the one hand and docility on the other are natural, necessary, and fundamental. The war has made surprises stale, but in those remote pre-war days we were enormously startled by the discovery of wireless telegraphy. That communication should pass through almost infinite space without sign or sound or obvious channel and arrive instantly at their destination took away our breath. We had the grace to value the discovery for something more than its utility. We were awed in the presence of a law which had always been there, but was only now perceived. In something the same way, we have been electrified by the discovery in the fields of France of heroism in the breast of every common soldier. Now, just such discoveries wait us in the field of education, and any miner in this field may strike a vein of ore which shall enrich the world. The citizens of an ancient city on the shores of Gennesaret made one of those startling discoveries and knew how to give it a name. They found out that Christ spake with authority and not as their scribes. 
It is not ours to speak with authority. The verily, verily, I say unto you is a divine word, not for us. Nevertheless, deputed authority is among us and in us. He is an authority on such and such a subject is a correct expression, because by much study he has made it his own and has a right to speak. This deputed authority appears to be lodged in everyone, ready for occasion. Mr. Benjamin Kidd has told us how the London policeman is the very embodiment of authority, implicitly obeyed in a way surprising to strangers. Every king and commander, every mother, elder sister, school prefect, every foreman of works and captain of games, finds that within himself which secures faithful obedience, not for the sake of his merits, but because authority is proper to his office. Without this principle, society would cease to cohere. Practically, there is no such thing as anarchy, which is so called as a mere transference of authority, even if in the last resort the anarchist find authority in himself alone. There is an idea abroad that authority makes for tyranny, and that obedience, voluntary or involuntary, is of the nature of slavishness. But authority is, on the contrary, the condition without which liberty does not exist, and, except it be abused, is entirely congenial to those on whom it is exercised. We are so made that we like to be ordered even if the ordering be only that of circumstances. Servants take pride in the orders they receive. That our badge of honor is an order is a significant use of words. It is still true that order is heaven's first law, and order is the outcome of authority. That principle in us which brings us into subjection to authority is docility, teachableness, and that also is universal. If a man in the pride of his heart decline other authority, he will submit himself slavishly to his star or his destiny. It would seem that the exercise of a docility is as natural and necessary as that of reason or imagination. And the two principles of authority and docility act in every life precisely as do the two elemental principles which enable the earth to maintain its orbit, the one drawing it towards the sun, the other as constantly driving it into space. Between the two, the earth maintains a more or less middle course, and the days go on. The same two principles work in every child, the one producing ordered life, the other making for rebellion. And the crux in bringing up children is to find the mean which shall keep a child true to his elliptical orbit. The solution offered today is freedom in our schools. Children may be governed, but they must not be aware that they are governed, and go as you please, must be the apparent rule of their lives, while do as your bid is the moving force. The result of an ordered freedom is obtained, that ordered freedom which rules the lives of 999 and 1,000 of the citizens of the world. But the drawback to an indirect method of securing this result is that when do as you please is substituted for do as your bid, there is a dissimulation in the air, and children fail to learn that habit of proud subjection and dignified obedience which distinguishes great men and noble citizens. No doubt it is pleasing that children should behave naturally, should get up and wander about, should sit still or frolic as they have a mind to. But they too must learn obedience, and it is no small element in their happiness and ours that obedience is both delightful and reposeful. It is the part of the teacher to secure willing obedience, not so much to himself as to the laws of the school and the claims of the matter in hand. If a boy have a passage to read, he obeys the call of that immediate duty, reads the passage with attention, and is happy in doing so. We all know with what a sense of added importance we say, I must be at Mrs. Jones's by eleven. It is necessary that I should see Brown. The life that does not obey such conditions has got out of its orbit and is not of use to society. It is necessary that we should all follow an ordered course, and children, even infant children, must begin in the way in which they will have to go on. Happily, they come to us with the two inherent forces, centripetal and centrifugal, which secure to them freedom, i.e. self-authority, on the one hand, and proud subjection on the other. 
but parents and those who stand in loco parentis have a delicate task. There must be subjection, but it must be proud, worn as a distinction, an order of merit. Probably the way to secure this is to avoid standing between children and those laws of life and conduct by which we are all ultimately ruled. The higher the authority, the greater distinction in obedience, and children are quick to discriminate between the mere will and pleasure of the arbitrary teacher or parent and the chastened authority of him who is himself under rule. That subservience should take the place of docility is the last calamity for nation, family, or school. Docility implies equality. There is no great gulf fixed between teacher and taught. Both are pursuing the same ends, engaged on the same theme, enriched by mutual interests. And probably the quite delightful pursuit of knowledge affords the only intrinsic liberty for both teacher and taught. He is the free man whom the truth makes free. And this freedom, the steady pursuit and delightful acquirement of knowledge afford to us day by day. The mind is its own place, we are told, and in itself can make a heaven of hell, a hell of heaven. And that heaven of the mind, is it not continual expansion and ordered freedom? And that restless, burning, inflammatory hell, does it not come of continual chafing against natural and righteous order? As for the superficial freedom of sitting or standing, going or coming, that is a matter which settles itself as do all the relations between teacher and taught. Once children are allowed a due share in their own education, not a benefit for us to confer, but rather a provision for them to take. Our chief concern for the mind or for the body is to supply a well-ordered table with abundant, appetizing, nourishing, and very varied food, which children deal with in their own way and for themselves. This food must be served à naturel, without the pre-digestion which deprives it of stimulating and nourishing properties, and no sort of forcible feeding or spoon-feeding may be practiced. Hungry minds sit down to such a diet with the charming greediness of little children. They absorb it, assimilate it, and grow thereby in a manner astonishing to those accustomed to the dull, profitless ruminating so often practiced in schools. When the teacher avoids hortatory methods— His scholars change position when they have a mind to, but their mind is commonly to sit still during a lesson time because they are so intent on their work that they have no desire for small divagations, while on the other hand, the teacher makes it his business to see that the body gets its share, and an abundant share, of gymnastics, whether by way of games or drill. But this is a subject well understood in modern schools, and it is only necessary to say that though mental activity promotes bodily functions in a surprising way, has not an American physiologist discovered that people may live for 160 or 1,000 years if they continue to use their minds? Athleticism, on the other hand, if unduly pursued, by no means promotes mental activity. In days when the concern of educators seems to be to provide an easy option for that mental activity, the sole condition of education, it must be urged that manual dexterity, gardening, folk dancing, and the like, while they fulfill their proper function in training nerve and muscle to ready responsiveness, do not sustain mind. Nor again can we educate children upon the drama, even the Shakespearean drama, nor upon poetry, even the most musical and emotional. These things children must have, but they come into the world with many relations waiting to be established. Relations with places far and near, with the wide universe, with the past of history, with the social economics of the present, with the earth they live on and all its delightful progeny of beast and bird, plant and tree with the sweet human affinities they entered into at birth, with their own country and other countries, and, above all, with the most sublime of human relationships, their relation to God. With such a program before his pupils, only the uninstructed teacher will put undue emphasis upon and give undue time to arithmetic and handicrafts, singing or acting, or any of the hundred specifics which are passed off as education in its entirety. The sense of must should be present with children. Our mistake is to act in such a way that they only seem to be law-compelled, while their elders do as they please. The parent or teacher who is pestered for leave to do this or that, 
contrary to the discipline of the house or school, has only himself to thank. He has posed as a person in authority, not under authority, and therefore free to allow the breach of rules whose only raison d'être is that they minister to the well-being of the children. Two conditions are necessary to secure all proper docility and obedience, and, given these two, there is seldom a conflict of wills between teacher and pupils. The conditions are, the teacher, or other head, may not be arbitrary, but must act so evidently as one under authority, that the children, quick to discern, see that he too must do the things he ought, and therefore that regulations are not made for his convenience. I am assuming that everyone entrusted with the bringing up of children recognizes the supreme authority to whom we are subject. Without this recognition, I do not see it is possible to establish the nice relation which should exist between teacher and taught. The other condition is that children should have a fine sense of the freedom which comes of knowledge, which they are allowed to appropriate as they choose, freely given with little intervention from the teacher. They do choose and are happy in their work, so there is little opportunity for coercion or for deadening hortatory talk. But the principle of authority, as well as that of docility, is inherent in children, and it is only as the tact and judgment of the teacher make opportunity for its free play that they are prepared for the duties of life as citizens and members of a family. The movement in favor of prefects, as in public schools, is a recognition of this fact, and it is well that children should become familiar with the idea of representative authority, that is, that they are governed by chosen members of their own body, a form of self-government. To give effect to the idea, the prefect should be elected, and children show extraordinary insight in choosing the right officers. But that is not enough, because only a few are set in authority. Certain small offices should be held in rotation by every member of a class. The office makes the man as much as the man makes the office, and it is surprising how well rather incompetent children will perform duties laid on them. All schoolwork should be conducted in such a manner that children are aware of the responsibility of learning. It is their business to know that which has been taught. To this end, the subject matter should not be repeated. We ourselves do not attend to the matters in our daily paper, which we know we shall meet with again in a weekly review, nor to that if there is a monthly review in prospect. These repeated aids result in our being persons of wandering attention and feeble memory. To allow repetition of a lesson is to shift the responsibility for it from the shoulders of the pupil to those of the teacher, who says, in effect, I'll see that you know it, so his pupils make no effort of attention. Thus, the same stale stuff is repeated again and again, and the children get bored and restive, ready for pranks by way of a change. Teachers are apt to slight their high office and hinder the process of education because they cherish two or three fallacies. They regard children as inferior, themselves as superior beings. Why else their office? But if they recognize that the potency of children's minds is as great or greater than that of their own, they would not conceive that spoon-feeding was their mission, or that they must masticate a morsel of knowledge to make it proper for the feeble digestion of the scholar. We depreciate children in another way. We are convinced that they cannot understand a literary vocabulary, so we explain and paraphrase to our own heart's content, but not to theirs. Educated mothers know that their children can read anything and do not offer explanations unless they are asked for them and we have taken it for granted that this quickness of apprehension comes only to the children of educated parents. Another misapprehension which makes for disorder is our way of regarding attention. We believe that it is to be cultivated, nursed, coddled, wooed by persuasion, by dramatic presentation, by pictures and illustrative objects. In fact, the teacher, the success of whose work depends on his personality, is an actor of no mean power whose performance would adorn any stage. Attention, we know, is not a faculty nor a definable power of mind, but it is the ability to turn on every such power, to concentrate, as we say. We throw away labor in attempting to produce or to train this necessary function. There it is in every child in full measure, 
a very Niagara of force, ready to be turned on in obedience to the child's own authority and capable of infinite resistance to authority imposed from without. Our part is to regard attention, too, as an appetite and to feed it with the best we have in books and in all knowledge. But children do it on their own. We may not play Sir Oracle any more. Our knowledge is too circumscribed, our diction too poor, vague, desultory, to cope with the ability of young creatures who thirst for knowledge. We must put into their hands the sources which we must needs use for ourselves, the best books of the best writers. I will mention only one more disability which hinders us in our work as teachers. I mean that depreciation of knowledge which is just now characteristic of Englishmen. A well-known educationalist lately nailed up the thesis that what children want in the way of knowledge is just two things, how to do the work by which they must earn their living, and how to behave as citizens. This writer does not see that work is done and duties performed in the ratio of the person who works. The more the man is as a person, the more valuable will be his work and the more dependable his conduct. Yet we omit from popular education that tincture of humane letters which makes for efficiency. One hears, for instance, of an adolescent school with some 9,000 pupils who come in batches of a few hundreds, each batch to learn one or other of a score or so of admirable crafts and accomplishments. But not one hour is spent in the three or four years course of this people's university on any sort of humane knowledge, in any reading or thinking which should make the pupils better men and women and better citizens. To return to our method of employing attention, it is not a casual matter, a convenient, almost miraculous way of covering the ground, of getting children to know certainly and lastingly a surprising amount. All this is to the good, but it is something more, a root principle vital to education. In this way of learning, the child comes to his own. He makes use of the authority which is in him in its highest function as a self-commanding, self-compelling power. It is delightful to use any power that is in us, if only that of keeping up in a cup and ball a hundred times as, to the delight of small nephews and nieces, Jane Austen did. But to make yourself attend, make yourself know, this indeed is to come into a kingdom, all the more satisfying to children because they are so made that they revel in knowledge. Here is some notion of a day or two spent in London by a child of eleven, which reaches me as I write. Mother took her to Westminster Abbey one afternoon, and while I was seeing her to bed, she told me all the things she had noticed there, which they had been hearing about in architecture this term. She loves architecture. She also expressed her anxiety to make acquaintance with the British Museum and see the things there that they had been having in their term's work. So the next morning, we went there and studied the Parthenon Room in great detail. She was a most interesting companion and taught me ever so much. We also went to St. Paul's and Madame Tussaud's, where she was delighted to see so many people out of history. The modern people did not interest her so much, except Jack Cornwall and Nurse Cavell. It will be noticed that the child is educating herself. Her friends merely take her to see the things she knows about, and she tells about what she has read, a quite different matter from the act of pouring information down the throats of the unhappy children who are taken to visit our national treasure houses. A short time ago, when the king and queen paid a private visit to the British Museum, in the next hall also, no doubt examining the Parthenon room, were a group of children from a London County Council School, as full of information and interest as the child above mentioned because they had been doing the same work. It was not a small thing for those children to know that their interests and delights were common to them and their sovereigns. Of such strands are formed the cord which binds society, and one of the main purposes of a liberal education for all is to form links between high and low, rich and poor, the classes and the masses, and the strong sympathy of common knowledge. The public schools have arrived at this through the medium of the classics. An occasional tag from Horace moves and unites the House of Commons, not only through the urbane thought of the poet, but because it is a key to a hundred associations. If this has been effected through the medium of a dead language, what may we not hope for in the way of common thought, universal springs of action, 
conveyed through our own rich and inspiring literature. Consider what this power of perfect attention and absolute recollection should be to every employer and chief. What an asset to the nation. I heard this week of a colonel who said that his best subaltern was an old P.U.S., Parents' Union School, boy. And this sort of evidence reaches us continually. There are few who do not know the mischievous and baffling effects of inattention and forgetfulness on the part of subordinates. And we visualize a world of surprising achievement when children should have been trained to quick apprehension and retention of instructions. We may not pose before children, nor pride ourselves in dutiful getting up of knowledge in order to deliver it as emanating from ourselves. There are those who have a right to lecture, those who have devoted a lifetime to some one subject about which they have perhaps written their books. Lectures from such persons are, no doubt, as full of insight, imagination, and power as are the written works. But we cannot have a score of such lectures in every school, each to elucidate his own subject, nor, if we could, would it be good for the children. The personality of the teacher would influence them to distraction from the delight in knowledge, which is itself a sufficient and compelling force to secure perfect attention and seemly discipline. I am not figuring in Erohan, some utopia of our dreams. We of the PNEU seem to have let loose a force capable of sending forth young people firm with the resolve. I will not cease from mental strife, nor shall my sword sleep in my hand, till we have built Jerusalem in England's green and pleasant land. Practically all schools are doing wonders. The schoolmaster is abroad in the land, and we are educating our masters with immense zeal and self-devotion. What we have reason to deplore is that after some eight or twelve years brilliant teaching in school, the cinema show and the football field, polo or golf, satisfy the needs of our former pupils to whatever class they belong. We are filled with compassion when we detect the lifeless hand or leg, the artificial nose or jaw that many a man has brought home as a consequence of the war. But many of our young men and women go about more seriously maimed than these. They are devoid of intellectual interests. History and poetry are without charm for them. The scientific work of the day is only slightly interesting. Their job and the social amenities they can secure are all that their life has for them. The maimed existence in which a man goes on from day to day without either nourishing or using his intellect is causing anxiety to those interested in education who know that after religion, it is our chief concern, is indeed the necessary handmaid of religion. End of section four. Chapter 5 of Home Education Series, Volume 6. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Kevin Manley. Home Education Series, Volume 6. Towards a Philosophy of Education by Charlotte Mason. Chapter 5. The Sacredness of Personality. These principles, i.e. authority and docility, are limited by the respect due to the personality of children, which may not be encroached upon whether by direct use of fear or love, suggestion or influence, or by undue play upon any one natural desire. People are too apt to use children as counters in a game, to be moved hither and thither according to the whim of the moment. Our crying need today is less for a better method of education than for an adequate conception of children. Children, merely as human beings, whether brilliant or dull, precocious or backward. Exceptional qualities take care of themselves, and so does the wanting intelligence, and both of these share with the rest in all that is claimed for them in the previous chapters. Our business is to find out how great a mystery a person is qua person. All action comes out of the ideas we hold, and if we ponder dually upon personality, we shall come to perceive that we cannot commit a greater offense than to maim or crush or subvert any part of a person. 
We have many ingenious, not to say affectionate, ways of doing this, all of them more or less based upon that egoism which persuades us that in proportion to a child's dependence is our superiority, that all we do for him is of our grace and favor, and that we have a right, whether as parents or teachers, to do what we will with our own. Have we considered that in the divine estimate the child's estate is higher than ours? That it is ours to become as little children, rather than theirs to become as grown men and women? That the rules we receive for the bringing up of children are for the most part negative? We may not despise them or hinder them, suffer little children, or offend them by our brutish clumsiness of action and want of serious thought. While the one positive precept afforded to us is feed, which should be rendered pasture, my lambs, place them in the midst of abundant food. A teacher in Yorkshire Council School renders this precept as, I had left them in the pasture and came back and found them feeding. That is, she had left a big class reading a given lesson and found them on her return still reading with eagerness and satisfaction. Maxima reverentia debitur pueris has a wider meaning than it generally receives. We take it as meaning that we should not do or say anything unseemly before the young. But does it not also include a profound and reverent study of the properties and possibilities present in a child? Nor need we be alarmed at so wide a program. The vice which hinders us in the bringing up of children is that so heavily censured in the gospel. We are not simple. We act our parts and play in an unlawful way upon motives. Perhaps, after all, the least reprehensible pedagogic motive is that which is most condemned, and the terrorism of Mr. Creakle may produce a gray record in comparison with the blackness of more subtle methods of undermining personality. We can only touch upon a few of these, but a part may stand for the whole. For the action of fear as a governing motive, we cannot do better than to read again our David Copperfield, a great educational treatise, and study Mr. Creakle in detail for terrorism in the schoolroom and Mr. Murdstone for the same vice in the home. But is it through the influence of Dickens? Fear is no longer the acknowledged basis of school discipline. We have methods more subtle than the mere terrors of the law. Love is one of these. The person of winning personality attracts his pupils, or hers, who will do anything for his sake and are fond and eager in all their ways, docile to that point where personality is submerged, and they live on the smiles, perish on the averted looks of the adored teacher. Parents look on with a smile and think that all is well. But Bob or Mary is losing that growing time which should make a self-dependent, self-ordered person, and is day by day becoming a parasite who can go only as he is carried, the easy prey of fanatic or demagogue. This sort of encroachment upon the love of children offers as a motive, do this for my sake. Wrong is to be avoided lest it grieve the teacher. Good is to be done to pleasure him. For this end, a boy learns his lessons, behaves properly, shows good will, produces a whole catalogue of schoolboy virtues, and yet his character is being undermined. Suggestion goes to the work more subtly. The teacher has mastered the gamut of motives which play upon human nature, and every suggestion is aimed at one or other of these. He may not use the nursery suggestions of lollipops or bogies, but he does in reality employ these if expressed in more spiritual values, suggestions subtly applied to the idiosyncrasies of a given child. Suggestion is too subtle to be illustrated with advantage. Dr. Stephen Paget holds that it should be used only as a surgeon uses an anesthetic, but it is an instrument easy to handle and unconsidered suggestion plays on a child's mind as the winds on a weathercock. Unstable as water, thou shalt not excel, is the unfortunate child's doom. 
for how is it possible for stability of mind and character to evolve under a continual play of changing suggestions? But this it will be said is true of the unconsidered suggestion. What of a carefully laid train, all leading in the same direction, to produce perseverance, frankness, courage, or any other excellent virtue? The child is even worse off in such a case. That particular virtue becomes detestable. No other virtue is inviting, and he is acquiring no strength to stand alone, but waits in all his doings for promptings from without. Perhaps the gravest danger attending this practice is that every suggestion received lays the person open to the next and the next. A due respect for the personality of children and a dread of making them incompetent to conduct their own lives will make us chary of employing a means so dangerous, no matter how good the immediate end. Akin to suggestion is influence, which acts not so much by well-directed word or inciting action as by a sort of atmosphere proceeding from the teacher and enveloping the taught. Late in the last century, goody-goody books were written about the beauty of influence, the duty of influence, the study of the means of influence, and children were bought up with the notion that to influence other persons consciously was a moral duty. No doubt such influence is inevitable. We must needs affect one another, not so much by what we do or say as by that which we are, and so far influence is natural and wholesome. We imbibe it from persons real and imaginary, and we are kept strong and upright by currents and countercurrents of unstudied influence. Suppiness before a single, steady, persistent influence is a different matter. And the schoolgirl who idolizes her mistress, the boy who worships his master, is deprived of the chance of free and independent living. His personality fails to develop and he goes into the world as a parasitic plant, clinging ever to the support of some stronger character. So far we have considered incidental ways of trespassing upon those rights of personality proper to children. But we have more pervasive, if less injurious, ways of stultifying intellectual and moral growth. Our school ethic rests upon, our school discipline is supported by, undue play upon certain natural desires. It is worth while to reflect that the mind also has its appetites, better known as desires. It is as necessary that mind should be fed, should grow, and should produce, as that things should happen to body, and just as body would not take the trouble to feed itself if it never became hungry, so mind also would not take in that which it needs if it were not that certain desires require to be satisfied. Therefore, schoolmasters do not amiss in basing their practice upon the desires whose very function appears to be to bring nourishment to mind. Where we teachers err is in stimulating the wrong desires to accomplish our end. There is the desire of approbation which even an infant shows. He is not happy unless mother or nurse approve of him. Later, this same desire helps him to conquer a sum, climb a hill, bring home a good report from school. And all this is grist to the mill, knowledge to the mind. Because the persons whose approbation is worth having care that he should learn and know, conquer idleness, and get habits of steady work, so that his mind may be as duly nourished every day as is his body. Alas for the vanity that attends this desire of approbation, that makes the boy more solicitous for the grin of the stable boy than for the approval of his master. Nay, this desire for approval may get such possession of him that he thinks of nothing else. He must have approval whether from the worthless or the virtuous. It is supposed that outbreaks of violence, robbery, assassinations, occur at times for the mere sake of infamy, just as deeds of heroism are done for the sake of fame. Both infamy and fame mean being thought about and talked about by a large number of people, 
and we know how this natural desire is worked by the daily press. How we get, now a film actress, now a burglar, a spy, a hero, or a scientist, set before us to be our admiration and our praise. Emulation, the desire of excelling, works wonders in the hands of the schoolmaster. And indeed, this natural desire is an amazing spur to effort, both intellectual and moral. When in pursuit of virtue, two or score are emulously rapid in the race, a school acquires a good tone, and parents are justified in thinking it the right place for their boy. In the intellectual field, however, there is danger, and nothing worse could have happened to our schools than the system of marks, prizes, place-taking by which many of them are practically governed. A boy is so taken up with the desire to forge ahead that there is no time to think of anything else. What he learns is not interesting to him. He works to get his remove. But emulation does not stand alone as vicegerent in our schools. Another natural desire, whose unvarnished name is avarice, labors for good government and so-called progress cheek by jowl with emulation. He must get a scholarship, is the duty of a small boy even before he goes to school, and indeed for good and sufficient reasons. Sometimes the sons of rich parents carry off these prizes, but as a rule they fall to those for whom they are intended, the sons of educated parents in rather straitened circumstances, sons of the clergy, for example. The scholarship system is no more than a means of distributing the vast wealth left by benefactors in the past for this particular purpose. Every grammar school has its own scholarships. The universities have open scholarships and bursaries often of considerable value. And a free or partially free education is open to the majority of the youth of the upper middle class on one condition, that of brains. It is small wonder that every grammar and public school bases its curriculum upon these conditions, knows exactly what standard of merit will secure the Hastings, knows the boys who have a chance, and orders their very strenuous work towards the end in view. It is hard to say what better could be done, and yet this deliberate cult of cupidity is disastrous, for there is no doubt that here and there we come upon impoverishment of personality due to enfeebled intellectual life. The boy did not learn to delight in knowledge in his school days, and the man is shallow in mind and whimsical in judgment. It is hopeless to make war from without on a system which affords very effectual help in the education of boys who are likely to later become of service to the country. But Britain must make the most of her sons, and many of these men are capable of being more than they are. It is from within the schools that help must come, and the way is fairly obvious. Most schools give from 11 in the lowest to 8 hours in the highest forms to English, that is, from 20 to 16 consecutive readings a week might be afforded in a wide selection of books, literature, history, economics, etc., books read with the concentrated attention which makes a single reading suffice. The act of narrating what has been read might well be useful to boys who should be prepared for public speaking. By a slight alteration of this kind, in procedure rather than in curriculum or timetable, it is probable that our schools would turn out many more well-read, well-informed men and convincing speakers than they do at present. Such a method, even if it applied to English only, would tend to correct any tendency in schools to become mere cramming places for examinations, would infect boys with a love of knowledge, and should divert the natural desire for acquisition into a new channel, for few things are more delightful than the acquisition of knowledge. We need not delay over that desire of power, ambition, which plays its part in every life, but the educator must see that it plays no more than its part. Power is good in proportion as it gives opportunity for serving, but it is mischievous in boy or man when the pleasure of ruling, managing, becomes a definite spring of action. Like each of the other natural desires, that for power may ruin a life that is allowed to master, 
ambition is the cause of half the disasters under which mankind suffers the ambitious boy or man would as soon lead his fellow in riot and disorder as in noble effort in a good cause and who can say how far the labor unrest under which we suffer is inspired and inflamed by ambitious men who want to rule if only for the immediate intoxication of rousing and leading men it is a fine thing to say of a multitude of men i can wind them round my little finger and the much burdened head of school must needs beware if the able ambitious fellow be allowed to manage the rest he cheats them out of their fair share of managing their own lives no boy should be allowed to wax feeble to make another great the harm to the ambitious boy himself must be considered too lest he become an ignoble maneuvering person it is within a teacher's scope to offer wholesome ambitions to a boy to make him keen to master knowledge rather than manage men and here he has a wide field without encroaching on another's preserve another desire which may well be made to play into the schoolmaster's hands is that of society a desire which has much to do with the making of the naughty boys idle youths and silly women of our acquaintance it is sheer delight to mix with our fellows but much depends on whom we take for our fellows and why and here young people may be helped by finger posts if they are so taught that knowledge delights them they will choose companions who share that pleasure in this way princes are trained they must know something of botany to talk with botanists of history to meet with historians they cannot afford to be in the company of scientists adventurers poets painters philanthropists or economists and themselves be able to do no more than change the weather and pass the time of day they must know modern languages to be at home with men of other countries and ancient tongues to be familiar with classical allusions such considerations rule the education of princes and every boy has a princely right to be bought up so that he may hold his own in good society that is the society of those who know we hear complaints of the cast iron system of british society but how much of it is due to the ignorance which makes it only possible to men and women to talk to those of their own clique soldiers with soldiers schoolmasters and schoolboys with their kind the boy who wants to be able to talk to people who know has no unworthy motive for working we have considered the several desires whose function is to stimulate the mind and save us from the vis inertia which is our besetting danger each such desire has its place but the results are disastrous if any one should dominate it so happens that the last desire we have to consider the desire of knowledge is commonly deprived of its proper function in our schools by the predominance of the other springs of action especially of emulation the desire of place and avarice the desire of wealth tangible profit this divine curiosity is recognized in ordinary life chiefly as a desire to know trivial things what did it cost what did she say who was with him where are they going how many postage stamps in a line would go round the world and curiosity is satisfied by incoherent scrappy information which serves no purpose assuredly not the purpose of knowledge whose function is to nourish the mind as food nourishes the body but so besotted is our educational thought that we believe children regard knowledge rather as repulsive medicine than as inviting food hence our dependence on marks and prizes athletics alluring presentation any jam we can devise to disguise the powder the man who willfully goes on crutches has feeble and competent legs he who chooses to go blindfold has eyes that cannot bear the sun he who lives on pat meat has weak digestive powers and he whose mind is sustained by the crutches of emulation and avarice loses that one stimulating power which is sufficient for his intellectual needs this atrophy of the desire of knowledge is the penalty our scholars pay because we have chosen to make them work for inferior ends 
Our young men and maidens do not read unless with the stimulus of a forthcoming examination. They are good-natured and pleasant, but have no wide range of thought, lofty purpose, little of the magnanimity which is proper for a citizen. Great thoughts and great actions are strange to them. Though the possibility is still there, and they may yet show in peace such action as we have seen and wondered at during the war. But we cannot always educate by means of a great war. The penalties are too heavy for human nature to endure for long. Therefore, the stimuli to greatness, magnanimity, which the war afforded, we must produce in the ordinary course of education. But knowledge is delectable. We have all the satiable curiosity of Mr. Kipling's elephant, even when we content ourselves with the broken meats flung by the daily press. Knowledge is to us as our mother's milk. We grow thereby, and in the act of sucking, are admirably content. The work of education is greatly simplified when we realize that children, apparently all children, want to know all human knowledge. They have an appetite for what is put before them, and knowing this, our teaching becomes buoyant with the courage of our convictions. We know how Richelieu shut up colleges throughout France, both Jesuit and secular, in order to prevent the mania of the poor for educating their children, which distracts them from the pursuit of trade and war. This mania exists with us, not only in the parents, but in the children, the mania of hungry souls clamoring for meat. And we choke them off, not by shutting up schools and colleges, but by offering matter which no living soul can digest. The complaints made by teachers and children of the monotony of the work in our schools is full of pathos, and all credit to those teachers who cheer the weary path by entertaining devices. But mind does not live and grow upon entertainment. It requires its solid meals. The Gloucestershire teachers, under Mr. Household's direction, have entered so fully into the principles implied in the method that I am tempted to illustrate largely from their experience. But they by no means stand alone. Hundreds of other teachers have the same experiences and describe them as opportunity offers. The finding of this power which is described as sensing a passage is as the striking of a vein of gold in that fabulously rich country, human nature. Our find is that children have a natural aptitude for literary expression, which they enjoy in hearing or reading, and employ in telling or writing. We might have guessed this long ago. All those speeches and sayings of untamed warriors and savage potentates, which the historians have preserved for us, critics have declined as showing too much cultivated rhetoric to have been possible for any but highly educated persons. But the time is coming when we shall perceive that only minds like those of children are capable of producing thoughts so fresh and so finely expressed. This natural aptitude for literature, or shall we say rhetoric, which overcomes the disabilities of a poor vocabulary without effort, should direct the manner of instruction we give ruling out the talky-talky of the oral lessons and the lecture, ruling out equally compilations and textbooks, and placing books in the hands of children and only those which are more or less literary in character, that is, which have the terseness and vividness proper to literary work. The natural desire for knowledge does the rest, and children feed and grow." It must be borne in mind that in proportion as other desires are stimulated, that of knowledge is suppressed. The teacher who proposes marks and places as worthy aims will get work, certainly, but he will get no healthy love of knowledge for its own sake and no provision against the ennui of later days. The monotony I have spoken of attends all work prompted by the stimuli of marks and places. Such work becomes mechanical and there is hardly enough of it prepared to last through the course of a boy's school life. The master of a preparatory school remarks, It must be a well-known fact, I am not speaking of the exceptional, but of the average boy, that new boys are placed too low. We find, it is a common experience, 
that if we send up a boy, whether he be a good mathematician, a good classic, a good English scholar, or a good linguist, a couple of years will pass by before he is doing at the public school the work he was doing when he left us. The public schoolmaster makes the same sort of complaint. He says that, at twenty, the boy is climbing the same pear tree that he climbed at twelve. That is to say, work which is done in view of examinations must be of the rather narrow mechanical kind upon which it is possible to set questions and mark answers with absolute fairness. Now, definite progress, continual advance from day to day with no treading of old ground, is a condition of education. There is an uneasy dread in some minds, lest a liberal education for all, the possibility which is now before us, should cause a social bouleversement, such an upheaval as obtained in the French Revolution. But this fear arises from an erroneous conception. The doctrine of equal opportunities for all is no doubt dangerous. It is the intellectual rendering of the survival of the fittest, and we have had a terrible object lesson as to how that doctrine works. The uneasy, ambitious spirit comes to the front, gets all the chances, dominates his fellows, and thinks no upheaval too great a price for the advancement of himself and his notions. Men of this type come to the top through the avenue of examinations. Ambitions, and possibly greed, are seconded by dogged perseverance. As was said of Louis the Fourteenth, such men elevate their practice into a theory and arrogate to their habits the character of principles of government, and these pseudo-principles inflame the populace because they promise place and power to every man in the state with no sense of the proportion he bears to the rest. Probably the labor unrest of today is not without connection with the habit of working in our schools for prizes and places. The boy who works to be first and to get something out of it does not always become the quiet, well-ordered citizen who helps to cement society and carries on the work of the state. Knowledge pursued for its own sake is sedative in so far as it is satisfying. And the splendid consciousness that every boy in your form has your own delight in knowing, your own pleasure in expressing that which he knows, shares your intimacy with this and the other sage and hero, makes for good fellowship and magnanimity, and should deliver the citizen from a restless desire to come to the front. It is possible that a conscientious and intelligent teacher may be a little overwhelmed when he considers all that goes to a man, all that goes to teach of the boys under his care. It is true that, quote, there lives no faculty within us which the soul can spare. And the humblest earthly wheel demands for dignity not placed beyond her reach, zealous cooperation of all means given or required to raise us from the mire and liberate our hearts from low pursuits by gross utilities enslaved. We need more of ennobling impulse from the past, if for the future aught of good must come. End quote. Wordsworth is no doubt right. There is no faculty within the soul which can be spared in the great work of education. But then every faculty, or rather power, works to the one end if we make the pursuit of knowledge for its own sake the object of our educational efforts. We find children ready and eager for this labor, and their accomplishment is surprising. End of chapter 5「Section 6 of Home Education Series, Volume 6. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Home Education Series, Volume 6, Towards a Philosophy of Education, by Charlotte Mason. Three Instruments of Education. 1. Education is an atmosphere. Seeing that we are limited by the respect due to the personality of children, we can allow ourselves but three educational instruments, the atmosphere of environment, the discipline of habit, and the presentation of living ideas. Our motto is, 
education is an atmosphere, a discipline, a life. When we say that education is an atmosphere, we do not mean that a child should be isolated in what may be called a child environment, specially adapted and prepared, but that we should take into account the educational value of his natural home atmosphere, both as regards persons and things, and should let him live freely among his proper conditions. It stultifies a child to bring down his world to the child's level. Having cut out the direct use of fear or love, suggestion or influence, undue play upon any one natural desire, emulation for example, we are no longer free to use all means in the education of children. There are but three left for our use and to each of these we must give careful study or we shall not realise how great a scope is left to us. To consider the first of these educational instruments. For a decade or two, we have pinned our faith on environment as a great part of education, as say nine tenths rather than a third part of the whole. The theory has been, put a child in the right environment, and so subtle is its influence, so permanent its effects, that he is, to all intents and purposes, educated thereby. Schools may add Latin and sums and whatever else their curriculum contains, but the actual education is, as it were, performed upon the child by means of colour schemes, harmonious sounds, beautiful forms, gracious persons. He grows up aesthetically educated into sweet reasonableness and harmony with his surroundings. Quote, Peter's nursery was a perfect dream in which to hatch the soul of a little boy. Its walls were done in a warm, cream-coloured paint, and upon them Peter's father had put the most lovely patterns of trotting and jumping horses and dancing cats and dogs and leaping lambs, a carnival of beasts. There was a big brass fire guard in Peter's nursery, and all the tables had smoothly rounded corners against the days when Peter would run about. The floor was of cork carpet on which Peter would put his toys, and there was a crimson hearth rug on which Peter was destined to crawl. There were scales in Peter's nursery to weigh Peter every week, and tables to show how much he ought to weigh and when one should begin to feel anxious. There was nothing casual about the early years of Peter." End quote. So, Mr. Wells, in that inconclusive educational treatise of his, Joan and Peter, it is an accurate picture of the preparation for, quote, high-souled little persons all over the world. Parents make tremendous sacrifices to that goddess who presides over education. We hear of a pair investing more than their capital in a statue to adorn the staircase, in order that Tommy should make his soul by the contemplation of beauty. This sort of thing has been going on since the 80s at any rate, and, as usual, Germany erected a high altar for the cult, which she passed on to the rest of us. Perhaps it is safe to say that the young intelligentsia of Europe have been reared after this manner, and is the result that Neo-Georgian youth Punch presents to us with his air of weariness, condescension and self-complacency. Let us hear Professor Sir Jagadis Chandra Bose, the Indian scientist, on one of his conclusions concerning the nervous impulse in plants. A plant carefully protected under glass from outside shocks looks sleek and flourishing, but its higher nervous function is then found to be atrophied. We had thought that the terrible succession of blows inflicted by the war had changed all that, but no, the errors of education still hold sway, and we still have amongst us the better-than-my-neighbour folk, whose function, let us hope, is to administer the benefits of adversity to most of us. What if parents and teachers in their zeal misread the schedule of their duties, magnified their office unduly, and encroached upon the personality of the children? It is not an environment that these want, a set of artificial relations carefully constructed, but an atmosphere which nobody has been at pains to constitute. It is there, about the child, his natural element, precisely as the atmosphere of the earth is about us. It is thrown off, as it were, from persons and things, stirred by events, sweetened by love, ventilated, kept in motion, by the regulated action of common sense. We all know the natural conditions under which a child should live, how he shares household ways with his mother, 
romps with his father, is teased by his brothers and petted by his sisters, is taught by his tumbles, learns self-denial by the baby's needs, the delightfulness of furniture by playing at battle and siege with sofa and table, learns veneration for the old by the visits of his great-grandmother, how to live with his equals by the chums he gathers round him, learns intimacy with animals from his dog and cat, delight in the fields where the buttercups grow, and greater delight in the blackberry hedges. And what tempered fusion of classes is so effective as a child's intimacy with his betters, and also with cook and housemaid, blacksmith and joiner, with everybody who comes in his way. Children have a genius for this sort of general intimacy, a valuable part of their education. Care and guidance are needed, of course, less admiring friends should make fools of them, but no compounded environment could make up for this fresh air, this wholesome wind blowing now from one point, now from another. We certainly may use atmosphere as an instrument of education, but there are prohibitions for ourselves rather than for children. Perhaps the chief of these is that no artificial element be introduced, no sprinkling with rose water, softening with cushions. Children must face life as it is. If their parents are anxious and perturbed, children feel it in the air. Mummy, mummy, you aren't going to cry this time, are you? And a child's hug tries to take away the trouble. By these things children live, and we may not keep them in glass cases. If we do, they develop in succulence and softness, and will not become plants of renown. But due relations must be maintained. The parents are in authority, the children in obedience, and again, the strong may not lay their burdens on the weak, nor must we expect from children that effort of decision, the most fatiguing in our lives, of which the young should generally be relieved. School perhaps offers fewer opportunities for vitiating the atmosphere than does home life, but teaching may be so watered down and sweetened, teachers may be so suave and condescending as to bring about a condition of intellectual feebleness and moral softness, which is not easy for a child to overcome. The bracing atmosphere of truth and sincerity should be perceived in every school. And here again the common pursuit of knowledge by teacher and class comes to our aid and creates a current of fresh air perceptible even to the chance visitor, who sees the glow of intellectual life and moral health on the faces of teachers and children alike. But a school may be working hard, not for love of knowledge, but for love of marks, our old enemy. And then young faces are not serene and joyous, but eager, restless, apt to look anxious and worried. The children do not sleep well and are cross, are sullen or in tears if anything goes wrong, and are generally difficult to manage. When this is the case there is too much oxygen in the air, they are breathing a too stimulating atmosphere, and the nervous strain to which they are subjected must needs be followed by reaction. Then teachers think that lessons have been too hard, that children should be relieved of this and that study. The doctors probably advise that so-and-so should run wild for a year, poor little soul, at the very moment when he is most in need of knowledge for his sustenance he is left to prey upon himself. No wonder the nervous systems become worse, and the boy or girl suffers under the stigma of nervous strain. The fault has been in the atmosphere and not in the work. The teacher, perhaps, is over-anxious that her children should do well, and her nervous excitation is catching. Quote, I am afraid X cannot do his examination. He loves his work, but he bursts into tears when he's asked an examination question. Perhaps it is that I have insisted too much that he must never be satisfied with anything but his best. End quote. Poor little chap of seven, pricked into over-exertion by the spur of moral stimulus. We foresee happy days for children when all teachers know that no other exciting motive whatever is necessary to produce good work in each individual of however big a class than that love of knowledge which is natural to every child. 
The serenity and sweetness of schools conducted on this principle is surprising to the outsider, who has not reflected upon the contentment of a baby with his bottle. There are two courses open to us in this matter. One, to create by all manner of modified conditions a hothouse atmosphere, fragrant but emasculating, in which children grow apace but are feeble and dependent. The other, to leave them open to all the airs that blow, but with care lest they be unduly battered, lest, for example, a miasma come their way in the shape of a vicious companion. 2. Education is a discipline. By this formula we mean the discipline of habits formed definitely and thoughtfully, whether habits of mind or of body. Physiologists tell us of the adaptation of brain structure to habitual lines of thought, i.e., to our habits. Education is not after all to either teacher or child the fine careless rapture we appear to have figured it. We who teach and they who learn are alike constrained. There is always effort to be made in certain directions, yet we face our tasks from a new point of view. We need not labour to get children to learn their lessons. That, if we would believe it, is a matter which nature takes care of. Let the lessons be of the right sort and children will learn them with delight. The call for strenuousness comes with the necessity of forming habits, but here again we are relieved. The intellectual habits of the good life form themselves in the following out of the due curriculum in the right way. As we have already urged, there is but one right way, that is, Children must do the work for themselves. They must read the given pages and tell what they have read. They must perform, that is, what we call the act of knowing. We are all aware, alas, what a monstrous quantity of printed matter has gone into the dustbin of our memories, because we have failed to perform that quite natural and spontaneous act of knowing as easy to a child as breathing, and, if we would believe it, comparatively easy to ourselves. The reward is twofold. No intellectual habit is so valuable as that of attention. It is a mere habit, but it is also the hallmark of an educated person. Use is second nature, we are told. It is not too much to say that habit in ten natures, and we can all imagine how our work would be eased if our subordinates listened to instructions with the full attention, which implies recollection. Attention is not the only habit that follows due self-education. The habits of fitting and ready expression, of obedience, of goodwill, and of an impersonal outlook are spontaneous by-products of education in this sort. So, too, are the habits of right thinking and right judging. While physical habits of neatness and order attend upon the self-respect which follows an education which respects the personality of children, physiologists tell us that thoughts which have become habitual make somehow a mark upon the brain substance. But we are bold in calling it a mark, for there is no discernible effect to be quoted. Whether or not the mind be served by the brain in this matter, we are empirically certain that a chief function of education is the establishment of such ways of thinking in children as shall issue in good and useful living, clear thinking, aesthetic enjoyment and above all in the religious life. How is it possible that spirit should act upon matter is a mystery to us, but that such act takes place we perceive every time we note a scowling brow, or on the other hand, quote, a sweet attractive kind of grace, a full assurance given by looks, continual comfort in a face, the lineament of gospel books, end quote. We all know how the physical effort of smiling affects ourselves in our sour moods, quote, nor soul helps flesh more now than flesh helps soul, end quote. Both are at our service in laying down the rails, so to speak, upon which the good life must needs run. In the past we have no doubt gone through an age of infant slavery, an age of good habits enforced by vigorous penalties. 
conscientiously by the over-scrupulous 18th century parent, and infamously by the schoolmasters, the creakles and the squeers, who laboured only for their own ease and profit. Now the pendulum swings the other way. We have lost sight of the fact that habit is to life what rails are to transport cars. It follows that lines of habit must be lain down towards given ends, and after careful survey, all the joltings and delays of life become insupportable. More, habit is inevitable. If we fail to ease life by laying down habits of right thinking and right acting, habits of wrong thinking and wrong acting fix themselves of their own accord. We avoid decision and indecision brings its own delays. Quote, and days are lost, lamenting o'er lost days, end quote. Almost every child is brought up by his parents in certain habits of decency and order without which he would be a social outcast. Think from another point of view how the labour of life would be increased if every act of the bath, toilet, table, every lifting of the fork and use of spoon were a matter of consideration and required an effort of decision. No. Habit is like fire, a bad master but an indispensable servant, and probably one reason for the nervous scrupulosity, hesitation, indecision of our day, is that life was not duly eased for us in the first place by those whose business it was to lay down lines of habit upon which our behaviour might run easily. It is unnecessary to enumerate those habits which we should aim at forming, for everyone knows more about these than anyone practises. We admire the easy carriage of the soldier, but shrink from the discipline which is able to produce it. We admire the lady who can sit upright through a long dinner, who in her old age prefers a straight chair because she has arrived at due muscular balance, and has done so by a course of discipline. There is no other way of forming any good habit, though the discipline is usually that of the internal government which the person exercises upon himself. But a certain strenuousness in the formation of good habits is necessary because every such habit is the result of conflict. The bad habit of the easy life is always pleasant and persuasive and to be resisted with pain and effort, but with hope and certainty of success because in our very structure is a preparation for forming such habits of muscle and mind as we deliberately propose to ourselves. We entertain the idea which gives birth to the act, and the act repeated again and again, because the habit, sow an act, we are told, reap a habit. Sow a habit, reap a character. But we must go a step further back. We must sow the idea or notion which makes the act worth while. The lazy boy who hears of the great duke's narrow camp bed preferred by him because when he wanted to turn over it was time to get up, receives the idea of prompt rising. But his nurse or his mother knows how often and how ingeniously the tale must be brought to his mind before the habit of prompt rising is formed. She knows, too, how the idea of self-conquest must be made at home in the boy's mind until it becomes a chivalric impulse which she cannot resist. It is possible to sow a great idea lightly and casually, and perhaps this sort of sowing should be rare and casual, because if a child detect a definite purpose in his mentor, he is apt to stiffen himself against it. When parent or teacher supposes that a good habit is a matter of obedience to his authority, he relaxes a little. A boy is late who has been making evident efforts to be punctual, the teacher good-naturedly foregoes rebuke or penalty. And the boy says to himself, it doesn't matter, and begins to form the unpunctual habit. The mistake the teacher makes is to suppose that to be punctual is troublesome to the boy, so he will let him off. Whereas the office of the habits of an ordered life is to make such life easy and spontaneous. The effort is confined to the first half dozen or score of occasions for doing the thing. Consider how laborious life would be were its wheels not greased by habits of cleanliness, neatness, order, curtsy. Had we to make the effort of decision about every detail of dressing and eating, coming and going, life would not be worth living. 
Every Cottish mother knows that she must train her child in habits of decency, and a whole code of habits of propriety get themselves formed, just because a breach in any such habit causes a shock to others, which few children have the courage to face. Physical fitness, morals and manners are very largely the outcome of habit, and not only so, but the habits of the religious life also become fixed and delightful and give us due support in the effort to live a godly, righteous and sober life. We need not be deterred by the fear that religious habits in a child are mechanical, uninformed by the ideas which should give them value. Let us hear what the young de Quincey felt about going to church. Quote, On Sunday mornings I went with the rest of my family to church. It was a church on the ancient model of England, having aisles, galleries, organ, all things ancient and venerable, and the proportions were majestic. Here, whilst the congregation knelt through the long litany, as often as we came to that passage so beautiful amongst many that is so where God is supplicated on behalf of all sick persons and young children, and that he would show his pity upon all prisoners and captives. I wept in secret, and raising my streaming eyes to the upper windows, saw, on days when the sun was shining, a spectacle as affecting as ever prophet can have beheld. There were the apostles that had trampled upon earth and the glories upon earth. There were the martyrs who had borne witness to the truth through flames. And all the time I saw through the wide central field of the window, where the glass was uncoloured, white fleecy clouds sailing over the azure depths of the sky. End quote. And then the little boy had visions of sick children upon whom God would have pity. Quote, These visions were self sustained. The hint from the litany, the fragment from the clouds, those in the storied windows were sufficient. God speaks to children also in dreams and by the oracles that lurk in darkness, but in solitude, above all things when made vocal to the meditative heart by the truths and services of a national church, God holds with children communion undisturbed. End quote. With such a testimony before us, supported by gleams of recollection on our own part, we may take courage to believe that what we rightly call divine service is particularly appropriate to children, and will become more so as the habits of reading beautifully written books quicken their sense of style, and their unconscious appreciation of the surpassingly beautiful diction of our liturgy. We have seen the value of habit in mind and morals, religion and physical development, it is, as we have seen, disastrous when child or man learns to think in a groove and shivers like an unaccustomed bather on the steps of a new notion. This danger is perhaps averted by giving children as their daily diet the wise thoughts of great minds, and of many great minds, so that they may gradually and unconsciously get the courage of their opinions. If we fail in this duty, so soon as the young people get their liberty, they will run after the first fad that presents itself. Try it for a while, and then take up another to be discarded in its turn, and remain uncertain and ill-guided for the rest of their days. 3. Education is a life. We have left until the last that instrument of education implied in the phrase education is a life. Implied because life is no more self-existing than it is self-supporting. It requires sustenance, regular, ordered and fitting. This is fully recognised and, possibly, the great discovery of the 20th century will be that mind too requires its ordered rations and perishes when these fail. We know that food is to the body what fuel is to the steam engine, the sole source of energy. Once we realise that the mind, too, works only as it is fed, education will appear to us in a new light. The body pines and develops humours upon tabloids and other food substitutes, and a glance at a gate crowd watching a football match makes us wonder what sort of mind food those men and boys are sustained on, whether they are not suffering from depletion, inanition, notwithstanding big and burly bodies. 
for the mind is capable of dealing with only one kind of food. It lives, grows and is nourished upon ideas only. Mere information is to it as a meal of sawdust to the body. There are no organs for the assimilation of the one more than of the other. What is an idea, we ask, and find ourselves plunged beyond our depth? A live thing of the mind seems to be the conclusion of our greatest thinkers from Plato to Bacon, from Bacon to Coleridge. We all know how an idea strikes, seizes, catches hold of, impresses us, and at last, if it be big enough, possesses us. In a word, behaves like an entity. If we inquire into any person's habits of life, mental preoccupation, devotion to a cause or pursuit, he will usually tell us that such and such an idea struck him. This potency of an idea is matter of common recognition. No phrase is more common and more promising than, I have an idea. We rise to such an opening as trout to a well-chosen fly. There is but one sphere in which the word idea never occurs, in which the conception of an idea is curiously absent, and that sphere is education. Look at any publisher's list of school books, and you shall find that the books recommended are carefully desiccated, drained of the least suspicion of an idea, reduced to the driest statements of fact. Here, perhaps, the public schools have a little pull over the rest of us. The diet they afford may be meagre, meagre almost to starvation point for the average boy, but it is not destitute of ideas. For, however sparsely, boys are nourished on the best thoughts of the best minds. Coleridge has done more than other thinkers to bring the conception of an idea within the sphere of the scientific thought of today. Not as that thought is expressed in psychology, a term which he himself launched upon the world with an apology for it as insolens verbum. We beg pardon for the use of this insolens verbum, but it is one of which our language stands in great need. Method, S.T. Coleridge. But as shewing the reaction of mind to an idea, this is how, in his method, Coleridge illustrates the rise and progress of such an idea. Quote, we can recall no incident of human history that impresses the imagination more deeply than the moment when Columbus on an unknown ocean first perceived that baffling fact, the change of the magnetic needle. How many instances occur in history when the ideas of nature, presented to chosen minds by a higher power than nature herself, suddenly unfold, as it were, in prophetic succession systematic views destined to produce the most important revolutions in the state of man. The clear spirit of Columbus was doubtless eminently methodical. He saw distinctly that great leading idea which authorised the poor pilot to become a promiser of kingdoms." End quote. Here we get such a genesis of an idea as fits in curiously with what we know of the history of great inventions and discoveries, quote, presented to chosen minds by a higher power than nature herself, end quote. It corresponds to, not only with the ideas that rule our own lives, but with the origin of practical ideas which is unfolded to us by the prophet Isaiah. Quote, Doth the ploughman plough continually to open and break the clods of his ground. When he hath made plain the face thereof, doth he not cast abroad the fitches and scatter the cumin, and put the wheat in rows? For his God doth instruct him aright, and doth teach him. Bread corn is ground, for he will not ever be threshing it. This also cometh from the Lord of hosts, which is wonderful in counsel and excellent in working. End quote. Let us hear Coleridge further on the subject of those ideas which may invest us as an atmosphere rather than strike as a weapon. Quote, the idea may exist in a clear and definite form as that of a circle in that of the mind of a geometrician, or it may be a mere instinct, a vague appetency towards something, 
like the impulse which fills a young poet's eyes with tears. End quote. These indefinite ideas which express themselves in an appetency towards something, and which should draw a child towards things honest, lovely, and of good report, are not to be offered of set purpose or at set times. They are held in that thought atmosphere which surrounds him, breathed as his breath of life. It is distressing to think that our poor words and ways should be thus inspired by children, but to recognise the fact will make us careful not to admit sordid or unworthy thoughts and motives into our dealings with them. Coleridge treats in more detail those definite ideas which are not inhaled as air but are conveyed as meat to the mind. Quote, From the first or initiative idea, as from a seed, successive ideas germinate. Events and images, the lively and spirit-stirring machinery of the external world, are like light and air and moisture to the seed of the mind which would else rot and perish. The paths in which we may pursue a methodical course are manifold, and at the head of each stands its peculiar and guiding idea. Those ideas are as regularly subordinate in dignity as the paths to which they point a various and eccentric in direction. The world has suffered much in modern times from a subversive and necessary natural order of science. From summoning reason and faith to the bar of that limited physical experience to which, by the true laws of method, they owe no obedience. Progress follows the path of the idea from which it sets out requiring however a constant wakefulness of mind to keep it within the due limits of its course. Hence the orbits of thought, so to speak, must differ from among themselves as the initiative ideas differ. End quote. Method. STC. Is it not a fact that the new light which biology is throwing upon the laws of mind is bringing us back to the Platonic doctrine that, quote, an idea is a distinguishable power, self-affirmed and seen in unity with the eternal essence, end quote. I have ventured to repeat from an earlier volume this slight exposition of Coldridge's teaching because his doctrine corresponds with common experience and should reverse our ordinary educational practice. The whole subject is profound, but as practical as it is profound. We must disabuse our minds of the theory that the functions of education are in the main gymnastic, a continual drawing out without a corresponding act of putting in. The modern emphasis upon self-expression has given new currency to this idea. We who know how little there is in us that we have not received, that the most we can do is to give an original twist, a new application to an idea that has been passed on to us, who recognise humbly enough that we are but torchbearers, passing on our light to the next as we have received it from the last, even if we invite children to express themselves about a tank, a Norman castle, the man and the moon, not recognising that the quaint things children say on unfamiliar subjects are no more than a patchwork of notions picked up here and there. One is not sure that so-called original composition is wholesome for children, because their consciences are alert and they are quite aware of their borrowings. It may be better that they should read on a theme before they write upon it, using then as much latitude as they like. In the early days of a child's life it makes little apparent difference whether we educate with a notion of filling a receptacle, inscribing a tablet, moulding plastic matter or nourishing a life, but as a child grows, we shall perceive only those ideas which have fed his life are taken into his being. All the rest is cast away, or is, like sawdust in the system, an impediment and an injury. Education is a life. 
That life is sustained on ideas. Ideas are of spiritual origin, and God has made us so that we get them chiefly as we convey them to one another, whether by word of mouth, written page, scripture word, musical symphony. But we must sustain a child's inner life with ideas as we sustain his body with food. Probably he will reject nine-tenths of the ideas we offer, as he makes use of only a small proportion of his bodily food, rejecting the rest. He is an eclectic. He may choose this or that. Our business is to supply him with due abundance and variety, and his to take what he needs. Urgency on our part annoys him. He resists forcibly feeding and loathes pre-digested food. What suits him best is pabulum presented in the indirect literary form which our Lord adopts in those wonderful parables, whose quality is that they cannot be forgotten, though, while every detail of the story is remembered, its application may pass and leave no trace. We, too, must take this risk. We may offer children as their sustenance, the listener of Plutarch, an object lesson, we think, shewing what a statesman or a citizen should avoid. But, who knows, the child may take to Lysander and think his cute ways estimable. Again, we take the risk, as did our Lord in that puzzling parable of the unjust steward. One other caution, it seems to be necessary to present ideas with a great deal of padding as they reach us in a novel or poem or history book written with literary power. A child cannot in mind or body live upon tabloids, however scientifically prepared. Out of a whole big book, he may not get more than half a dozen of those ideas upon which his spirit thrives, and they come in unexpected places and unrecognised forms, so that no grown person is capable of making such extracts from Scott or Dickens or Milton, as will certainly give him nourishment. It is a case of, quote, in the morning sow thy seed, and in the evening withhold not thine hand, for thou knowest not whether shall prosper either this or that. End quote. One of our presumptuous sins in this connection is that we venture to offer opinions to children and to older persons instead of ideas. We believe that an opinion expresses thought and therefore embodies an idea. Even if it did so once, the very act of crystallisation into opinion destroys any vitality it may have had. Pace, Ruskin, a crystal is not a living body, and does not feed men. We think to feed children on the dogmas of a church, the theorems of Euclid, mere abstracts of history, and we wonder that their education does not seem to take hold of them. Let us hear M. Foulier on his subject, for to him the idea is all in all both in philosophy and education. But there is a function of education upon which M. Foulier hardly touches, that of the formation of habits, physical, intellectual, moral. Quote, scientific truths, said Descartes, are battles won. Describe to the young the principal and most heroic of these battles, you will thus interest them in the results of science, and you will develop in them a scientific spirit by means of the enthusiasm for the conquests of truth. How interesting arithmetic and geometry might be if we gave a short history of their principal theorems. If the child were meant to be present at the labours of a Pythagoras, a Plato, a Euclid, or in modern times of a Descartes, a Pascal, or a Leibniz, Great theories, instead of being lifeless and anonymous abstractions, would become living human truths, each with its own history, like a statue by Michelangelo or like a painting by Raphael. End quote. Here we have an application of Coleridge's captain idea of every train of thought. That is, not a naked generalisation. Neither children nor grown persons find ailment in these but an idea clothed upon with fact, history and story, so that the mind may perform the acts of selection and inception from a mass of illustrative details. 
Thus Dickens makes David Copperfield tell us that I was a very observant child, and that all children are very observant, not as a dry abstraction, but as an inference from a number of charming natural incidents. All roads lead to Rome, and all I have said is meant to enforce the fact that much and varied humane reading, as well as human thought expressed in the forms of art, is not a luxury, a tidbit, to be given to children now and then, but their very bread of life, which they must have in abundant portions and at regular periods. This and more is implied in the phrase, quote, the mind feeds on ideas, and therefore children should have a generous curriculum. End, quote. End of section six. Read by Daisy Campion, Preston, England. Completed on the eleventh of August, twenty twenty two. Section seven of Home Education Series, Volume six. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Home Education Series, Volume 6 Towards a Philosophy of Education by Charlotte Mason How We Make Use of Mind We hold that the child's mind is no mere sack to hold ideas, but is rather, if the figure may be allowed, a spiritual organism with an appetite for all knowledge. This is its proper diet with which it is prepared to deal, and what it is able to digest and assimilate, as the body does foodstuffs. Such a doctrine as the Herbartian, that the mind is a receptacle, lays the stress of education, the preparation of food and enticing morsels duly ordered, upon the teacher. Children taught on this principle are in danger of receiving much teaching but little knowledge, the teacher's axiom being, what a child learns matters less than how he learns it. I cannot resist presenting the Herbartian psychology in the dry light of Scottish humour. We have failed to explain ideas by the mind. How about explaining the mind by ideas? You are not to suppose that this is exactly how Herbart puts it. Herbart is a philosopher, a German philosopher. It is true that he starts with the mind, or as he prefers to call it, a soul. But do not fear that the sport of the hunt is to be spoiled for that. The given soul is no more a real soul than it is a real crater of a volcano. It has absolutely no content. It is not even an idea trap. Ideas can slip in and out of it as they please, or rather, as other ideas please, but the soul has no power either to call, make, keep, or recall an idea. The ideas arrange all these matters among themselves. The mind can make no objection. The soul has no capacity nor faculty whatever, either to receive or produce anything. It is therefore no tabula rasa in the sense that impressions, foreign to its nature, may be made on it. Also it is no substance in Leibniz's sense, which includes original self-activity. It has originally neither ideas, nor feelings, nor desires. Further, within it lie no forms of intuition and thought, no laws of willing and acting, nor any sort of predisposition, however remote, towards these. The simple nature of the soul is totally unknown and forever remains so. It is as little a subject for speculative as for empirical psychology. From Lehrbuch to Psychologie by Herbert, Part 3, pages 152 and 153. Thus, a vigorous vis inertiae is the only power of the mind. Still, it is subject to the action of certain forces. Nothing but ideas, Vorstellung, can attack the soul, so that the ideas really make up the mind. We are familiar with the struggle of ideas on the threshold, with the good luck of those that get in, and especially those that get in first and mount to high places, with the behaviour of ideas, very much like that of persons who fall into groups in an anarchical state. This behaviour is described as the formation of 
apperception masses, and the mass that is sufficiently strong has it all its own way and dominates the mind. Our business is not to examine the psychology of Herbart, a very serious and suggestive contribution to our knowledge of educational principles, but rather to consider how it works out practically in education. But before we examine how Herbartian psychology bears this test of experiment, let us consider what Professor William James has to say of psychology in general. When we talk of psychology as a natural science, he tells us, we must not assume that means a sort of psychology that stands at last on solid ground. It means just the reverse. It means a psychology particularly fragile, and into which the waters of metaphysical criticism leak at every joint, a psychology all of whose elementary assumptions and data must be reconsidered in wider connections and translated into other terms. It is, in short, a phrase of diffidence and not of arrogance, and it is indeed strange to hear people talk triumphantly of the new psychology, and write histories of psychology, when into the real elements and forces which the word covers, not the first glimpse of clear insight exists. A string of raw facts, a little gossip and wrangle about opinions, a little classification and generalization on the mere descriptive level, but not a single law, not a single proposition from which any consequence can casually be deduced. But Professor James went on and wrote his extraordinarily interesting book on psychology, and we must do the same, though our basis is no more than the common experience of mankind, so far as one mind can express the experience common to us all. Herbert's psychology is extraordinarily gratifying and attractive to teachers who are, like other people, eager to magnify their office. And here is a scheme which shows how every child is a new creation, as he comes forth from the hands of his teacher. The teacher learns how to do it. He has but to draw together a mass of those ideas which themselves will combine in the mind into which they effect an entrance, and behold, the thing is done. The teacher has done it. He has selected the ideas, shown the correlation of each with the other, and the work is complete. The ideas establish themselves, the most potent rule and gather force, and if these be good, the man is made. Here, for example, is a single week's correlation of subjects, worked out by a highly qualified teacher. Arithmetic, decimal fractions. Mathematics, simple equations, parallelograms. Science, latent heat. Housecraft, nerves, thought, habits. Geography, Scotland, general industries, or again for another week, under the same headings, metric problems, symbols, four rules, triangles, some angles, machinery, circulation, sculpture of the British Isles. The ideas, no doubt, have an agility and ability which we do not possess, and know how to jump at each other and form the desired apperception masses. A successful and able modern educationalist gives us a valuable introduction to Herbartian principles, and, by way of example, a Robinson Crusoe concentration scheme, a series of lessons given to children in Standard 1 in an elementary school. First, we have nine lessons in literature and language, the subject being such as Robinson climbs a hill and finds he is on an island. Then, ten object lessons, of which the first is the sea. The second, a ship from foreign parts. The sixth, a lifeboat. The seventh, shellfish. The tenth, a cave. How these objects are to be produced one does not see. The third series are drawing lessons, probably just as many. A boat, a ship, an oar an anchor, and so on. Then follows a series on manual training, still built upon Robinson. The first, a model of the seashore, then models of Robinson's island, of Robinson's house, and Robinson's pottery. The next course consists of reading, an indefinite number of lessons, 
passages from the child Robinson Crusoe and from a general reader on the matters discussed in object lessons. Then follows a series of writing lessons, simple composition on the subject of the lessons. The children framed the sentences which the teacher wrote on the blackboard and the class copied afterwards. Here is one composition. Robinson spent his first night in a tree. In the morning he was hungry, but he saw nothing round him but grass and trees without fruit. On the seashore he found some shellfish, which he ate. Compare this with the voluminous output of children of six or seven working on the PUS scheme upon any subject that they know, with indeed the pages they will dictate after a single reading of a chapter of Robinson Crusoe, not a child's edition. Arithmetic follows with, no doubt, as many lessons. Many mental examples and simple problems dealt with Robinson. The eighth and last course was in singing and recitation. I am monarch of all I survey, etc. The lessons lasted about 45 minutes each. Under ordinary conditions, the story of Robinson Crusoe would be the leading feature in the work of a whole year. In comparing the English classes with the German classes I have seen studying Robinson Crusoe, I was convinced that the eagerness and interest was as keen among the children here as in the German schools. One easily sees what a wealth of material there is in the further development of the story. One does indeed. The whole thing must be highly amusing to the teacher, as ingenious amplifications self-produced always are. That the children too were entertained, one does not doubt. The teacher was probably at her best in getting by sheer force much out of little. She was, in fact, acting a part, and the children were entertained as at a show, cinema, or other. But of one thing we may be sure, an utter distaste, a loathing, on the part of the children ever after, not only for Robinson Crusoe, but for every one of the subjects lugged in to illustrate his adventures. We read elsewhere of an apple affording a text for a hundred lessons, including the making of a ladder, in paper, to gather the apples. But alas, the eating of that worn-out apple is not suggested. The author whom we quote for Robinson Crusoe and whom we refrain from naming because, as a Greek chorus might say, we cannot praise, follows the Robinson series with another interminable series on the Armada. The conscientious, ingenious, and laborious teachers who produce these concentration series are little aware that each such lesson is an act of les majesté. The children who are capable of and eager for a wide range of knowledge and literary expression are reduced to inanities. A lifelong ennui is set up. Every approach to knowledge suggests avenues for boredom, and the children's minds sicken and perish long before their school days come to an end. I have pursued this subject at some length because we too believe in ideas as the proper and only diet upon which children's minds grow. We are more in the dark about mind than about Mars. We can but judge by effects, and these appear to point to the conclusion that mind is a spiritual organism. I need not apologise for speaking of that which has no substance as an organism, no greater a contradiction in terms than Herbart's apperception masses. By an analogy with body, we conclude that mind requires regular and sufficient sustenance, and that this sustenance is afforded by ideas we may gather from the insatiable eagerness with which these are appropriated, and the evident growth and development manifested under such pabulum. That children like feeble and tedious oral lessons, feeble and tedious storybooks, does not at all prove that these are wholesome food. They like lollipops, but cannot live upon them, Yet there is a serious attempt in certain schools to supply the intellectual, moral and religious needs of children by appropriate sweetmeats. As I have said elsewhere, the ideas required for the sustenance of children are to be found mainly in books of literary quality. Given these, 
the mind does for itself. The sorting, arranging, selecting, rejecting, classifying, which Herbert leaves to the struggle of the promiscuous ideas which manage to cross the threshold. Nor is this merely a nominal distinction. Herbert was a philosopher, and therefore his thought embraced the universal. Probably few schools of the day are consciously following the theories of this philosopher. But in most schools, in England and elsewhere, so far as any intelligent rationale is followed, it is that of Herbart. There are many reasons for this fact. A scheme which throws the whole burden of education on the teacher, which exalts the personality of the teacher as the chief agent in education, which affords ingenious, interesting and more or less creative work to a vast number of highly intelligent and devoted persons whose passionate hope is to leave the world a little better than they found it by means of those children whom they have raised to a higher level, must needs make a wide and successful appeal. It appeals equally to education committees and school managers. Consider the saving involved in the notion that teachers are compendiums of all knowledge, that they have but, as it were, to turn on the tap, and the necessary knowledge flows forth. All responsibility is shifted, and the relief is very great. Not only so, but lessons are delightful to watch and to hear. The success of jigsaw puzzles illustrates a tendency in human nature to delight in the ingenious putting together of unlikely things, as, for example, a life boy and Robinson Crusoe. There is a series of small triumphs to be observed any day of the week and these same triumphs are brought about by dramatic display. So ingenious, pleasing, fascinating are the ways in which the teacher chooses to arrive at her point. I say her point because women excel in this kind of teaching, but men do not come far short. What of the children themselves? They too are amused and entertained. They enjoy the puzzle element, and greatly enjoy the teacher, who lays herself out to attract them. There is no flaw in the practical working of the method while it is being carried out. Later it gives rise to dismay and anxiety among thoughtful people. Much water has run under the bridge, since several years ago Mr A. Patterson startled us out of self-complacency with his Across the Bridges. We as a nation were well pleased at the time with the result of our efforts. Nothing could be more intelligent, alert, brighter than the seventh standard boy about to leave school and take up his life work. Conditions were unpropitious. We know the old story of inviting blind alleys, present success, and then unemployment, with resulting depreciation in character. What is to be done? The question of after conditions is now being taken up seriously. We have continuation classes, which even if a boy be out of work, will help him to the Chinese art of saving his face. But Mr. Patterson condemns the schools for the rapidity with which their best boys run to seed. He does not quote the case of the boy who gets work, earns fair wages, conducts himself respectably, goes to a polytechnic, and the sort of boy with whom Mr. Pitt Ridge makes us familiar, who is so much less than he might be, so crude in his notions, so unmoral in his principles, so poor in interests, so meagre, if not coarse, in his choice of pleasures, and after all such a good fellow at bottom. He might have been taught in school to utilise his powers, to come into the enjoyment of the fine mind that is in him, but in schools, there is too much learning and too little work. The teacher ready to use the powers that his training and experience have given him works too hard, while the boy's share in the struggle is too light. It is possible to make education too easy for children and to rob learning of the mental discipline which often wearies, but in the end produces concentration and the capacity to work alone. He is rarely left to himself with the book in his hands, forced to concentrate all his mind on the dull words before him, with no one at hand to explain or make the memory work easier by little tricks of repetition and association. 
the boy who reaches the seventh standard with every promise and enters the service of a railway company is first required to sit down by himself and master the symbols of the telegraphic code. This he finds extremely irksome, for the only work he has ever done alone before is the learning of racy poetry, which is the very mildest form of mental discipline. Silent reading is occasionally allowed in odd half-hours. It might well be a regular subject for reading aloud, it is but a poor gift compared with the practice of reading in private. What does his curriculum do for the boy? Let us again hear Mr. Patterson. What is the educational ideal set before the average boy whose school days are to end at fourteen? What type is it that the authorities seek to produce? A glance at the syllabus will reassure the ordinary cynic who still labours under the quaint delusion that French and algebra and violin playing are taught in every London elementary school at the expense of the ratepayer. The syllabus was designed to leave a boy at fourteen with a thoroughly sound and practical knowledge of reading, writing, and arithmetic, and with such grounding in English, geography, and history as may enable him to read a newspaper or give a vote with some idea of what he's doing. But these are all subsidiary to teaching the three R's, which between them occupy more than half the 24 hours of teaching in the week. It is certain that the present object in view is dispiriting to master and boy alike, for a knowledge of reading, writing, and arithmetic is no education and no training, but merely the elementary condition of further knowledge. In many schools, the boy is labouring on with these mere rudiments for two or more years after all reasonable requirements have been satisfied. The intelligent visitor looking at the notebooks of an average class will be amazed at the high standard of the neatness and accuracy, but he will find the excellence of a very visible order. The handwriting is admirable. Sixteen boys out of thirty can write compositions without a flaw in grammar or spelling. Yet it will occur to him that the powers of voluntary thought and reason, of spontaneous inquiry and imagination, have not been stirred. This very perfection of form makes him suspicious as to the fundamental principles of our state curriculum. In public schools, boys are not trained to be lawyers or parsons or doctors, but to be men. If they have learned to work systematically and think independently, they are then fit to be trained for such life and profession as taste or necessity may dictate. But at our elementary schools, we seem to aim at producing a nation of clerks, for it is only to a clerk that this perfection of writing and spelling is a necessary training. The very faults of his qualities nullify the work of the teacher. His failing is that he does too much. Once more, we quote our authority. With the average boy, there is a marked waste of mental capital between the ages of 10 and 13, and the aggregate of this loss to the country is heavy indeed. Ten years at school conquer many of the drawbacks of home and discover a quick, receptive mind in the normal child. Many opportunities have been lost in these years of school, but after fourteen there is a more disastrous relapse. The brain is not taxed again, and shrivels into a mere centre of limited formulae acting automatically in response to appetite or sensation. The boy's general education fails utterly. Asia is but a name that is difficult to spell, though at school he spoke of its rivers and ports. It is probable that the vocabulary of a working man at forty is actually smaller than it was at fourteen. So shrunk is the power of the mind to feed upon the growing experience of life. Of the majority of boys, it is true to say that only half their ability is ever used in the work they find to do on leaving school. The other half curls up and sleeps for ever. Here we have a depressing prospect of grievous waste in the future. We all applaud the Education Act of 1918, are convinced that every boy and girl will receive education until the end of his 16th, possibly 18th year. A wave of generous feeling passed over the nation, and employers were willing to support the law, and if the eight hours conceded be spent in making the young people more reliable, intelligent, and responsible persons, no doubt the employers will be rewarded for their generosity. 
but there are rocks ahead. The only way to take advantage of this provision is to make this an eight hours university course. Now, as Mr. Patterson happily remarks, the universities do not undertake to prepare barristers, parsons, stockbrokers, bankers, or even soldiers and sailors with a specialised knowledge proper for each profession. Their implicit contention is, given a well-educated man with cultivated imagination, trained judgment, wide interests, and he is prepared to master the intricacies of any profession, while he knows at the same time how to make use of himself, of the powers with which nature and education have endowed him for his own happiness, and the delightful employment of his leisure, for the increased happiness of his neighbours, and the well-being of the community, that is, such a man is able not only to earn his living, but to live. The universities fulfil this claim. The various professions abound with men who, in newspaper phrase, are ornaments to their professions, and who gave up leisure and means to serve their fellow citizens as magistrates, church wardens, members of committees, special constables when needed, until lately members of parliament, holding service as an honour and as proud as was Godfrey Bertram, that unhappy laird and Guy Mannering, to write J.P. after their names. The enormous amount of voluntary service rendered in such ways throughout the empire, as well as that of insufficiently or duly paid service, justifies the universities in their reading of their peculiar function. But not only so, generous disinterested work can never be paid for, and our great statesmen, churchmen, soldiers and civil servants, as well as the members of county, municipal and urban district councils, have done their devoir over and above the bond. To secure this same splendidly devoted, voluntary service from all classes is the task set before us as a nation, a task the more easy because we have all seen it fulfilled in the war, when every man was a potential hero. Now is it not the fact that the army proved itself an unequalled university for our men, offering them increased knowledge, broad views, lofty aims, duty and discipline, along with the finest physical culture? So much so that instead of going on from where the war left off, we have to be on the watch against retrograde movements, physical, moral, intellectual. The downward grade is always at hand and we know how easy it is. We cannot afford another great war for the education of our people, but we must in some way supply the university element, and Mr. Fisher's great act points out such a way. The young people are for four years, a proper academic period, to be under influences that make for sweetness and light. But we must keep to the academic ideal. All preparation for specialised industries should be taboo. Special teaching towards engineering, cotton spinning and the rest is quite unnecessary for every manufacturer knows that, given a likely lad, he will soon be turned into a good workman in the works themselves. The splendid record of women workers in the war supports our contention. The efforts of technical schools and the like are not greatly prized by the heads of firms so far as the technical knowledge they afford goes. Boys from them are employed rather on the off chance that they may turn out intelligent and apt than for what they know beforehand of the business. Here is one more reason for treating the continuation school as the people's university and absolutely eschewing all money-making arts and crafts. Denmark and Scandinavia have tried this generous policy of educating young people, not according to the requirements of their trade, but according to their natural capacity to know, and their natural desire for knowledge, that desire to know history, poetry, science, art, which is natural to every man, and the success of the experiment, now a century old, is an object lesson for the rest of the world. Germany has pursued a different ideal. Her efforts, too, have been great, unified by the idea of utility. And if we will only remember the lesson, 
the war has shown us how futile is an education which affords no moral or intellectual uplift, no motive higher than the learner's peculiar advantage and that of the state. Germany became morally bankrupt, for a season only, let us hope, not solely because of the war, but as a result of an education which ignored the things of the spirit, or gave these a nominal place and a poor rendering in a utilitarian syllabus. We are encouraged to face the fact boldly that it is a people's university we should aim at, a university with its thousands of colleges up and down the land, each of them the continuation school, the name is not inviting, for some one neighbourhood. But, it will be argued, the subject matter of a university education is conveyed for the most part through the channel of dead languages, Latin and Greek. Our contention is that, however ennobling the literature in these tongues, we cannot honestly allow our English literature to take a second place to any other, and that therefore whatever Sophocles, Thucydides, Virgil have it in them to do towards a higher education may be affected more readily by Milton, Gibbon, Shakespeare, Bacon, and a multitude of great thinkers who are therefore great writers. Learning conveyed in our common speech is easier come by than that secreted in a dead language, and this fact will help us to deal with the inadequacy of the period allowed. Given absolute attention, and we can do much with 400 hours a year, 1600 hours in our four years course, but only if we go to work with a certainty that the young students crave knowledge of what we call the humanities that they read with absolute attention, and that, having read, they know. They will welcome the preparation for public speaking, an effort for which everyone must qualify in these days, which the act of narration offers. The alternative is some such concentration scheme as that indicated in Robinson Crusoe, a year's work on soap, its manufacture, ingredients, the soap trade, soap transport, the uses of soap, how to make out a soap invoice, the sorts of soap, and so on ad infinitum, each process in the iron, cotton, nail, pin, engine, button, each process in our thousand and one manufactures will offer its own ingenious concentration scheme. The advocates of utilitarian education will be delighted, the young students will be kept busy, and will to some extent use their wits all the time. With what result? Some two centuries ago, when a movement for adolescent education agitated Europe, devastated by the Napoleonic Wars, we English took our part. The current early divided into two streams, the material and the spiritual, the useful and the educative, and England, already great in manufactures, was carried along by the first of these streams, followed by Germany, France, Switzerland, while the Scandinavian group of countries learned at the lips of that father of the people's high schools that spirit is might, spirit reveals itself in spirit, spirit works only in freedom. We see the apotheosis of utilitarian education in the Munich schools on the one hand and in the morale of the German army on the other. But we are slow to learn because we have set up a little tin god of efficiency in that niche within our private pantheon which should be occupied by personality. We trouble ourselves about the uses of the young person to society. As for his own use, what he should be in and for himself, why, what matter? Because, say we, if we fit him to earn his living, we fit him also to be of service to the world, and what better can we do for him personally? We forget that it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God shall man live, whether it be spoken in the way of some truth of religion poem, picture, scientific discovery, or literary expression. By these things men live, and in all such is the life of the spirit. 
The spiritual life requires the food of ideas for its daily bread. We shall find in the words of a well-known Swedish professor that just as enrichment of the soil gives the best conditions for the seed sown in it, so a well-grounded humanistic training provides the surest basis for a business capacity, and not the least so in the case of the coming farmer. But we need not go so far afield. We have a prophet of our own, and I will close this part of my subject by quoting certain of Mr. Fisher's words of wisdom. Now let me say something about the content of education, about the things which should actually be taught in the schools, and I am only going to talk in the very broadest possible way. In my afternoon's reading, I came upon another very apposite remark in the letters of John Stuart Mill. Let me read it to you. What the poor, as well as the rich, require is not to be taught other people's opinions, but to be induced and enabled to think for themselves. It is not physical science that will do this, even if they could learn it much more thoroughly than they are able to do. The young people of this country are not to be regenerated by economic doctrine, or economic history, or physical science. They can only be elevated by ideas which act upon the imagination, and act upon the character, and influence the soul, and it is the function of all good teachers to bring those ideas before them. I have sometimes heard it said that you should not teach patriotism in the school, I dissent from that doctrine. I think that patriotism should be taught in the schools. I will tell you what I mean by patriotism. By patriotism, I do not mean jingoism, but what I mean by patriotism is an intelligent appreciation of all things noble in the romances, in the literature, and in the history of one's own country. Young people should be taught to admire what is great while they are at school. And remember that for the poor of this country, the school is a far more important factor than it is for the rich people of this country. I say that I want patriotism in the larger sense of the term taught in the schools. Of course, there is a great deal to criticise in any country, and I should be the last person to suggest that the critical faculty should not be exercised and trained at school. But before we teach children to criticise the institutions of their country, before we teach them to be critical of what is bad, let us teach them to recognise and admire what is good. After all, life is very short. We all of us have only one life to live. And during that life, let us get into ourselves as much love, as much admiration, as much elevating pleasure as we can, and if we view education merely as discipline and critical bitterness, then we shall lose all the sweets of life, and we shall make ourselves unnecessarily miserable. There is quite enough sorrow and hardship in this world as it is, without introducing it prematurely to young people. Nota bene. Probably some educational authorities may decide to give one hour or two weekly to physical training and handicrafts, in which case the timetable must allow for so much the less reading. But I should like to urge that, with the long evening leisure of which there is promise, club life will become an important feature in every village and district. Classes will certainly be arranged for military and other drills, gymnastics, dancing, singing, swimming, carpentry, cooking, nursing, dressmaking, weaving, pottery, acting. In fact, whatever the quickened intelligence of the community demands. No compulsion would be necessary to enforce attendance at classes, for which the machinery is already in existence in most places, and which, associated with club life, would have certain social attractions in the way of public displays, prize-givings, and so on. The intellectual life of the continuation school should give zest to these evening occupations, as well as to the Saturday field club, which no neighbourhood should be without. I have put the case for continuation schools as strongly as may be, but there is a more excellent way. In these days of high wages, it may well happen that 
parents will be willing to let their children remain at school until the end of their 17th year, in which case they will be able to go on with the secondary education which they have begun at the age of six, and we shall see a new thing in the world. Every man and woman will have received a liberal education. Life will no longer discount the ideas and aims of the schoolroom, and if according to the platonic saying, knowledge is virtue, knowledge informed by religion, we shall see even in our own day how righteousness exalteth a nation. End of section 7. Read by CCSTG in Auckland, New Zealand on the 5th of July, 2022. Section 8 of Home Education Series, Volume 6. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Julie Hedrick. Home Education Series, Volume 6, Towards a Philosophy of Education, by Charlotte Mason. Chapter 8. 1. The Way of the Will. We may offer to children two guides to moral and intellectual self-management which we may call the way of the will and the way of the reason. The way of the will. Children should be taught a. to distinguish between I want and I will, b. that the way to will effectively is to turn our thoughts away from that which we desire but do not will, c. that the best way to turn our thoughts is to think of or do some quite different thing, entertaining or interesting. d. That after a little rest in this way, the will returns to its work with new vigor. This adjunct of the will is familiar to us as a diversion, whose office it is to ease us for a time from will effort that we may will again with added power. The use of suggestion as an aid to the will is to be deprecated, as tending to stultify and stereotype character. It would seem that spontaneity is a condition of development, and that human nature needs the discipline of failure as well as of success. The great things of life, life itself, are not easy of definition. The will, we are told, is the sole practical faculty of man. But who is to define the will? We are told again that the will is the man, and yet most men go through life without a single definite act of willing. Habit, convention, the customs of the world have done so much for us that we get up, dress, breakfast, follow our morning's occupations, our later relaxations, without an act of choice. For this much at any rate we know about the will. Its function is to choose, to decide, and there seems to be no doubt that the greater becomes the effort of decision, the weaker grows the general will. Opinions are provided for us. We take our principles at second or third hand, our habits are suitable and convenient, and what more is necessary for a decent and orderly life. But the one achievement possible and necessary for every man is character, and character is as finely wrought metal beaten into shape and beauty by the repeated and accustomed action of will. We who teach should make it clear to ourselves that our aim in education is less conduct than character. Conduct may be arrived at, as we have seen, by indirect routes, but it is of value to the world only as it has its source in character. Every assault upon the flesh and spirit of man is an attack, however insidious, against his personality, his will. But a new Armageddon is upon us, in so far that the attack is no longer indirect, but is aimed consciously and directly at the will, which is the man and we shall escape becoming a nation of imbeciles only because there will always be persons of good will amongst us who will resist the general trend. The office of parents and teachers is to turn out such persons of good will. That they should deliberately weaken the moral fiber of their children by suggestion is a very grave offense, and a thoughtful examination of the subject should act as a sufficient deterrent. For, let us consider... What we do with the will, we describe as voluntary. What we do without the conscious action of will is involuntary. The will has only one mode of action, 
Its function is to choose, and with every choice we make, we grow in force of character. From the cradle to the grave, suggestions crowd upon us, and such suggestions become part of our education because we must choose between them. But a suggestion given by an intent and supported by an outside personality has an added strength which few are able to resist, just because the choice has been made by another and not by ourselves, and our tendency is to accept this vicarious choice and follow the path of least resistance. No doubt much of this vicarious choosing is done for our good, whether for our health of body or amenableness of mind. But those who propose suggestion as a means of education do not consider that with every such attempt upon the child, they weaken that which should make a man of him, his own power of choice. The parasitic creatures who live upon the habits, principles, and opinions of others may easily become criminal. They only wait the occasion of some popular outburst to be carried into such a fury of crime as the Gordon riots presented a mad fury of which we have had terrible examples in our own day, though we have failed to ascribe them to their proper cause, the undermining of the will of the people, who have not been instructed in that ordering of the will which is their chief function as men and women. His will is the safeguard of a man against the unlawful intrusions of other persons. We are taught that there are offenses against the bodies of others which may not be committed, but who teaches us that we may not intrude upon the minds and overrule the wills of others, that it is indecent to let another probe the thoughts of the unconscious mind, whether of child or man. Now the thought that we choose is commonly the thought that we ought to think, and the part of the teacher is to afford to each child a full reservoir of the right thought of the world to draw from. For right thinking is by no means a matter of self-expression. Right thought flows upon the stimulus of an idea, and ideas are stored as we have seen in books and pictures and the lives of men and nations. These instruct the conscience and stimulate the will, and man or child chooses. An accomplished statesman exhibited to us lately how the disintegration of a great empire was brought about by the weakness of its rulers, who allowed their willpower to be tampered with, their judgments suggested, their actions directed by those who gained access to them. There is no occasion for panic, but it is time that we realize that to fortify the will is one of the great purposes of education, and probably some study of the map of the city of Mansoul would afford us guidance. At least, a bird's-eye view of the riches of the city should be spread before the children. They should themselves know of the wonderful capacities to enter upon the world as a great inheritance which exists in every human being. All its beauty and all its thought are open to everyone. Everyone may take service for the world's use. Everyone may climb those delectable mountains from which he gets the vision of the city of God. He must know something of his body with its senses and its appetites, of his intellect, imagination, and aesthetic sense, of his moral nature, ordered by love and justice. Realizing how much is possible to man's soul and the perils that assail it, he should know that the duty of self-direction belongs to him, and that the powers for this direction are lodged in him, as are intellect and imagination, hunger and thirst. These governing powers are the conscience and the will. The whole ordering of education, with its history, poetry, arithmetic, pictures, is based on the assumption that conscience is incapable of ordering life without regular and progressive instruction. We need instruction also concerning the will. Persons commonly suppose that the action of the will is automatic, but no power of man's soul acts by itself and of itself, and some little study of the way of the will, which has the ordering of every other power, may help us to understand the functions of this premier in the kingdom of man's soul. Early in his teens, we should at least put clearly before a child the possibility of a drifting, easy life led by the appetite or desire in which will plays no part, and the other possibility of using the power and responsibility proper to him as a person and willing as he goes. He must be safeguarded from some fallacies. 
No doubt he has heard at home that Baby has a strong will because he cries for a knife and insists on pulling down the tablecloth. In his history lessons and his readings of tale and poem, he comes across persons each of whom carries his point by strong willfulness. He laughs at that rash boy, Phaeton, measures Esau with a considering eye, finds him more attractive than Jacob, who yet wins higher approval, perceives that Esau is willful, but that Jacob has a strong will, and through this and many other examples, recognizes that a strong will is not synonymous with being good, nor with the determination to have your own way. He learns to distribute the characters he comes across in his reading on either side of a line, those who are willful and those who are governed by will. And this line by no means separates between the bad and the good. It does divide, however, between the impulsive, self-pleasing, self-seeking and the persons who have an aim beyond and outside of themselves, even though it be an aim appalling to that of Milton's Satan. It follows for him that he must not only will, but will with a view to an object outside himself. He will learn to recognize in Louis XI a mean man and a great king, because France, and not himself, was the object of his crooked policy. The will, too, is of slow growth, nourished upon the ideas proposed to it, and so all things work together for the good of the child who is duly educated. It is well that children should know that while the turbulent person is not ruled by will at all, but by impulse, the movement of his passions or desires, yet it is possible to have a constant will with unworthy or evil ends, or even to have a steady will towards a good end, and to compass that end by unworthy means. The simple rectified will, which our Lord calls the single eye, would appear to be the one thing needful for straight living and serviceableness. But always the first condition of will, good or ill, is an object outside of self. The boy or girl who sees this will understand that self-culture is not to be accepted as an ideal, will not wonder why Bushido is mighty in Japan, will enter into the problem which Browning raises in The Statue and the Bust. By degrees, the scholar will perceive that just as to reign is the distinctive function of a king, so to will is the function of a man. A king is not a king unless he reigns, and a man is less than a man unless he wills. Another thing to be observed is that even the constant will has its times of rise and fall, and one of the secrets of living is how to tide over the times of fall in willpower. The boy must learn, too, that the will is subject to solicitations all round, from the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eye and the pride of life, that will does not act alone. It takes the whole man to will, and a man wills wisely, justly, and strongly in proportion as all his powers are in training and under instruction. We must understand in order to will. How is that ye will not understand, said our Lord to the Jews? And that is the way with most of us. We will not understand. We look out for great occasions which do not come, and do not see that the sphere for the action of our wills is in ourselves. Our concern with life is to be fit, and according to our fitness come our occasions and the uses we shall be put to. Unlike every other power in the kingdom of Mansoul, the will is able to do what it likes, is a free agent, and the one thing the will has to do is to prefer. Choose ye this day is the command that comes to each of us in every affair and on every day of our lives, and the business of the will is to choose. But choice... The effort of decision is a heavy labor, whether it be between two lovers or two gowns. So, many people minimize this labor by following the fashion in their clothes, rooms, reading, amusements, the pictures they admire and the friends they select. We are zealous in choosing for ourselves, but shirk the responsibility of decisions for ourselves. What is to be said about obedience to the heads of the house first, to the state, to the church, and always to the laws of God. Obedience is the test, the sustainer of personality, but it must be the obedience of choice. Because choice is laborious, little children must be trained in the obedience of habit. But every gallant boy and girl has learned to choose to obey all who are set in authority. Such obedience is the essence of chivalry, 
And chivalry is that temper of mind opposed to self-seeking. The chivalrous person is a person of constant will, for, as we have seen, will cannot be exercised steadily for the ends of personal gain. It is well to know what it is we choose between. Things are only signs which represent ideas, and several times a day we shall find two ideas presented to our minds and must make our choice upon right and reasonable grounds. We shall thus be on our guard against the weak allowance which we cause to do duty for choice, and against such dishonest fallacies as that it is our business to get the best that is to be had at the lowest price. And it is not only in matters of dress and ornament, household use and decoration, that we run after the cheapest and newest. We chase opinions and ideas with the same restlessness and uncertainty. Any fad, any notion in the newspapers, we pick up with eagerness. Once again, the will is the man. The business of the will is to choose. There are many ways to get out of the task of choosing, but it is always, Choose you this day whom ye will serve. There are two services open to us all, the service of God, including that of man, and the service of self. If our aim is just to get on, to do ourselves well, to get all possible ease, luxury, and pleasure out of our lives, we are serving self, and for the service of self no act of will is required. Our appetites and desires are always at hand to spur us into the necessary exertions. But if we serve God and our neighbor, we have to be always on the watch to choose between the ideas that present themselves. What the spring is to the year, school days are to our life. You meet a man whose business in the world appears to be to eat and drink, play golf and motor. He may have another and deeper life that we know nothing about, but, so far as we can see, he has enlisted in the service of self. You meet another man, a man of position, doing important work, and his ideas are those he received from the great men who taught him at school and college. The Greek plays are his hobby. He is open to great thoughts and ready for service, because that which we get in our youth we keep through our lives. Though the will affects all our actions and all our thoughts, its direct action is confined to a very little place, to that postern at either side of which stand conscience and reason, and at which ideas must needs present themselves. Shall we take an idea in, or reject it? Conscience and reason have their say, but will is supreme, and the behavior of will is determined by all the principles we have gathered, all the opinions we have formed. We accept the notion, ponder it. At first we vaguely intend to act upon it, then we form a definite purpose, then a resolution, and then comes an act or general temper of mind. We are told of Rudyard Kipling that his great ambition and desire at one time was to keep a tobacconist's shop. Why? Because in this way he could get into human touch with the men who came to buy their weekly allowance of tobacco. Happily for the world, he did not become a tobacconist, but the idea which moved him in the first place has acted throughout his life. Always he has men, young men, about him, and who knows how many he has moved to become captains courageous by his talk as well as by his books. But suppose an unworthy idea present itself at the postern, supported by public opinion, by reason, for which even conscience finds pleas. The will soon wearies of opposition, and what is to be done? Fight it out? That is what the medieval church did with those ideas which it rightly regarded as temptations. The lash, the hair shirt, the stone couch, the emaciated frame told of these not too successful Armageddons. When the overstrained will asks for repose, it may not relax to yielding point, but may and must seek recreation, diversion. Latin thought has afforded us beautiful and appropriate names for that which we require. A change of physical or mental occupation is very good, but if no other change is convenient, let us think of something else, no matter how trifling. A new tie, or our next new hat, a storybook we are reading, a friend we hope to see. Anything does, so long as we do not suggest to ourselves the thought we ought to think on the subject in question. The will does not want the support of arguments, but the recreation of rest, change, diversion. 
In a surprisingly short time, it is able to return to the charge and to choose this day the path of duty, however dull or tiresome, difficult or dangerous. This way of the will is a secret of power, the secret of self-government, with which people should be furnished not only for ease in practical right-doing or for advance in the religious life, but also for their intellectual well-being. Our claim to free will is a righteous claim. Will can only be free whether its object be right or wrong. It is a matter of choice, and there is no choice but free choice. But we are apt to translate free will into free thought. We allow ourselves to sanction intellectual anarchism and forget that it rests with the will to order the thoughts of the mind fully as much as the feelings of the heart or the lusts of the flesh. Our thoughts are not our own, and we are not free to think as we choose. The injunction, choose ye this day, applies to the thoughts which we allow ourselves to receive. Will is the one free agent of man's soul. Will alone may accept or reject. And will is therefore responsible for every intellectual problem which has proved too much for a man's sanity or for his moral probity. We may not think what we please on shallow matters or profound. The instructed conscience and trained reason support the will in these things, little and great, by which men live. The ordering of the will is not an affair of sudden resolve. It is the outcome of a slow and ordered education in which precept and ample flow in from the lives and thoughts of other men, men of antiquity and men of the hour, both unconsciously and spontaneously as the air we breathe. But the moment of choice is immediate, and the act of the will voluntary. And the object of education is to prepare us for this immediate choice and voluntary action which every day presents. While affording some secrets of the way of the will to young people, we should perhaps beware of presenting the ideas of self-knowledge, self-reverence, and self-control. All adequate education must be outward-bound, and the mind which is concentrated upon self-emolument even though it be the emolument of all the virtues, misses the higher and the simpler secrets of life. Duty and service are the sufficient motives for the arduous training of the will that a child goes through with little consciousness. The gradual fortifying of the will which many a schoolboy undergoes is hardly perceptible to himself however tremendous the results may be for his city or his nation. Will, free will, must have an object outside of self. And the poet has said the last word so far as we yet know. Our wills are ours, we know not how. Our wills are ours to make them thine. End of section 8. Section 9 of Home Education Series, Volume 6. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Home Education Series, Volume 6, Towards a Philosophy of Education, by Charlotte Mason, Section 9, The Way of the Reason. We should teach children also not to lean too confidently unto their own understanding, because the function of reason is to give logical demonstration of a mathematical truth, and b, of initial ideas accepted by the will. In the former case, reason is, perhaps, an infallible guide, but in the latter is not always a safe one, for whether the initial idea be right or wrong, reason will confirm it by irrefragable proofs. Therefore children should be taught, as they become mature enough, to understand such teaching that the chief responsibility which rests upon them as persons is the acceptance or rejection of ideas presented to them. To help them in this choice, we should afford them principles of conduct and a wide range of fitting knowledge. Every child, every man, who comes to a sudden halt, watching the action of his own reason, is another Columbus, the discoverer of a new world. Commonly we let reason do its work without attention on our part. But there come moments when we stand in startled admiration and watch the unfolding before us, point by point, of a score of arguments in favor of this carpet as against that, this route in preference to the other, our chosen chum as against Bob Brown, because every pro suggested by our reason is opposed to some con in the background. 
How else should it happen that there is no single point upon which two persons may reason? Food, dress, games, education, politics, religion? But the two may take opposite sides, and each will bring forward infallible proofs which must convince the other, were it not that he too is already convinced by stronger proofs to strengthen his own argument. Every character in history or fiction supports this thesis, and probably we cannot give a better training in right reasoning than by letting children work out the arguments in favor of this or that conclusion. Thus Macbeth, a great general, returns after a brilliant victory. Head and heart are inflated. What can he not achieve? Could he not govern a country as well as rule an army? Reason unfolds the steps by which he might do great things. Great things, eh? But are they lawful, these possible exploits? And then, in the nick of time, he comes across the weird sisters, as we are all apt to take refuge in fatalism, when conscience no longer supports us. He shall be Thane of Cawdor, and behold, confirmation arrives on the spot. He shall also be king. Well, if this is decreed, what can he do? He is no longer a free agent. And a score of valid arguments unfold themselves, showing how Scotland, the world, his wife, himself, would be enhanced, would flourish and be blessed if he had the opportunity to do what was in him. Opportunity? The thing was decreed. It rested with him to find the means, the tools. He was not without imagination, had a poetic mind, and shrank before the horrors he vaguely foresaw. But reason came to his aid, and step by step the whole bloody tragedy was wrought out before his prescient mind. When we first meet with Macbeth, he is rich in honors, troops of friends, the generous confidence of his king. The change is sudden and complete and we may believe reason justified him at every point. But reason did not begin it. The will played upon by ambition had already admitted the notion of towering greatness or ever the weird sisters gave shape to his desire. Had it not been for this countenance afforded by the will, the forecasts of fate would have influenced his conduct no more than they did that of Banquo. But it must not be supposed that reason is malign, the furtherer of ill counsels only. Nurse Cavell, Jack Cornwell, Lord Roberts, General Gordon, Madame Curie, leave hints enough to enable us to follow the trains of thought which issued in glorious deeds. We know how Florence Nightingale received, welcomed, reasoned out the notion of pity which obsessed her, and how through many difficulties her great project for the saving of the sick and suffering of her country's army worked itself out, how she was able to convey to those in power the same convincing arguments which moved herself. That was a happy thought of the medieval church, which represented the leading idea of each of the seven liberal arts by a chosen exponent able to convince others by the arguments which his own reason brought forward. So Priscian thought the world grammar, Pythagoras arithmetic, and the name of Euclid still stands for the science which appealed to his reason. But it is not only great intellectual advances and discoveries, or world-shaping events for good or evil, that exhibit the persuasive power of reason. There is no object in use, great or small, upon which some man's reason has not worked exhaustively. A sofa, a chest of drawers, a ship, a box of toy soldiers, have all been thought out step by step, and the inventor has not only considered the pros, but has so far overcome the cons, that his invention is there ready for use. And only here and there does anyone take the trouble to consider how the useful or perhaps beautiful article came into existence. Is it worth while to ask a child, how did you think of it, when he comes to tell you of a new game he has invented? a new country of the imagination he has named, peopled and governed. He will probably tell you what first put it into his head, and then how the reasons one after another came to him. After, how did you think of it, the next question that will occur to a child is, how did he think of it? And he will distinguish between the first notion that has put it into his head, and the reasoned steps which have gone to the completion of an object, the discovery of a planet, the making of a law. 
Sometimes a child should be taken into the psychology of crime, and he will see that reason brings infallible proofs of the rightness of the criminal act. From Cain to the latest great offender, every criminal act has been justified by reasoned arguments which come of their own accord to the criminal. We know the arguments before which Eve fell when the serpent played the part of the weird sisters. It is pleasant to the eye. It is good for food. It shall make you wise in the knowledge of good and evil. Good and convincing arguments, specious enough to overbear the counter-pleadings of obedience. Children should know that such things are before them also, that whenever they want to do wrong, capital reasons for doing the wrong thing will occur to them. But happily, when they want to do right, no less cogent reasons for right doing will appear. After abundant practice in reasoning and tracing out the reasons of others, whether in fact or fiction, children may readily be brought to the conclusions that reasonable and right are not synonymous terms, that reason is their servant, not their ruler, one of those servants which help Mansul in the governance of his kingdom, but no more than appetite, ambition, or the love of ease is reason to be trusted with the government of a man, much less that of a state, because well-reasoned arguments are brought into play for a wrong course as for a right. He will see that reason works involuntarily, that all the beautiful steps follow one another in his mind without any activity or intention on his own part, but he need never suppose that he was hurried along into evil by thoughts which he could not help, because reason never begins it. It is only when he chooses to think about some coarser plan, as Eve standing before the apples, that reason comes into play. So if he chooses to think about a purpose that is good, many excellent reasons will hurry up to support him. But alas, if he choose to entertain a wrong notion, he, as it were, rings the bell for reason, which enforces his wrong intention with a score of arguments proving that wrong is right. A due recognition of the function of reason should be an enormous help to us all in days when the air is full of fallacies, and when our personal modesty, that becoming respect for other people which is proper to well-ordered natures, whether young or old, makes us willing to accept conclusions duly supported by public opinion or by those whose opinions we value. Nevertheless, it is something to recognize that probably no wrong thing has ever been done or said no crime committed, but has been justified to the perpetrator by arguments coming to him involuntarily and produced with cumulative force by his own reason. Is Shakespeare ever wrong? And if so, may we think that a Richard the Third, who gloats over his own villainy as villainy, who is in fact no hypocrite in the sense of acting to himself, is hardly true to human nature? Great is Shakespeare! So perhaps Richard was the exception to the rule which makes a man go out and hang himself when at last he sees his incomparable villainy, and does not Richard say in the end, I myself find in myself no pity for myself? For ourselves and our children it is enough to know that reason will put a good face on any matter we propose, and that we can prove ourselves to be in the right is no justification, for there is absolutely no theory we may receive no action we may contemplate, which our reason will not affirm. Of course we know by many infallible proofs that Bacon wrote Shakespeare, and an ingenious person has worked out a chain of arguments proving that Dr. Johnson wrote the Bible. Why not? For a nation of logical thinkers, the French made an extraordinary faux pas when they elected the goddess of reason to divine honors. But indeed, perhaps they did it because they were a logical nation. For logic gives us the very formula of reason, and that which is logically proved is not necessarily right. We need no longer wonder that two men equally upright, equally virtuous, selected out of any company, will hold opposite views on almost any question, and each will support his views by logical argument. So we are at the mercy of the doctrinaire in religion, the demagogue in politics, and dare we say of the dreamer in science, and we think to save our souls by being in the front rank of opinion in one or the other. But not if we have grown up cognizant of the beauty and wonder of the act of reasoning, 
and also of the limitations which attend it. We must be able to answer the arguments in the air, not so much by counter-reasons as by exposing the fallacies in such arguments and proving on our own part the opposite position. For example, that very lovable, very exasperating, but essentially real, though often wrong-headed enthusiast, Karl Marx, dominates the socialistic thought of today. Point by point, for good or for evil, the Marxian Manifesto of 1848 is coming into force. For the most advanced countries, we are told, the following measures might come into very general application. 1. Expropriation of landed property and application of rent to state expenditure. We have not space to examine the Marxian proposition in detail, but let us consider a single fallacy. It is assumed that the rent of landed property is for the sole use, enrichment, and enjoyment of the owner. Now the schedule of the Duke of Bedford, for example, published recently, shows that the income derived from park property is inadequate to its upkeep and to the taxes imposed upon the owner. Again, landowners are not only large employers of labor, generally under favorable conditions, but they keep up a very important benefaction. Most of the extensive landowners make of their places public parks, kept in beautiful order at their private expense. 2. Heavy progressive taxation. The fallacy lies in the fact that the proletariat in whose interest the manifesto was issued must necessarily on account of their numbers be large taxpayers. Therefore it is upon them that heavy progressive taxation will press, as we have all seen in Russia, to the point of their extinction. 3. Abolition of inheritance. A measure designed to reduce all persons to the same level. As we know, the abolition of class is the main object of socialism, but the underlying fallacy is the assumption that class is stable and is not in a state of continual flux, the continual upward and downward movement as of watery particles in the ocean. The man at the bottom today may be at the top tomorrow, as we see, not only in Soviet Russia but in most civilized countries. Attempts to control this natural movement are as vain as King Canute's command to the ocean. 4. Confiscation of the property of all emigrants and rebels. Assumed authority must be supported by tyranny, that worst tyranny which requires all men to think to order, as they must be in a Soviet state, or be penalized to make them powerless. The fallacy lies in a misconception of human nature. There is nothing that men will not sacrifice for an idea, for such an idea as that of freedom of thought and of movement. 5, 6, and 7 deal with centralization, credit, of transport, of factories, of instruments of production in the hands of the state, the state that is, every man, the proletariat, in fact, in whose hands all wealth and means of obtaining wealth shall be lodged. Here we have a logically thought-out preparation for the government of the people, by the people, for the people. But the underlying fallacy is that it makes for revolution, which effects no change but a mere change of rulers, better or worse as may be. In the Soviet Republic, according to the law of perpetual social flux, new rulers would come to the top, arbitrary and tyrannical, because not hemmed in by precedent and custom. And children will be at no loss to show how the last state of a nation so governed is worse than the first. 8. Compulsory Obligation of Labor Upon All The initial idea of a Soviet state is that it shall afford due liberty in equal conditions for all, but even in the contemplation of such a state it was necessary to postulate for everybody conscription and the discipline of an army. 9. Joint Prosecution for Agriculture and Manufacture The aim being the gradual removal of the distinction of town and country. Here is a point in the manifesto which we should all like to see in practice, but is it possible? 10. Public and gratuitous education for all children. This happily we have seen carried out with the proviso for whom it may be necessary or desirable. The difficulty lies in the conception of education formed by a Soviet community, and the plea for free education is a specious blind. 
the intention being such an education as shall train the coming generation in rabid revolutionary principles. To continue our examination of the tenth maxim, the next clause, B, requires abolition of children's labor in factories in its present form. So far, so good. Happily we have lived to see this abolition. There may be a sinister reading of the clause, but on the surface it carries the assent of all good citizens. C. Union of Education with Material Production Here, from motives of economy, we are going the way of the communists in our continuation schools. But a fallacy underlies the maxim, which may well frustrate our efforts towards the better education of the people. The assumption is that the boy who learns, say, certain manufacturing processes, pari passu with his intellectual education, does better in the future than he who gives the full period to education. There is no consensus of the opinion of employers to prove that this is the case. On the contrary, given a likely boy, and a manufacturer will be satisfied that he will soon learn his business in the works. But the function of education is not to give technical skill, but to develop a person. The more of a person, the better the work of whatever kind. And as I have said before, the idea of the continuation school is, or should be, a university course in the humanities, not in what have been called the best humanities, i.e. the classics, though whether these are in any sense best is a moot question, but in the singularly rich humanities which the English tongue affords. These ten Marxian maxims give us ample ground for discussion, not for lectures or for oral lessons, but for following for a few minutes any opening suggested by current events, a feature in the children's program of work but they must follow arguments and detect fallacies for themselves. Reason, like the other powers of the mind, requires material to work upon whether embalmed in history and literature or afloat with the news of a strike or uprising. It is madness to let children face a debatable world with only, say, a mathematical preparation. If our business were to train their power of reasoning, such a training would no doubt be of service but the power is there already, and only wants material to work upon. This caution must be borne in mind. Reason, like all other properties of a person, is subject to habit and works upon the material it is accustomed to handle. Plato formed a just judgment on this matter too, and perceived that mathematics afford no clue to the labyrinth of affairs, whether public or private. We have seen that their reading and the affairs of the day should afford scope and opportunity for the delight in ratiocination proper to children. The fallacies they themselves perpetrate when exposed make them the readier to detect fallacies everywhere. What are we to do? Are we to waste time in discussing with children every idle and blasphemous proposition that comes their way? Surely not. But we may help them to principles which should enable them to discern these two characters for themselves. A proposition is idle when it rests on nothing and leads to nothing. Again, blasphemy is a sin, the sin of being impudent towards Almighty God, whom we all know without any telling and know him to be fearful, wonderful, loving, just, and good, as certainly as we know that the sun shines or the wind blows. Children should be brought up, too, to perceive that a miracle is not less a miracle because it occurs so constantly and regularly that we call it a law that sap rises in a tree, that a boy is born with his uncle's eyes, that an answer that we can perceive comes to our serious prayers. These things are not the less miracles because they happen frequently or invariably, and because we have ceased to wonder about them. No doubt, so did the people of Jerusalem when our Lord performed many miracles in their streets. When children perceive that, My father worketh hitherto, and I work, is the law which orders nations and individuals, that my spirit shall not always strive with man, is an awful warning to every people and every person, that to hinder the misdoing, encourage the well-doing of men and nations, is incessant labor, the work of the Father and the Son. To a child who perceives these things, miracles will not be matters of supreme moment, because all life will be for him matter for wonder and adoration. Again, if we wish children to keep clear of all the religious clamors in the air, 
we must help them to understand what religion is. Will religion guarantee me my private and personal happiness? To this, on the whole, I think we must answer no, and if we approach it with a view to such happiness, then most certainly and absolutely no. Quoted from What Religion Is by Bernard Bosonquet. Here is a final and emphatic answer to the quasi-religious offers which are being clamorously pressed upon hesitating souls. Ease of body is offered to these, relief of mind, reparation of loss, even of the final loss when those they love pass away. We may call upon mediums, converse through table wrappings, be healed by faith, faith that is in the power of a healer who manipulates us. Sin is not for us, nor sorrow for sin. We may live in continual odious self-complacency, remote from the anxious, struggling souls about us, because, forsooth, there is no sin, sorrow, anxiety, or pain, if we will that these things shall not be. That is to say, religion will guarantee me my private and personal happiness, will make me immune from every distress and misery of life, and this happy immunity is all a matter within the power of my own will. The person that matters in my religion is myself only. The office of religion for me in such a case is to remove all uneasiness, bodily and spiritual, and to float me into a nirvana of undisturbed self-complacency. We must answer with Professor Bosanquet, absolutely no. True religion will not do this for me, because the final form of the religion that will do these things is idolatry, self-worship, with no intention beyond self. To go on with our quotation, Well, but if not that, then what? We esteem the thing as good and great, but if it simply does nothing for us, how is it to be anything to us? But the answer was the answer to the question, and it might be that to a question sounding but slightly different, a very different answer would be returned. We might ask, for instance, does it make my life more worth living? And the answer to this might be, it is the only thing that makes life worth living at all. In a word, I want, am made for, and must have a God. No doubt, through the sweetness of their faith and love, children have immediate access to God. And what more would we have? Gentle Jesus is about their path and about their bed. Angels minister to them. They enjoy all the immunities of the kingdom. But we may not forget that reason is as active in them as the affections. Towards the end of the last century, people had a straight and easy way of giving a reasonable foundation to a child's belief. All the articles of the Christian faith were supported by a sort of little catechism of scripture proofs. And this method was not without its uses. But today we have to prove the scriptures if we rely upon scripture proofs, and we must change our point of attack. Children must know that we cannot prove any of the great things of life, not even that we ourselves live. But we must rely upon that which we know without demonstration. We know too, and this other certainty must be pressed home to them, that reason, so far from being infallible, is most exceedingly fallible, persuadable, open to influence on this side and that, but is all the same a faithful servant, able to prove whatsoever notion is received by the will. Once we are convinced of the fallibility of our own reason, we are able to detect the fallacies in the reasoning of our opponents, and are not liable to be carried away by every wind of doctrine. Every mother knows how intensely reasonable a child is, and how difficult it is to answer his quite logical and foolishly wrong conclusions. So we need not be deterred from dealing with serious matters with these young neophytes, but only as the occasion occurs. We may not run the risk of boring them with the great questions of life, until it is our business to send them forth assured. We find that, while children are tiresome in arguing about trifling things, often for the mere pleasure of employing their reasoning power, a great many of them are averse to those studies which should, we suppose, give free play to a power that is in them, even if they do not strengthen and develop this power. Yet few children take pleasure in grammar, especially in English grammar, which depends so little on inflection. 
Arithmetic again, mathematics, appeal only to a small percentage of a class or school, and for the rest, however intelligent, its problems are baffling to the end, though they may take delight in reasoning out problems of life in literature or history. Perhaps we should accept this tacit vote of the majority, and cease to put undue pressure upon studies, which would be invaluable did the reasoning power of a child wait upon our training, but are on a different footing when we perceive that children come endowed to the full as much with reason as with love that our business is to provide abundant material upon which this supreme power should work, and that whatever development occurs comes with practice in congenial fields of thought. At the same time, we may not let children neglect either of these delightful studies. The time will come when they will delight in words, the beauty and propriety of words, when they will see that words are consecrated as the vehicle of truth, and are not to be carelessly tampered with in statement or mutilated in form, and we must prepare them for these later studies. Perhaps we should postpone parsing, for instance, until a child is accustomed to weigh sentences for their sense, should let them dally with figures of speech before we attempt minute analysis of sentences, and should reduce our grammatical nomenclature to a minimum. The fact is that children do not generalize, They gather particulars with amazing industry, but hold their impressions fluid, as it were, and we may not hurry them to formulate. If the use of words be a law unto itself, how much more so the language of figures and lines. We remember how instructive and impressive Ruskin is on the thesis that two and two make four, and cannot by any possibility that the universe affords be made to make five or three. From this point of view of immutable law, children should approach mathematics. They should see how impressive is Euclid's, which is absurd, just as absurd as would be the statements of man who said that his apples always fell upwards, and for the same reason. The behavior of figures and lines is like the fall of an apple, fixed by immutable laws, and it is a great thing to begin to see these laws even in their lowest application. The child whose approaches to arithmetic are so many discoveries of the laws which regulate number will not divide fifteen pence among five people and give them each sixpence or ninepence, which is absurd, will convict him, and in time he will perceive that answers are not purely arbitrary, but are to be come at by a little boy's reason. Mathematics are delightful to the mind of man which revels in the perception of law, which may even go forth guessing at a new law until it discover that law. But not every boy can be a champion prize-fighter, nor can every boy stand up to mathematics. Therefore, perhaps the business of teachers is to open as many doors as possible in the belief that mathematics is one out of many studies which make for education, a study by no means accessible to everyone. Therefore it should not monopolize undue time, nor should persons be hindered from useful careers by the fact that they show no great proficiency in studies which are in favor with examiners, no doubt because solutions are final, and work can be adjudged without the tiresome hesitancy and fear of being unjust which beset the examiner's path in other studies. We would send forth children informed by the reason firm, the temperate will, endurance, foresight, strength, and skill. But we must add resolution to our good intentions, and may not expect to produce a reasonable soul of fine polish from the steady friction, say, of mathematical studies only. End of section 9. Read by Jennifer Wilson. Section 10 of home education series volume six this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org home education series volume six towards a philosophy of education by charlotte mason the curriculum we believing that the normal child has powers of mind which fit him to deal with all knowledge proper to him 
give him a full and generous curriculum, taking care only that all knowledge offered to him is vital, that is, that facts are not presented without their informing ideas. Out of this conception comes our principle that education is the science of relations, that is, a child has natural relations with a vast number of things and thoughts, so we train him upon physical exercises, nature, lore, handicrafts, science, and art, and upon many living books, for we know that our business is not to teach him all about anything, but to help him to make valid as many as may be of those first-born affinities that fit our new existence to existing things. In devising a syllabus for a normal child of whatever social class, three points must be considered. A. He requires much knowledge, for the mind needs sufficient food as much as does the body. B. The knowledge should be various for sameness in mental diet does not create appetite, i.e. curiosity. C. Knowledge should be communicated in well-chosen language, because his attention responds naturally to what is conveyed in literary form. As knowledge is not assimilated until it is reproduced, children should tell back after a single reading or hearing, or should write on some part of what they have read. A single reading is insisted on, because children have naturally great power of intention, but this force is dissipated by the rereading of passages, and also by questioning, summarizing, and the like. Acting upon these and some other points in the behavior of mind, we find that the educability of children is enormously greater than has hitherto been supposed, and is but little dependent on such circumstances as heredity and environment. Nor is the accuracy of this statement limited to clever children or to children of the educated classes. Thousands of children in elementary schools respond freely to this method, which is based on the behavior of mind. Few things are more remiss in our schools than the curriculum which is supposed to be entirely at the option of the head. But is it? Most secondary schools work towards examinations which more or less afford the privilege of entry to the universities. The standard to be reached is set by these, and the heads of schools hold themselves powerless. Though elementary schools no longer work with a view to examination results, yet as their best pupils try for scholarships admitting them to secondary schools, they do come indirectly under the same limitations. There is, however, much less liberty in secondary than in primary schools with regard to the subjects taught and the time devoted to each. The result is startling. A boy of eight in an elementary school may show more intelligence and wider knowledge than a boy of fourteen in a preparatory school. That is, if he have been taught on the principles I have in view, while the other boy has been instructed with a view to a given standard of scholarship. The preparatory school boy does, however, reach that standard in Latin, if not in Greek also and in mathematics. If we succeed in establishing a similar standard which every boy and girl of a given age should reach in a liberal range of subjects, a fair chance will be afforded to the average boy and girl, while brilliant or especially industrious young people will go ahead. We labor under the mistake of supposing 
that there is no natural law or inherent principle according to which a child's course of studies should be regulated so we teach him those things which according to locke it is becoming for a gentleman to know on the one hand and on the other the arts of reading writing and summing that he may not grow up an illiterate citizen in both cases the education we offer is to utilitarian an indirect training for the professions or for a craftsman's calling with efforts in the latter case to make a boy's education bear directly on his future work but what if in the very nature of things we find a complete curriculum suggested the human race has lost its title deeds said voltaire and mankind has been going about ever since seeking to recover them education is still at sea and voltaire's epigram holds good we have not found our title deeds and so we yield to the children no inherent claims our highest aim is to educate young people for their uses to society while every faddist is free to teach what he pleases because we have no title deeds to confront him with education no doubt falls under the economic law of supply and demand but the demand should come from the children rather than from teachers and parents how are their demands to become articulate we must give consideration to this question because the answer depends on a survey of the composite whole we sum up as human nature a whole whose possibilities are infinite and various not only in the budding genius the child of a distinguished family but in every child of the streets a small english boy of nine living in japan remarked isn't it fun mother learning all these things everything seems to fit into something else the boy had not found out the whole secret everything fitted into something within himself the days have gone by when the education befitting either a gentleman or an artisan was our aim now we must deal with a child of man who has a natural desire to know the history of his race and of his nation what men thought in the past and are thinking now the best thoughts of the best minds taking form as literature and at its highest as poetry or as poetry rendered in the plastic forms of art as a child of god whose supreme desire and glory it is to know about and to know his almighty father as a person of many parts and passions who must know how to use care for and discipline himself body mind and soul as a person of many relationships to family city church state neighboring states the world at large as the inhabitant of a world full of beauty and interest the features of which he must recognize and know how to name and a world too and a universe whose every function of every part is ordered by laws which he must begin to know it is a wide program founded on the educational rights of man wide but we may not say it is impossible nor may we pick and choose and educate him in this direction but not in that we may not even make choice between science and the humanities our part it seems to me is to give a child a vital hold upon as many as possible of those wide relationships proper to him shelley offers us the key to education when he speaks of understanding that grows bright gazing on many truths because the relationships a child is born to are very various 
the knowledge we offer him must be various too a lady teaching in cape colony writes the papers incorporated in the pamphlet a liberal education practice by a c drury testify to to me an almost incredible standard of proficiency the mistakes are just the kind of mistakes that children should make and no more of them than just enough to keep them from being priggish there are none of those howlers of fact or expression that make one view one's efforts with a feeling of utter despondency the knowledge of children so taught is consecutive intelligent and complete as far as it goes in however many directions for it is a mistake to suppose that the greater the number of subjects the greater the scholars labor the contrary is the case as the variety in itself affords refreshment and the child who has written thirty or forty sheets during an examination week comes out unfagged not the number of subjects but the hours of work bring fatigue to the scholar and bearing this in mind we have short hours and no evening preparation end of section ten section eleven of home education series volume six this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org read by cindy smith home education series volume six towards a philosophy of education by charlotte mason the curriculum section eleven the knowledge of god of the three sorts of knowledge proper to a child the knowledge of god of man and of the universe the knowledge of god ranks first in importance is indispensable and most happy making mothers are on the whole more successful in communicating this knowledge than our teachers who know the children less well and have a narrower poorer standard of measurement for their minds parents do not talk down to children but we might gather from educational publications that the art of education as regards young children is to bring conceptions down to their quote-unquote little minds if we give up this foolish prejudice in favor of the grown-up we shall be astonished at the range and depth of children's minds and shall perceive that their relation to god is one of those quote-unquote first-born affinities which it is our part to help them to make good a mother knows how to speak of god as she would of an absent father with all the evidences of his care and love about her and his children she knows how to make a child's heart beat high in joy and thankfulness as she thrills him with the thought quote, my father made them all end quote, while his eye delights in flowery meadow great tree flowing river quote, his are the mountains and the valleys his and the resplendent rivers whose eyes they fill with tears of holy joy end quote. and this is not beyond children we recollect how quote unquote, arthur pendennis walked in the evening light with his mother and recited great passages from milton and the eyes of the two were filled quote, with tears of holy joy end quote, when the boy was eight the teacher of a class has not the same tender opportunities, but if he take pains to get a just measure of children's minds, it is surprising how much may be done. The supercilious point of view adopted by some teachers is the cause of the small achievements of their scholars. The quote-unquote kiddies in the big girl's school are not expected to understand and know, and they live down to the expectations formed of them we of the p n e u begin the definite quote-unquote school education of children when they are six they are no doubt capable of beginning a year or two earlier but the fact is that nature and circumstances have provided such a wide field of education for young children that it seems better to abstain from requiring 
direct intellectual efforts until they have arrived at that age. As for all the teaching in the nature of, quote, told to the children, end quote, most children get their share of that, whether in the infant school or at home. But this is practically outside the sphere of that part of education, which demands a conscious mental effort from the scholar, the mental effort of telling again that which has been read or heard. That is how we all learn. We tell again to ourselves, if need be, the matter we wish to retain, the sermon, the lecture, the conversation. The method is as old as the mind of man. The distressful fact is that it has been made so little use of in general education. Let us hear Dr. Johnson on the subject. Quote, Little people should be encouraged always to tell whatever they hear particularly striking to some brother, sister, or servant immediately before the impression is erased by the intervention of newer occurrences. End quote. He perfectly remembered the first time he heard of heaven and hell because when his mother had made out such a description of both places as she thought likely to seize the attention of her infant auditor, who was then in bed with her, she got up and dressing him before the usual time, sent him directly to call the favorite workman in the house to whom she knew he would communicate the conversation while it was yet impressed upon his mind. The event was what she wished, and it was to that method chiefly that he owed the uncommon felicity of remembering distant occurrences and long past conversations. End quote. Mrs. Piazzi. Now, our objective in this most important part of education is to give the children the knowledge of God. We need not go into the question of intuitive knowledge, but the expressed knowledge attainable by us has its source in the Bible. And perhaps we cannot do a greater indignity to children than to substitute our own or some other benevolent person's rendering for the fine English, poetic diction, and lucid statement of the Bible. Literature at its best is always direct and simple, and a normal child of six listens with delight to the tales both of Old and New Testament, read to him passage by passage, and by him narrated in turn with delightful touches of native eloquence. Religion has two aspects, the attitude of the will towards God, which we understand by Christianity, and that perception of God which comes from a gradual, slow-growing comprehension of the divine dealings with men. In the first of these senses, Guta was never religious, but the second forms the green, reposeful background to a restless and uneasy life, and it is worthwhile to consider how he arrived at so infinitely desirable a possession. He gives us the whole history fully in Aus meinem Leben, a treatise on education very well worth our study. There he says, quote, Man may turn where he will, he may undertake what he will, but he will yet return to that road which Dante has laid down for him. So it happened to me in the present case. My efforts with the language. End quote. Hebrew when he was ten. Quote, with the contents of the Holy Scriptures resulted in a most lively presentation to my imagination of that beautiful much sung land and of the countries which bordered it as well as of the people and events which have glorified that spot of earth for thousands of years. Perhaps someone may ask why I set forth here in such detail this universally known history, so often repeated and expounded. This answer may serve that in no other way could I show how, with the distractions of my life and my regular education, I concentrated my mind and my emotion on one point, because I can in no other way account for the peace which enveloped me, however disturbed and unusual the circumstances of my life. If an ever-active imagination, of which the story of my life may bear witness, led me here and there, if the medley of fable, history, mythology threatened to drive me to distraction, I betook myself again to those morning lands, I buried myself in the five books of Moses, and there, amongst the wide-spreading shepherd people, I found the greatest solitude and the greatest comfort. End quote. 
It is well to know how Guta obtained this repose of soul, this fresh background for his thoughts, and in all the errors of a willful life, this innermost repose appears never to have left him. His eyes, we are told, were tranquil as those of a god, and here is revealed the secret of that large tranquility. Here, too, Guta unfolds for us a principle of education which those who desire their children to possess the passive as well as the active principle of religion would do well to consider. For it is probably true that the teaching of the New Testament, not duly grounded upon or accompanied by that of the Old, fails to result in such thought of God, wide, all-embracing, all-permeating, as David, for example, gives constant expression to in the Psalms. Let us have faith and courage to give children such a full and gradual picture of Old Testament history that they unconsciously perceive for themselves a panoramic view of the history of mankind, typified by that of the Jewish nation, as it is unfolded in the Bible. Are our children little skeptics, as was the young Guta, who take a laughing joy in puzzling their teachers with a hundred difficulties? Like that wise old Dr. Albrecht, let us be in no haste to explain. Let us not try to put down or evade their questions, or to give them final answers, but introduce them, as did he, to some thoughtful commentator who weighs difficult questions with modesty and scrupulous care. If we act in this way, difficulties will assume their due measure of importance. That is to say, they will be lost sight of in the gradual unfolding of the great scheme whereby the world was educated, I know of no commentator for children, say from 6 to 12, better than Canon Patterson Smythe, The Bible for the Young. He is one of the few writers able to take the measure of children's minds to help them over real difficulties, give impulse to their thoughts, and direction to their conduct. Between the ages of 6 and 12, children cover the whole of the Old Testament story, the prophets, major and minor, being introduced as they come into connection with the kings. The teacher opens the lesson by reading the passage from the Bible for the Young, in which the subject is pictorially treated. For example, quote, It is the battlefield of the Valley of Ella. The camp of Israel is on one slope, the big tents of the Philistines on the other. The Israelites are rather small men, lithe and clever. The Philistines are big men, big, stupid, thick-headed giants, the same as when Samson used to fool them and laugh at them long ago. There is great excitement on both sides, end quote, etc. There will be probably some talk and discussion after this reading. Then the teacher will read the Bible passage in question, which the children will narrate, the commentary serving merely as a background for their thoughts. The narration is usually exceedingly interesting. The children do not miss a point and often add picturesque touches of their own. Before the close of the lesson, the teacher brings out such new thoughts of God or new points of behavior as the reading has afforded, emphasizing the moral or religious lesson to be learnt, rather by a reverent and sympathetic manner than by any attempt at personal application. Forms 3 and 4, 12 to 15, read for themselves the whole of the Old Testament as produced by the Reverend H. Costly White in his Old Testament history. Wise and necessary omissions in this work make it more possible to deal with Old Testament history in the words of the authorized version than if the Bible were used as a single volume. Then, quote, each period is illustrated by reference to contemporary literature, e.g. prophets, and psalms and monuments, end quote. Again, quote, brief historical explanations and general commentary are inserted in their proper places, end quote. For example, after Genesis 3, we read as an introduction to the story of Cain and Abel, quote, 
The original object of this story was to explain the development of sin amongst mankind and the origin of homicide, which in this first instance was actual murder. There are difficulties in the story which do not admit of satisfactory explanation. It may be asked, quote, why did God not accept Cain's offering? How was his displeasure shewn? What was the sign appointed for Cain? Whom did he marry? End quote. The best way to answer such questions is to admit that we do not know, but we may add that these early stories are only a selection which do not necessarily form a consistent and complete whole, and that in this very case there are signs that the original story has been cut down and edited. Quote, Among the lessons taught are the following. 1. God judges man's motives rather than his acts. The service of the heart is worth more than any ceremonial. 2. It is not the sin of murder that is condemned so much as the sin of jealousy and malice. C.F. The Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 21, 6. 3. The great doctrine of the brotherhood of man, that each man is his brother's keeper and has his share of responsibility for the conditions of the lives of others. 4. Sin always brings its own punishment. 5. God remonstrates with man before the climax of sin is reached. The footnotes which form the only commentary upon the text are commendably short and to the point. Having received a considerable knowledge of the Old Testament in detail from the words of the Bible itself, and having been trained to accept difficulties freely without giving place to the notion that such difficulties invalidate the Bible as the oracle of God and our sole original source of knowledge concerning the nature of Almighty God and the manner of his government of the world, children are prepared for a further study of divinity still following the Bible text. When pupils are of an age to be in Forms 5 and 6, from 15 to 18, we find that Damelo's one-volume Bible commentary is of great service. It is designed to provide in convenient form, quote, a brief explanation of the meaning of the scriptures. Introductions have been supplied to the various books and notes, which will help to explain the principal difficulties, textual, moral, or doctrinal, which may arise in connection with them. A series of articles has also been prefixed dealing with the larger questions suggested by the Bible as a whole. It is hoped that the commentary may lead to a perusal of many of the books of Holy Scripture, which are often left unread in spite of their rare literary charm and abundant usefulness for the furtherance of the spiritual life. In recent years, much light has been thrown upon questions of authorship and interpretation, and the contributors to this volume have endeavored to incorporate in it the most assured results of modern scholarship, whilst avoiding opinions of an extreme or precarious kind. Sometimes these results differ from traditional views, but in such cases it is not only hoped but believed that the student will find the spiritual value and authority of the Bible have been enhanced rather than diminished by the change. The editor has, in these words, set forth so justly the aims of the commentary that I need only say we find it of very great practical value. The pupils read the general articles and the introductions to the separate books. They read, too, the prophets and the poetical books with the notes supplied. Thus, they leave school with a fairly enlightened knowledge of the books of the Old Testament and of the aids modern scholarship has brought towards their interpretation. We hope also with increased reverence for and delight in the ways of God with men. The New Testament comes under another category. The same commentaries are used and the same methods followed, that is, the reverent reading of the text with the following narration, which is often curiously word-perfect after a single reading. This is the more surprising because we all know how difficult it is to repeat a passage which we have heard a thousand times. The single, attentive reading does away with this difficulty, and we are able to assure ourselves that children's minds are stored with perfect word pictures of every tender and beautiful scene described in the Gospels. 
and are able to reproduce the austere, if equally tender teaching, which enforces the object lessons of the miracles. By degrees, the person of our Lord, as revealed in his words and his works, becomes real and dear to them, not through emotional appeals, but through the impression left by accurate and detailed knowledge concerning the Savior of the world, who went about doing good. Dogmatic teaching finds its way to them by inference through a quiet realization of the Bible records, and loyalty to a divine master is likely to become the guiding principle of their lives. I should like to urge the importance of what may be called a poetic presentation of the life and teaching of our Lord. The young reader should experience in this study a curious and delightful sense of harmonious development, of the rounding out of each incident, of the progressive unfolding which characterizes our Lord's teaching. And let me say here, the custom of narration lends itself surprisingly to this sort of poetic insight. Every related incident stands out in a sort of base relief. Every teaching so rendered unfolds its meaning. Every argument convinces. And the personages reveal themselves to us more intimately than almost any persons we know in real life. Probably very little hortatory teaching is desirable. The danger of boring young listeners by such teaching is great. And there is also the further danger of provoking counter-opinions, even counter-convictions, in the innocent-looking audience. On the whole, we shall perhaps do well to allow the scripture reading itself to point the moral. Quote, we are at present in a phase of religious thought, Christian and pseudo-Christian, when a synthetic study of the life and teaching of Christ may well be of use. We have analyzed until the mind turns in weariness from the broken fragments. We have criticized until there remains no new standpoint for the critic. But if we could only get a whole conception of Christ's life among men and of the philosophic method of his teaching, his own words should be fulfilled, and the Son of Man lifted up would draw all men unto himself. It seems to me that verse offers a comparatively new medium in which to present the great theme. It is more impersonal more condensed, is capable of more reverent handling than his prose, and what Wordsworth calls the quote-unquote authentic comment may be essayed in verse with more becoming diffidence. Again, the supreme moment of a very great number of lives, that in which a person is brought face to face with Christ, comes before us with great vividness in the gospel narratives. And it is possible to treat what we may call dramatic situations with more force and at the same time with more reticence in verse than in prose. Quote, we have a single fragment of the great epic which the future may bring forth. Those holy fields over whose acres walked those blessed feet, which 1400 years ago were nailed for our advantage to the bitter cross. If Shakespeare had given us the whole, how rich should we be, every line of verse dealing directly with our Lord from the standpoint of his personality is greatly treasured. We love the lines in which Trench tells us of Jesus sitting by Samarian well or teaching some poor fishers on the shore. And Kebbles, meanwhile, he paces through the adoring crowd, calm as the march of some majestic cloud, or his in his meek power, he climbs the mountain's brow. Every line of such verse is precious, but the lines are few, no doubt, because the subject is supremely august. Meantime, we are waiting for the great epic, because the need seems to be urgent, the writer has ventured to offer a temporary stopgap in the six volumes of The Savior of the World, end quote, from the preface to the first volume. A girl of thirteen and a half Form 4, in her Easter examination, tackled the question, quote, The people sat in darkness, dot, 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 I am the light of the world, end quote. Show as far as you can the meaning of these statements. She was not asked to write in verse, and was she not taught by a beautiful instinct to recognize that the phrases she had to deal with were essential poetry, 
and that she could best express herself in verse. Quote, the people sat in darkness. All was dim. No light had yet come unto them from him. No hope as yet of heaven after life. A peaceful haven far from war and strife. Some warriors to Valhalla's halls might go and fight all day and die at evening low. They'd wake again and drink in the great hall. Some men would sleep forever at their fall or with their fickle gods forever be, so all was dark and dim, poor heathens, see. The light ahead, the clouds that roll away, the golden, glorious dawning of the day, and in the birds, the flowers, the sunshine, see the might of him who calls, come unto me. End quote. A girl of 17, Form 5, answered the question, write an essay or a poem on the bread of life by the following lines. Quote, How came he here? Even so, the people cried, who found him in the temple. He had wrought a miracle and fed the multitude on five small loaves and fish, so now they'd have him king. Should not they then have every good food that they toiled not for and clothes and care and all the comfort that they could require? So thinking sought the king. Our Savior cried, Labor ye not for meat that perisheth, but rather for the everlasting bread which I will give. Where is this bread, they cry? They know not tis a heavenly bread he gives, but seek for earthly food. I am the bread of life, and all who come to me I feed with bread. Receive ye then the bread. Your fathers eat of manna in the wilderness and died. But whoso eats this bread shall have his part in everlasting life. I am the bread that cometh down from heaven. Unless ye eat of me, ye die, but otherwise ye live. So Jesus taught in Galilee long since. The people murmured when they heard his word, How can it be? How can he be our bread? They hardened then their hearts against his word. They would not hear and could not understand, and so they turned back to easier ways, and many of them walked with him no more. May he grant now that we may hear the word and harden not our hearts against the truth that Jesus came to teach, so that in vain he may not cry to hearts that will not hear, I am the bread of life, for all that come I have this gift, an everlasting life, and room within my heavenly Father's house. End quote. The higher forms in the PUS read The Savior of the World, volume by volume, together with the text arranged in chronological order. The lower forms read in turns each of the synoptic Gospels. Form 4 adds the Gospel of St. John and the Acts, assisted by the capital commentaries on the several Gospels by Bishop Walsham Howe, published by the SPCK. The study of the epistles and the book of Revelation is confined for the most part to forms 5 and 6. The catechism, prayer book, and church history are treated with suitable textbooks much in the same manner and give opportunities for such summing up of Christian teaching as is included in the so-called dogmas of the church. We find that Sundays, together with the time given to preparation for confirmation, afford sufficient opportunities for this teaching. End of section 11. Section 12 of Home Education, Series Volume 6. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Home Education, Series Volume 6, Towards a Philosophy of Education, by Charlotte Mason. The Curriculum, Section 2, The Knowledge of Man, History. I have already spoken of history as a vital part of education and have cited the Council of Montaigne that the teacher shall by the help of histories inform himself of the worthiest minds that were in the best ages. To us in particular, who are living in one of the great epics of history, it is necessary to know something of what has gone before in order to think justly of what is occurring today. The League of Nations, for example, has reminded us not only of the Congress of Vienna, but of the several treaties of perpetual peace 
which have marked the history of Europe. It is still true that things done without example in their issue are to be feared. Have you a precedent of this commission? Henry the Eighth. We applaud the bluff king's wisdom and look uneasily for precedents for the war and the peace and the depressing anxieties that have come in their train. We are conscious of a lack of sound judgment in ourselves to decide upon the questions that have come before us and are aware that nothing would give us more confidence than a pretty wide acquaintance with history. The more educated among our Dominion cousins complain that their young people have no background of history, and as a consequence, we are the people, is their master thought. They would face even the loss of Westminster Abbey without a qualm. What is it to them where great events have happened, great persons lived and moved? And, alas, this indifference to history is not confined to the dominions. Young people at home are equally indifferent nor have the elders such stories of interest and information as should quicken children with the knowledge that always and everywhere there have been great parts to play, and almost always great men to play those parts, that any day it may come to anyone to do some service of historical moment to the country. It is not too much to say that a rational, well-considered patriotism depends on a pretty copious reading of history. And with this rational patriotism, we desire our young people shall be informed rather than with the jingoism of the emotional patriot. If there is but little knowledge of history amongst us, no doubt our schools are in fault. Teachers will plead that there is no time to save for a sketchy knowledge of English history given in the course of lectures of which the pupils take notes and work up reports. Most of us know how unsatisfying is such a course, however entertaining. Not even Thackeray could introduce the stuff of knowledge into his lectures on the Four Georges. Our knowledge of history should give us something more than impressions and opinions, but alas, the lack of time is a real difficulty. Now the method I am advocating has this advantage. It multiplies time. Each school period is quadrupled in time value, and we find that we get through a surprising amount of history in a thorough way. And about the same time that in most schools affords no more than a skeleton of English history only. We know that young people are enormously interested in the subject, and give concentrated attention if we give them the right books. We are aware that our own discursive talk is usually a waste of time and a strain on the scholar's attention. So we of the PNEU confine ourselves to affording two things, knowledge and a keen sympathy in the interest roused by that knowledge. It is our part to see that every child knows and can tell whether by way of oral narrative or written essay. In this way, an unusual amount of ground is covered with such certainty that no revision is required for the examination at the end of the term. A single reading is a condition insisted upon because a naturally desultory habit of mind leads us all to put off the effort of attention as long as a second or third chance of coping with our subject is to be hoped for. It is, however, a mistake to speak of the effort of attention. Complete and entire attention is a natural function which requires no effort and causes no fatigue. The anxious labor of mind, of which we are at times aware, comes when attention wanders and has again to be brought to the point. But the concentration at which most teachers aim is an innate provision for education and is not the result of training or effort. Our concern is to afford matter of a sufficiently literary character, together with the certainty that no second or third opportunity for knowing a given lesson will be allowed. The personality of the teacher is no doubt of much value, but perhaps this value is intellectual rather than emotional. The perception of the teacher is keenly interested, 
that his mind and their minds are working in harmony is a wonderful incentive to young scholars. But the sympathetic teacher who believes that to attend is a strain, who makes allowance for the hundred wandering fantasies that beset a child, whom he has at last to pull up with effort, tiring to teacher and pupil, hinders in his good-natured efforts to help. The child of six in 1B has, not stories from English history, but a definite quantity of consecutive reading, say, 40 pages in a term, from a well-written, well-considered large volume, which is also well-illustrated. Children cannot, of course, themselves read a book which is by no means written down to the child's level, so the teacher reads and the children tell paragraph by paragraph, passage by passage. The teacher does not talk much and is careful never to interrupt a child who is called upon to tell. The first efforts may be stumbling, but presently the children get into their stride and tell a passage at length with surprising fluency. The teacher probably allows other children to correct any faults in the telling when it is over. The teacher's own really difficult part is to keep up sympathetic interest by look and occasional word, by remarks upon a passage that has been narrated, by occasionally showing pictures, and so on. But you will bear in mind that the child of six has begun the serious business of his education, that it does not matter much whether he understands this word or that, but that it matters a great deal that he should learn to deal directly with books. Whatever a child or grown-up person can tell, that we may be sure he knows, and what he cannot tell, he does not know. Possibly this practice of telling was more used in the 16th and 17th centuries than it is now. We remember how three gentlemen meet in Henry the Eighth, and one who has just come out of the abbey from witnessing the coronation of Anne Boleyn is asked to tell the others about it which he does with the vividness and accuracy we obtain from children. In this case, no doubt, the telling was a stage device, but would it have been adopted if such narration were not commonly practiced? Even in our own day, a good raconteur is a welcome guest, and a generation or two ago, the art was studied as a part of gentlemanly equipment. The objection occurs that such a social accomplishment is unnecessary for children and is a mere exercise of memory. Now a passage to be memorized requires much conning, much repetition, and meanwhile the learners are thinking about other matters. That is, the mind is not at work in the act of memorizing. To read a passage with full attention and to tell it afterwards has a curiously different effect Monsieur Bergson makes the happy distinction between word memory and mind memory, which once the force of it is realized, should bring about sweeping changes in our methods of education. Trusting to mind memory, we visualize the scene, are convinced by the arguments, take pleasure in the turn of the sentences, and frame our own upon them. In fact, that particular passage or chapter has been received into us and become a part of us, just as literally as was yesterday's dinner. Nay, more so, for yesterday's dinner is of little account tomorrow, but several months, perhaps years hence, we shall be able to narrate the passage we had, so to say, consumed and grown upon with all the vividness, detail, and accuracy of the first telling. All those powers of the mind, which we call faculties, have been brought into play in dealing with the intellectual matter thus afforded. So we may not ask questions to help the children to reason, paint fancy pictures to help him to imagine, draw up moral lessons to quicken his conscience. These things take place as involuntarily as processes of digestion. Children of seven are promoted to form 1A, in which they remain for a couple of years. They read from the same capital book, Mrs. Marshall's 
our island story and about the same number of pages in a term. But while the reading in 1B are confined to the first third of the book, embodying the simpler and more direct histories, those in 1A go on to the end of the volume, and children learn at any rate to love English history. I'd have soon I have history than my dinner, said a sturdy boy of seven, by no means inclined to neglect his dinner. In 1A, the history is amplified and illustrated by short biographies of persons connected with the period studied. Lord Clive, Nelson, etc., and Mrs. Frewen Lord's delightful tales from Westminster Abbey and from St. Paul's help the children immensely in individualizing their heroes. It is good to hear them tell of Franklin, Nelson, Howard, Shaftesbury, and their delight in visiting the monuments is very great. One would not think that Dunn would greatly interest children, but the excitement of a small party in noticing the marks of the great fire still to be seen on his monument was illuminating to lookers-on. Possibly there is no sounder method of inculcating a sane and serviceable patriotism than this of making children familiar with the monuments of the great, even if they have not had the opportunity to see them. Form 2, ages 9 to 12, have a more considerable historical program, which they cover with ease and enjoyment. They use a more difficult book than in 1A, an interesting and well-written history of England, of which they read some 50 pages or so in a term. 2A read in addition, and by way of illustration, the chapters dealing with the social life of the period in a volume, treating of social life in England. We introduce children as early as possible to the contemporary history of other countries, as the study of English history alone is apt to lead to a certain insular and arrogant habit of mind. Naturally, we begin with French history, and both divisions read from the first history of France. Very well written. The chapters contemporary with the English history they are reading. The readiness with which children write or tell of Richelieu, Colbert, Baird, justifies us in this early introduction of foreign history, and the lucidity and clearness with which the story is told. In the book, they use results on the part of the children in such a knowledge of the history of France, as throws light on that of their own country, and certainly gives them the sense that history was progressing everywhere, much as it was at home during the period they are reading about. The study of ancient history, which cannot be contemporaneous, we approach through a chronologically arranged book about the British Museum, written for the scholars of the PUS by the late Mrs. W. Epps, who had the delightful gift of realizing the progress of the ages as represented in our great national storehouse. I have already instanced a child's visit to the Parthenon Room, and her eager identification of what she saw with what she had read, and that will serve to indicate the sort of key to ancient history afforded by this valuable book. Miss G. M. Bernal has added to the value of these studies by producing a book of centuries, in which children draw such illustrations as they come across of objects of domestic use, of art, etc., connected with the century they are reading about. This slight study of the British Museum we find very valuable. Whether the children have or have not the opportunity of visiting the museum itself, they have the hope of doing so. And besides, their minds are awakened to the treasures of local museums. In Form 3, children continue the same history of England as in 2, the same French history and the same British Museum book, going on with their book of centuries. To this they add about 20 to 30 pages a term from a little book on Indian history, a subject which interests them greatly. Slight studies of the history of other parts of the British Empire are included under geography. In Form 4, the children are promoted to Gardner's Students' History of England, 
clear, and able, but somewhat stiffer than that they have hitherto been engaged upon, together with Mr. and Mrs. Quinnell's History of Everyday Things in England, which is used in Form 3 also. Form 4 is Introduced Outlines of European History. The British Museum for Children and Book of Centuries are continued. It is, as teachers know, a matter of extreme difficulty to find the exactly right book for children's reading in each subject, and for some years we have been regretting the fact that Lord's very delightful modern Europe has been out of print. The history studies of Forms 5 and 6, ages 15 to 18, are more advanced and more copious and depend for illustration upon readings in the literature of the period. Green's Shorter History of the English People is the textbook in English history. Amplified, for example, by Macaulay's Essays on Frederick the Great and the Austrian Succession on Pitt and Clive. For the same period, we use an American history of Western Europe and a very admirable history of France, well translated from the original of Monsieur Doré, possibly Madame de Stael's La Lamaine, or some other historical work of equal caliber, may occur in their reading of French. It is not possible to continue the study of Greek and Roman history in detail, but an admirably written survey, informed with enthusiasm, is afforded by Professor de Berg's The Legacy of the Ancient World. The pupils make history charts for every hundred years on the plan either adapted or invented by the late Miss Beale of Cheltenham, a square ruled into a hundred spaces, ten in each direction, with a symbol in each square showing an event which lends itself to illustration during that particular ten years. Thus crossed battle axes represent a war. The geographical aspects of history fall under geography as a subject. This course of historical reading is valued exceedingly by young people as affording a knowledge of the best that bears upon and illuminates the present. The writer recollects meeting a brilliant group of Oxford undergraduates, keen and full of interest, but lamentably ignorant, who said, we want to know something about history. What do you advise us to read? We know nothing. Perhaps no youth should go to college without some rudimentary course of English, European, and especially French history, as is afforded by the programs. Such a general survey should precede any special course and should be required before the more academic studies designed to prepare students for research work. It will be observed that the work throughout the forms is always chronologically progressive, the young student really goes over old ground. But should it happen that the whole school has arrived at the end of 1920, say, and there is nothing for it but to begin again, the books studied throw no light and bring the young students into line with modern research. But any sketch of the history teaching in Forms 5 and 6 in a period given depends upon the notice of the literature set. For plays, novels, essays, lives, poems are all pressed into service, and where it is possible, the architecture, painting, etc., which the period produced. Thus questions such as the following on a term's work both test and record the reading of the term. Describe the condition of A, the clergy, B, the army, C, the navy, D, the general public, in and about 1685. Trace the rise of Prussia before Frederick the Great. What theories of government were held by Louis the Fourteenth? Give some account of his great ministers. Describe the rise of Russia in its condition at the opening of the 18th century. Suppose Evelyn, Form 6, or Pepys, Form 5, in council at the League of Nations, Write his diary for three days. Sketch the character and manners of Addison. How does he appear in Esmond? It is a great thing to possess a pageant of history in the background of one's thoughts. 
we may not be able to recall this or that circumstance, but the imagination is warmed. We know that there is a great deal to be said on both sides of every question, and are saved from crudities in opinion and rashness in action. The present becomes enriched for us with the wealth of all that has gone before. Perhaps the gravest defect in school curricula is that they fail to give a comprehensive, intelligent, and interesting introduction to history. To leave off or even to begin with the history of our own country is fatal. We cannot live sanely unless we know that other peoples are as we are with a difference, that their history is as ours with a difference that they too have been represented by their poets and their artists, that they too have their literature and their national life. We have been asleep and our waking is rather terrible. The people from whom we have not taught rise upon us in their ignorance and the rabble. As the world were now, but to begin, antiquity forgot, custom not known, they cry, choose we, Hamlet. Heaven help their choice for choosing is indeed with them, and little do they know of those two ratifiers and props of every present word and action, antiquity and custom. It is never too late to mend, but we may not delay to offer such a liberal and generous diet of history to every child in the country as shall give weight to his decisions, consideration to his actions, and stability to his conduct. That stability, the lack of which has plunged us into many a stormy sea of unrest. It is to be noted that stability is the mark of the educated classes. When we reflect upon the disturbance of the national life by labor unrest, and again upon the fact that political and social power is passing into the hands of the majority, that is of the laboring classes. We cannot but feel that there is a divine fitness, a providential adaptation in the circumstance that the infinite educability of persons of all classes should be disclosed to us as a nation at a time when an emotional and ignorant laboring class is a peculiar danger. I am not sure that the education implied in the old symbol of the latter does make for national tranquility. It is right that equal opportunity of being first should be afforded to all, but that is no new thing. Our history is punctuated by men who have risen, and the Roman Church has largely founded herself, as has the Chinese Empire, upon this doctrine of equal opportunity. But let us remember that the men who climb are apt to be uneasy members of society. The desire for knowledge for its own sake, on the other hand, find satisfaction in knowledge itself. The young men see visions. The hardships of daily life are ameliorated, and while an alert and informed mind leads to decency and propriety of living, it does not lead to the restless desire to subvert society for the sake of the chances offered by a general upheaval. Wordsworth is right. If rightly trained and bred, humanity is humble. We live in times critical for everybody, but eminently critical for teachers, because it rests with them to decide whether personal or general good should be aimed at, whether education shall be merely a means of getting on or a means of general progress towards high thinking and plain living, and therefore an instrument of the greatest national good. End of section 12. Section 13 of Home Education Series, Volume 6. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Home Education Series, Volume 6. Towards a Philosophy of Education by Charlotte Mason The Curriculum, Section 2 The Knowledge of Man, Literature Except in Form 1, the study of literature goes pari passu 
with that of history. Fairy tales, Anderson or Grimm, for example, delight Form 1B, and the little people retell these tales copiously, vividly, and with the astonishing exactness we may expect when we remember how seriously annoyed they are with the storyteller who alters a phrase or a circumstance. Aesop's fables, too, are used with great success and are rendered after being once heard with brevity and point, and children readily appropriate the moral. Mrs. Gaddy's Parables from Nature, again, serve another purpose. They feed a child's sense of wonder and are very good to tell. There is no attempt to reduce the work of this form or any other to a supposed child level. Form 1A, 7 to 9, he is and tells chapter by chapter the pilgrim's progress, and the children's narrations are delightful. No beautiful thought or bold figure escapes them. Andrew Lang's Tales of Troy and Greece, a big volume, is a fiesta de resistance, going on from term to term. The great tales of the heroic age find their way to children's hearts. They conceive vividly and tell eagerly, and the difficult classical names, instead of being a stumbling block, are a delight, because, as a master of a council school says, children have an instinctive power by which they are able to sense the meaning of a whole passage and even some difficult words. That the sonorous beauty of these classical names appeals to them is illustrated by a further quotation from the same master. A boy of about seven in my school the other day asked his mother why she had not given him one of those pretty names they heard in the stories at school. He thought Ulysses, a prettier name than his own, Kenneth, and that the mother of his playmate might have called him Achilles instead of Alan. There is profound need to cultivate delight in beautiful names and days when we are threatened with the fear that London itself should lose that rich halo of historic associations, which glorifies its every street and alley, that it may be made like New York, and should name a street X-500, like a workhouse child without designation, an age when we express the glory and beauty of the next highest peak of the Himalayas by naming it D-2. In such an age as this, of their inherent aptitude for beautiful names is a load of much promise in children's minds. The Kaffir who announced that his name was Telephone had an ear for sound. Kingsley's Water Babies, Alice in Wonderland, Kipling's Just So Stories, scores of exquisite classics written for children, but not written down to them, are suitable at this stage. Form 2B has a considerable program of reading, that is, not the mere mechanical exercise of reading, but the reading of certain books. Therefore, it is necessary that two years should be spent in Form 1A, and that in the second of these two years, the children should read a good deal of the set work for themselves. In 2B, they read their own geography, history, poetry, but perhaps Shakespeare's Twelfth Night, say. Scott's, Rob Roy, Gulliver's Travels should be read to them and narrated by them until they are well in their tenth year. Their power to understand, visualize, and tell a play of Shakespeare from nine years old and onwards is very surprising. They put in nothing which is not there, but they miss nothing and display a passage or a scene in a sort of curious relief one or two books of the caliber of the heroes of Asgard, are also included in the program for the term. The transition to Form 2A is marked by more individual reading as well as by a few additional books. The children read their Shakespeare play in character. Certain council schoolboys, we are told, insist on dramatizing Scott as they read it. Bullfinch's Age of Fable admits them to the rich imaginings of peoples who did not yet know. Goldsmith's poems and Stevenson's Kidnapped, etc., may form part of a term's work, and in each and all, 
Children show the same surprising power of knowing, evinced by the one sure test. They are able to tell each work they have read not only with accuracy, but with spirit and originality. How is it possible, it may be asked, to show originality in mere narration? Let us ask Scott, Shakespeare, Homer, who told what they knew, that is narrated, but with continual scintillations from their own genius playing upon the written word. Just so in their small degree do the children narrate. They see it also vividly, that when you read or hear their versions, the theme is illuminated for you too. Children remain informed too until they are twelve, and here I would remark on the evenness with which the power of children in dealing with books is developed. We spread an abundant and delicate feast in the programs, and each small guest assimilates what he can. The child of genius and imagination gets greatly more than his duller comrade, but all sit down to the same feast, and each one gets according to his needs and powers. The surprises afforded by the dull and even the backward children are encouraging and illuminating. We think we know that man is an educable being, but when we afford to children all that they want, we discover how straitened were our views, how poor and narrow the education we offered. Even in so-called deficient children, we perceive. What a piece of work is man, in apprehension, how like a god. In Forms 3 and 4, we introduce a history of English literature, carefully chosen to avoid sympathetic interest and delight while avoiding stereotyped opinions and stale information. The portion read each term, say 50 pages, corresponds with the period covered in history studies, and the book is a great favorite with children. They have, of course, a great flair for Shakespeare, whether King Lear, Twelfth Night, Henry V, or some other play, and the Waverleys usually afford a contemporary tale. There has been discussion in elementary schools as to whether an abridged edition would not give a better chance of getting through the novels set for a term. But strong arguments were brought forward at a conference of teachers in Gloucester in favor of a complete edition. Children take pleasure in the dry parts, descriptions and the like, rendering these quite beautifully in their narrations. Form 4 may have quite a wide course of reading. For instance, if the historical period for a term include the Commonwealth, they may read L'Allegro and Il Penseroso, Lycidas, and contemporary poets as represented in good anthology, or, for a later period, Pope's Rape of the Lock, or Gray's Poems. Of Form 3, read poems of Goldsmith and Burns. The object of children's literature studies is not to give them precise information as to who wrote what in the reign of whom, but to give them a sense of the spaciousness of the days, not only of great Elizabeth, but of all those times of which poets, historians, and the makers of tales have left us living pictures. In such ways, the children secure not the sort of information which is of little cultural value, but wide spaces where in imagination may take those holiday excursions deprived of which life is dreary. Judgment, too, will turn over those folios of the mind and arrive at fairly just decisions about a given strike. The question of Poland, Indian unrest. Every man is called upon to be a statesman, seeing that every man and woman, too, has a share in the government of the country. But statesmanship requires imaginative conceptions, formed upon pretty wide reading, and some familiarity with historical precedents. The reading for Forms 5 and 6, ages 15 to 18, is more comprehensive and more difficult. Like that in the earlier forms, it follows the lines of the history they are reading, touching current literature in the occasional use of modern books. But young people who have been brought up on this sort of work may, we find, be trusted to keep themselves au fait with the best that is being produced in their own days. Given the proper period, Form 5 
would cover in a term Pope's essay on man, Carlyle's essay on Burns, Frankfurt Moore's Jessamy Bride, Goldsmith's Citizen of the World, edited, Thackeray's The Virginians, the contemporary poets from an anthology. Form 6 would read Boswell, The Battle of the Books, Macaulay's Essays on Goldsmith, Johnson, Pitt, the contemporary poets from the Oxford Book of Verse, and both forms read She Stoops to Conquer. This course of reading, it will be seen, is suggestive and will lead to much reading round and about it in later days. As for the amount covered in each form, it is probably about the amount most of us cover in the period of time included in a school term. But while we grown-up persons read and forget because we do not take the pains to know as we read, these young students have the powers of perfect recollection and just application because they have read with attention and concentration and have in every case reproduced what they have read in narration or the gist of some portion of it in writing. The children's answers in their examination papers show that literature has become a living power in the minds of these young people. End of section 13. Section 14 of Home Education Series, Volume 6. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Home Education Series, Volume 6, Towards a Philosophy of Education, by Charlotte Mason. The Curriculum, Section 2, The Knowledge of Man, Morals and Economics, Citizenship. Like literature, this subject, too, is ancillary to history. In Form 1, Children begin to gather conclusions as to the general life of the community, from tales, fables, and the story of one or another great citizen. In Form 2, citizenship becomes a definite subject rather than the point of view of what may be called the inspiration of citizenship, than from that of the knowledge proper to a citizen, though the latter is by no means neglected. We find Plutarch's lives exceedingly inspiring. These are read aloud by the teacher with suitable omissions and narrated with great spirit by the children. They learn to answer such questions as, In what ways did Pericles make Athens beautiful? How did he persuade the people to help him? And we may hope that the idea is engendered of preserving and increasing the beauty of their own neighborhood without the staleness which comes of much exhortation. Again, they will answer. How did Pericles manage the people in time of war, lest they should force him to act against his own judgment? And from such knowledge as this, we may suppose that the children begin to get a sympathetic view of the problems of statesmanship. Then, to come to our own time, they are enabled to answer. What do you know of? A. County councils, B. District councils, C. Parish councils. Knowledge which should make children perceive that they too are being prepared to become worthy citizens, each with his several duties. Our old friend Mrs. Beasley's Stories from the History of Rome helps us here in Form 2B instead of Plutarch, illumined by Macaulay's Lays of Ancient Rome in giving children the knowledge of men and affairs which we class under citizenship, we have to face the problem of good and evil. Many earnest-minded teachers will sympathize with one of their number who said, Why give children the tale of Circe, in which there is such an offensive display of greediness? Why not bring them up exclusively on heroic tales, which offer them something to live up to? Time is short. Why not use it all in giving examples of good life and instructions in good manners? Again, why should they read any part of Child Harold and so become familiar with the poet whose works do not make for edification? 
Now, Plutarch is like the Bible in this, that he does not label the actions of his people as good or bad, but leaves the conscience and judgment of his readers to make that classification. What to avoid and how to avoid it. Is knowledge as important to the citizen, whether of the city of God or of his own immediate city, as to know what is good and how to perform the same? Children recognize with incipient weariness the doctored tale as soon as it is begun to be told. But the human story with its evil and its good never flags in interest. Jacob does not pall upon us, though he was the elect of God. We recognize the justice of his own verdict on himself. Few and evil have been the days of my life. We recognize the finer integrity of the foreign kings and rulers that he is brought in contact with. Just as in the New Testament, the Roman centurion is, in every case, a finer person than the religious Jew. Perhaps we are so made that the heroic, which is all heroic, the good, which is all virtuous, palls upon us, whereas we preach little sermons to ourselves on the text of the failings and weaknesses of those great ones with whom we become acquainted in our reading. Children like ourselves must see life whole if they are to profit. At the same time, they must be protected from grossness and rudeness by means of the literary medium through which they are taught. A daily newspaper is not on a level with Plutarch's lives, nor with Andrew Lang's Tales of Troy and Greece, though possibly the same class of incidents may appear in both. The boy or girl, aged from 10 to 12, who is intimate with a dozen or so of Plutarch's lives, so intimate that they influence his thought and conduct, has learned to put his country first, and to see individuals only as they serve or disserve the state. Thus he gets his first lesson in the science of proportion. Children familiar with the great idea of a state in the sense, not of a government, but of the people, learn readily enough about the laws, customs, and government of their country. Learn, too, with great interest something about themselves, mind and body, heart and soul because they feel it is well to know what they have it in them to give to their country. We labor under a difficulty in choosing books, which has exercised all great thinkers from Plato to Erasmus, from Erasmus to the anxious heads of schools today. I mean the coarseness and grossness which crop up in scores of books, desirable otherwise with their sound learning and judgment. Milton assures us with strong asseveration that to the pure all things are pure, but we are uneasy. When pupils in the higher forms read the Areopagitica, they are safeguarded in some measure because they perceive that to see impurity is to be impure. The younger children are helped by the knowledge we offer them in ourselves, and chastely taught children learn to watch over their thoughts because of the angels. So far as we can get them, we use expurgated editions. In other cases, the book is read aloud by the teacher with necessary omissions. We are careful not to associate the processes of nature, whether in the plant or animal world, with possible thoughts of impurity in the mind of a child. One point I should like to touch upon in this connection the excessive countenance sometimes afforded to games by the heads of schools is not altogether for the sake of distinction in the games. I keep under my body, says St. Paul, and games which exhaust the physical powers have, as their unspoken raison d'etre, the desire to keep boys and girls decent. No doubt they do so to some extent, though painful occurrences come to light in even the best schools. Now, a fact not generally recognized is that offenses of the kind which most distress parents and teachers are bred in the mind and in an empty mind at that. That is why parents who endeavor to save their sons from the corruption of the public school by having them taught at home are apt to miss their mark. The abundant leisure afforded by home teaching offers that empty chamber swept and garnished 
which invites sins that can be committed in thought and in solitude. Our schools err, too, in not giving anything like enough work of the kind that from its absorbing interest compels reflection and tends to secure a mind continually and wholesomely occupied. Supply a boy with abundant mental pablum, not in the way of desultory reading, that is a sort of idleness which leads to mischief, but in the way of matter to be definitely known. Give him much and sound food for his imagination, speculation, aspiration, and you have a wholesome-minded youth to whom work is a joy and games not a strain, but a healthy relaxation and pleasure. I make no apology for what they appear like, a divergence from the subject of citizenship, because all boys and girls should know that they owe a sound mind and a sound body as their personal contribution alike to their city and their state. Ourselves, our souls and bodies, by the writer, is much used in the PUS, as I know of no other attempt to present such a ground plan of human nature as should enable the young student to know where he is in his efforts to be good, as the children say. The point of view taken in this volume is that all beautiful and noble possibilities are present in everyone, but that each person is subject to assaults and hindrances in various ways, of which he should be aware, in order that he may watch and pray. Hortatory teaching is apt to bore both young people and their elders, but an ordered presentation of the possibilities and powers that lie in human nature and other risks that attend these can hardly fail to have an enlightening and stimulating effect. But the objects we have in view in teaching everyday morals and citizenship cannot be better illustrated than by a few papers written by children of various ages dealing with self-management and exemplifying the virtues that help and serve city and country. Oh dear, said a little girl coming out of a swimming bath, I'm just like Julius Caesar. I don't care to do a thing at all if I'm not best at it. So, in unlikely ways and from unlikely sources, do children gather that little code of principles which shall guide their lives. End of section 14.